morning, morning, morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the assembly. I want to thank all of you who are here early and uh, in your uh, seats already. Please, we are 12 minutes away from starting, and so please let's send word to all of the regional caucuses that are going on and to the other side meetings to ask them to begin making their way into the assembly hall. We have a very tight agenda this morning. We have a little bit of flex more flexibility in the afternoon, but this morning we are a little bit time pressured, so we do want to uh, start promptly. Yeah. Um, in, uh, just by way of the procedure, we are going to move, when we, get, when we convene, we're going to move to the UN Declaration discussion. As noted at the end of the meeting yesterday, we've adjusted the timing on our agenda. We moved the uh, uh, child welfare discussion and the child and family services legislation discussion to one o'clock today. And I want to thank Mary Ellen Terpel for accommodating that. I want to note that we will uh, excuse the executive from the uh, head table this morning, only for the national chief and our regional chief, Gigi, uh, in the sense that we have nine speakers in our first two sessions. I do want to invite uh, Minister Scott Frazier, Assistant Deputy Minister Jessica Wood, Merle Alexander, Legal Counsel, and uh, Proxy Cheryl Casimir for the First Nations Summit to also make their way to the uh, head stage so that we can begin promptly in 10 minutes. Just by way of order of the day, we uh, were able to finish uh, 11 resolutions yesterday, so I want to thank the delegation. Bonjour, bon matin tout le monde. Donc pendant qu'on se prépare à commencer 
très journée qui va commencer à 9 h D'abord, j'espère que vous avez tous eu une excellente soirée hier. On a une, une bonne journée de travail, des belles discussions avec des invités aujourd'hui. Justement, on commence dans quelques minutes à 9 h Il est présentement 8h54. Alors, on commence à 9 h avec euh, pour euh, débuter notre journée avec un panel concernant la déclaration euh, des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones. Alors, il y aura deux, deux panels distincts. Et on va pouvoir poursuivre ensuite avec nos invités de cet avant-midi, la ministre Karen Bennett, ensuite Stephen Bilbo et l'honorable, ben, ils sont tous honorables, alors l'honorable Karen Bennett, l'honorable Stephen Bilbo et l'honorable David Lemetti, ce qui va nous amener à discuter d'une résolution concernant justement la déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones et nous pourrons terminer notre avant-midi avec un hommage qui sera rendu à notre CEO, donc avant l'heure du lunch. On pourra ensuite poursuivre l'après-midi avec plusieurs sujets d'importance. Justement, on va commencer avec le projet de loi C-92 et son implémentation. Ensuite, on va adresser plusieurs euh, projets de résolution. On va les, euh, vous les présenter euh, selon l'ordre qui nous est euh, confié par euh, l'équipe, euh, le comité de résolution. Et on aura aussi ensuite euh, les Students on Ice, le programme. On va poursuivre avec les vétérans et euh, les écoles de jour et les écoles résidentielles. Il y aura une présentation, une mise à jour sur ces euh, sujets, sur ces dossiers. Et on pourra poursuivre aussi avec les projets de résolution et ce qui nous amènera à la signature d'un MOU, donc un énoncé d'intention mutuelle. Et euh, ensuite, pour terminer, on terminera avec euh, certaines résolutions. Et on m'a aussi informé More que... Resolutions. And I was also informed that 11 uh, resolutions, de, de, de draft resolutions, were received, en, en retard, donc, which were pas, late uh, draft resolutions. Et je vous rappelle que le, like la limite pour les projets de résolution, the limit, le dépôt the des projets de résolution en retard est ce late, midi. Uh, donc, c'est un échéancier important so à connaître. Donc, euh, il est maintenant so 8h56. Et puis, euh, uh, ah, et aussi, simplement pour vous dire qu'en soirée aujourd'hui, you know, il y aura evening, uh, un the film, Audrey's will be Story, a movie, qui Audrey's va être Story, présenté à 7h will be presented at dans, seven le ballroom, donc, in the ballroom. Euh, dans le ballroom. Le programme pour la journée. So, Je this is the program. This is the plan for the day. I wish journée. you all Beaucoup de, de a fantastic alors, day. Uh, many important toutes, subjects. So have a good day, uh, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to the delegation who are making their way into the room. As you can see, we have our panels are, uh, are ready to go. It's on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, both um, nationally and uh, regionally, for what British Columbia was able to do. Um, as you can see, their, their uh, executive members uh, have been excused from the front. Uh, they are in the room. I recognize Chief, uh, Regional Chief Uh, from Manitoba, Kevin Hart, thank you for, for being here to see you this morning. Um, there are other uh, regional chiefs in the room, but these lights are uh, extremely bright, so I cannot see you if I, if I don't mention you by name. I apologize profusely for that, uh, but I do recognize that uh, the executive members are here, uh, are present. Uh, they're just not up on the stage at this particular moment uh, because we do have a, a full slate uh, of panels for the next hour uh, and, and that's how much time <clears throat> is allotted on the agenda uh, for this particular item. Recognize that members of the delegation are making their way into the room. Uh, <laughs> word has been sent to all of the regional caucuses that we are going to be starting uh, at 9 a.m. Um, on time with our agenda, uh, recognizing the chiefs and delegates. Uh, that are here um, early, uh, 
looking at the uh, AFN Elders Council, the AFN Women's Council, and the AFN Youth Council. Um, the tri councils are present. I am um, very happy that you know we, we do have uh, the the room is full, um, filling up quickly, and uh, we are going to get started at nine o'clock in one minute. So. I'll turn it over to my honorable co-chair, Mr. Herod Falberto. <laughs> thank you very much, thank, thank you very much, Tim. Thank you very much, uh, Wiener. Um, all right, so then, 8.59, we convene the second day of the AFN Special Chiefs Assembly. I welcome all the delegations uh, to the room. As noted, we have the UN Declaration on deck first. To my right is our first international panel, uh, the Honorable Grand Chief uh, Willie Littlechild, Legal Counsels Paul Joff and Jennifer Preston to my right. Each of them will have 10 minutes to address the assembly. To my left is the BC UN Declaration panel, Minister Scott Frazier, Regional Chief Terry Teege, Assistant Deputy Minister Jessica Wood, um, Merle Alexander, Legal Counsel, Chief and Cookby Judy Wilson uh, from the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and Proxy Cheryl Casimir from the First Nations Summit, on, to, together with Regional Chief, comprised uh, the three organizations, which are the Leadership Council, uh, First Nations Leadership Council in British Columbia. It is nine o'clock. We will turn now to um, Willie Littlechild for his uh, remarks, and we ask that the AV people assist us by putting ten minutes on our clock here for each of the speakers to my right. Uh, Willie, you're welcome to address us from the second microphone to my right. They will turn it on themselves. Yeah, they'll, they'll do it on Should be good. Back. There it is. Test one. Good morning. Nigan Gaki o Katam Skarna o Asemina Pego Kiksep Kiteg o Pinatsek o Spogana and Laskum on Mustahe. Kseman Tony Stekta, Epoxita and Naskumak Tato. Kāpē ohpinātsik, uspogana kā gāki smutsik. Tāki augina nāskumt nāo. Ergumaga oji māma skūta mākanos. Agāma skīko, cī mīstē tōga jās, tīkī pēj tohtētsik, kā gāma gannok, tōtēm nāk. Ergumaga māta māma sīhtātsik. Tānsān māk esinā tīkī simjos tāk, oja suēun. Tāmāga tēm gājāk. Kitsu is to go nahoce. A go tan si san magetsna, tatogisco, the gis to scatta macum, totem no goce. A was sacoce, kete a gehoce. Cacioso squads is a toscoaki, coacumaganog. Excinanas come to no, gacio, a semina pego, a penicetti egg. Eksingatsimono mapsis muga aso tahohtsi atsimon e mia sekingetuan. Good morning to all delegations, Your Excellencies, National Chief, Elders Council, the youth, uh, chiefs and dignitaries that are here, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for me to begin this discussion this morning on the UN Declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. As I said in my language, this is not a short effort of work. Indeed, uh, it's been a long time in the making. But as we come to the resolution and the adoption of the declaration, I always try to use an analogy that incorporates both the UN declaration and the treaties. And the analogy I use is that it's like an eagle. An eagle on one wing is the uh, treaties. And on the other wing is the UN Declaration. And both have to work together as the eagle's wings for the eagle to fly so that our rights can soar. And I want to begin by some good news this morning. I remember last year, there was a resolution on the floor, 
I was sitting over there trying to get attention to get to speak on the item, but I had the wrong color tag, so I couldn't get the floor. But I see now there was a purpose for that. Last week in Paris, at the General Assembly of the United Nations, UNESCO debated a resolution on a decade for international indigenous languages. It was a emotional feeling to sit in a room to have a resolution table that the General Assembly of UNESCO that called on the world to declare a decade for indigenous languages. Because we all know that the international year is coming to a close. In fact, in a couple of weeks in New York, it will come to a close. But we also all know that one year is not enough to focus on the revitalization of our languages, the promotion of our languages, the defense of our languages. So it was important that we argued for a decade to be set aside to focus on indigenous languages. And it was passed at every level so far, at the UN expert mechanism, at the UN permanent forum, at the third committee of the United Nations, and last week at UNESCO. Last week at UNESCO, not one state took the floor to speak against us having a decade to focus on our languages. So it passed unanimously. And that was such a great day for acknowledging all of your efforts. The people here beside me in this whole panel, their fingerprints are all over that decade resolution. And many of you out in the audience also had input into that. So I begin with that good news that we're going to have a decade. And I was concerned at the beginning. I was concerned that one year was coming to an end, and then a decade was going to be proclaimed two years later. I thought we might lose momentum because of the break. But then actually, someone got up on the floor and told me, Willie, you should be happier because you're not getting a decade, you're getting 13 years to be focused on the languages. So I thought that was amazing. So we went beyond the resolution calling for a decade. It's actually going to be 13 years of effort on a decade for revitalization and promotion and maintenance of our languages. So I want to thank all of you that had a hand into that um, uh, work. So I want to uh, spend the rest of the time on the declaration. As I said, this is not recent work. It began in 1923 and 25 when a spiritual Maori leader went to the League of Nations and also you all know Chief Deskahe also went to the UN, mm -hmm. then called the League of Nations not to be able to get an audience. So for all those years between 1923 to 1977, we had no voice at the UN. So now it's a very much of a different scenario. As you know, the UN Declaration was adopted at the General Assembly on September 13th in 2007. Indigenous peoples from around the world worked for decades decades. People beside me, Jennifer and Paul and the National Chief and others, some in the audience who worked on that for 27 years, the longest debated declaration in UN history. But we did it. You did it. So I want to commend you for that. Over the years we've sat here at the National Assemblies, many resolutions have been adopted on the topic. 
I want to focus really just on one element of it this morning. And it's in a preambular paragraph that acknowledges that um, considering that the rights affirmed in treaties, agreements, and constructive arrangements between states and indigenous peoples, tribes, and nations are in some situations matters of international concern. They're matters of international interest, matters of international responsibility, and international character. That particular preambular paragraph was very significant. While we could not get the one word in that paragraph to say that they were of international law, it was actually expanded into those four elements, which is also a positive advancement. Back in, nine, in 2007, after the resolution was adopted at the UN, we sat down in my community and we had a decade plan on how could we implement this resolution in our community for the upcoming decade. And as I look back on the plan that we had, thanks to the Muscogee's Cree, we've, well, we've accomplished all of those elements of the decade plan. So I think it's important that we do likewise coming up as far as the uh, decade on international languages will come up. At the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it was again a very great honor for me to be one of the commissioners and to be able to call on all governments to fully adopt and implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the framework for reconciliation. And I remember Jennifer and colleagues in New York went to work to ask for a response from the UN. And the Secretary General at the time of the United Nations said we should use this decade I'm sorry, the declaration as a platform, a roadmap for reconciliation going forward. So again, it was acknowledged at the highest level of the UN. Then we called upon the government of Canada to develop a national action plan, strategies and other concrete measures to achieve the goals of the UN declaration. That's work underway, and we need to speed up the process, I think, in terms of the National Action Plan. And more will be said about that by my colleagues, uh, Jennifer and Paul. So thank you very, very much for your kind attention this morning. Hi, hi, can you ask them now? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll turn to our next two speakers. Please put eight minutes on the clock for them. My third microphone to my right, please. Go. Okay. I'm just going to bookend Paul's presentation, um, and I will go very fast. Uh, we just wanted to, obviously this morning we don't have time to get into a lot of detail about the declaration, either it's in the development or in the content, but we wanted to, uh, in the discussion around legislation and a national action plan, we wanted to just give a little bit of context for that. And one of the things we wanted to point out is, I hope everybody has the booklet version of the declaration, and you'll see the declaration has 46 operative articles, but it also has 24 preambular paragraphs. And the slide we're showing has the seventh preambular paragraph, which really speaks to why Indigenous peoples went to the UN in the first place. Um, and the discussion around inherent rights, which was also discussed yesterday, that these are inherent rights. Neither governments nor the United Nations grants human rights. The UN Declaration is affirming the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples.
We just wanted to mention a few developments in terms of the history in Canada. Um, Canada originally had voted against the declaration in 2007. That position was um, reversed in 2010 under our previous uh, Conservative government. They did reverse their position and they endorsed it in November of 2010. And then in 2016, um, Minister Bennett went to the United Nations and announced that Canada was supporting the declaration without any qualification. And that's quite important in terms of um, Canada's relationship with the declaration. Obviously, the Declaration can be used in lots of ways, and this morning's panels can only speak to a little bit of that. One of the things we wanted to mention was that the Declaration has been reaffirmed ten times by consensus at the UN General Assembly, and the 11th is coming up at the end of this month. This means that there's no state in the world that is actively opposing the UN Declaration, and that consensus status on the international stage increases the Declaration's legal significance and its legal effect, and that's quite important. And obviously the Declaration can and is being used in a multitude of ways, and one of them, just one example that we've listed here, is that the Declaration can be used to interpret First Nations rights as well as Crown obligations under Section 35 of the Constitution, Act 1982. We wanted to speak just a little bit in the discussion around legislation. We wanted to speak a little bit to Bill C-262, which there was some discussion yesterday about as well. I think that most people know that 262 was introduced in 2016 by Cree Member of Parliament, Romeo Saganash. It was a private member's bill. Uh, Romeo was representing the NDP, and uh, so it was introduced as a private member's bill. And that legislation was about accountability for the implementation. And it called for a review of Canadian laws and policies to make sure they were in line with the Declaration, as well as a national action plan, as well as regular reporting. That bill was adopted by the House of Commons uh, in 2018, and it was then sent to the Senate. And unfortunately, although it was in the Senate for a year, it did not finish the process needed in the Senate. And in June of 2019, because of some filibustering by a handful of senators, the, uh, the bill did not manage to come to its third and final reading to become law. And, and really that was um, somewhat of abuse of a democratic process in terms of the process of legislation. All of the political parties, with the exception of the Conservatives, had in their election campaigns that they would introduce um, legislation to implement the Declaration. And so that's where we are at this point in time, moving forward with federal legislation. Bill C-262 um, also was used um, in the work to create the, uh, the BC legislation, which we're gonna hear about in a minute. And Paul's just gonna speak now to uh, legisl federal legislation. Good morning. It's important to note that the Government of Canada's commitment implement the UN Declaration is already included in nine different federal laws. And we've listed this on this slide and the next slide. So you see there first the Canadian Energy Regulator Act, and that act replaced the National Energy Board. The Impact Assessment Act, the First Nations Land Management Act, the Indigenous Languages Act, and an act respecting First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children, youth, and families. And continuing on this list is the Department for Women and Gender Equality Act, the Department of Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Act, the Department of Indigenous Services Act, and finally, an act to amend the Indian Act. Now, this federal approach of including the UN Declaration in many different laws should prove to be highly effective. If the UN Declaration were solely included in one law, it would be easier for a future federal government to undermine the application of the UN Declaration. And it's important to note that BC is also including the UN Declaration in different provincial laws. 
Now, indigenous peoples clearly need a general federal law regarding the implementation of the UN Declaration. In no case should a, such a law go below the standards in Bill C-262, which Jennifer referred to. Now, if you look at this slide, there are different reasons for adopting a com comprehensive federal legislative framework. And these include the urgent need to reject colonialism in favor of a contemporary approach. It is also crucial to reject the discriminatory doctrines of superiority, including discovery and terra nullius. And that was called for in the Truth and Reconciliation's final report in May 2015. It's important to affirm the central significance of the UN Declaration if we are to achieve national re reconciliation. And we must ensure progress made is not easily reversed by any future conservative or other government. Now, in June 2019, the Liberal Senator, Peter Harder, announced, and you can see it on the slide, that on behalf of the government and prime minister in the forthcoming election, which we just had, the Liberal Party of Canada will campaign on a promise to implement as government legislation the UN Declaration. Now, in addition, the 2019 Liberal platform indicated a bunch of uh, important points. I'll mention three. It would in implement the UN Declaration in the first year of a new mandate. Legislation would be co-developed with Indigenous peoples. And legislation would establish Bill C-262 as, quote, uh, and unquote, the floor when drafting this new legislation. Now let's examine quickly um, further commitment to a legislative framework. Yesterday, as Premier John, BC Premier John Horgan described, there is now the important achievement of provincial legislation on the UN Declaration in British Columbia. We need now federal legislation that cannot be less than Bill C-262. To date, legislation of that type is supported generally, and that includes by chiefs in assembly. So such federal legislation needs to be introduced quickly in, 2000, in 2020, following co-development. One never knows when a minority government may be defeated. Thank you. And then just uh, in addition to legislation, obviously there's a desire to move on federal legislation on the UN Declaration. And there's also the question of the National Action Plan, which Chief Littlechild spoke to as well. And this is something where um, the work is really at a very preliminary stage. The, I think the important point is we don't need to wait for legislation to begin the work on the National Action Plan. And Canada committed to a National Action Plan in the outcome document from the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. Um, Canada and the AFN included a National Action Plan in their MOU. So this is work that indeed uh, can begin uh, or, or should be uh, underway already. We certainly don't need to wait for the legislation to be completed. Uh, Paul and I actually did a presentation in, uh, at the Chief's Assembly in July on what may be a National Action Plan, what that work can look like. And we're not going to go through all of the, those same elements here, but just uh, in terms of where does that work begin, it's really important that a national action plan needs to come from the ground up, not the reverse. And the national action plan needs to come from voices of Indigenous peoples, not from the government. So it's very important um, that the priorities that Indigenous peoples in their communities and in their nations want to bring forward into a national action plan is where the work begins. And that's where we are at this, at this time right now. We're just at the point where we need to begin this work. Um, 
a way to begin this work can be a listening project, a national listening project, where Indigenous voices that's really inclusive, including youth and elders, women, people with disabilities, where all voices can be heard in terms of what they see as priorities in a national action plan. And from that, the work could proceed. But it is very, very important that the work be done well from the outset. Um, and it's really important that the different priorities, in different places, people may feel their priorities are different in different nations. Some people may want to start their work on languages. Some people may want to start with spirituality. Some people may want to start with treaties. All of those priorities need to be taken into account and accommodated in work on an action plan. So it is important um, going forward that we're not just achieving legislation, but we're also actually doing the very concrete work um, and including implementation work that has been done to date. And, I, and with that, we're under time by 30 seconds. <laughs> And, and thank you very much for that. And I, I just want to make it clear, I take no pleasure in having to manage the clock. Um, <laughs> I see there's some skepticism in the crowd. Um, I do want to uh, thank you um, uh, for that. You've sort of laid out the generational foundation of the declaration, the successes that all of us have had uh, on that, or to call it the promising current, current context, and some of the key elements of the path forward. And so we uh, thank you for that, and we now turn to the BC uh, panel. I take a little bit of comfort in this, in that in the First Nations leadership gathering between the BC cabinet and the uh, chiefs in BC, a panel this size, this uh, in this limited time, uh, has been successfully completed. And so um, they have experience in this process of getting uh, uh, through these things. So thank you very much for that. Um, let us uh, begin. I, I think we're taking it in the order. Are we beginning with uh, Minister Fraser or with Regional Chief? Regional Chief, first microphone to my left. And, and uh, sorry to say this, Regional Chief, five minutes on the clock. <laughs> Plenty of time. Deneza, Tekuza, Skaiza, Chiefs, Hereditary Chiefs, Youth, elders, I uh, just first want to acknowledge the, the territory of the Al Algonquin Anishinaabek uh, people for allowing us here today in this very uh, important uh, presentation in regards to the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, also known as uh, Bill 41 in British Columbia. And uh, this presentation is uh, uh, from the First Nations Leadership Council, the three uh, provincial territorial organizations, the BCAFN, uh, First Nations Summit, and the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. So if we could go to the first slide. Um, uh, looks like technology is, uh, oh, <laughs> there we go. So I also want to, to acknowledge uh, yesterday we, we had the opportunity to, to honor Pre Premier Horgan and his uh, uh, administration and government to take this bold step to codify the uh, declaration as law in British Columbia. And uh, also too here on, on our panel is, is Minister Fraser who uh, took the long trek out yesterday and, and made it, uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> but we all know the uh, difficult uh, 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 transportation issues over the last few days. And I want to thank him for being here today. And then also Assistant Deputy Minister, uh, the, the one of four Indigenous ADMs in British Columbia, Jessica Wood, whose ancestry is, is Gixun. I also want to acknowledge um, uh, in the room here today too, Anne-Marie Sam from Nakazli Wuten, uh, who's a Dakat, uh, who is a special advisor to uh, Minister Fraser. And yesterday as well, I want to acknowledge uh, Don Bain, who is from Kleitli Tene, uh, First Nation, who is a special advisor to Minister Horgan. And the reason I wanted to acknowledge them is that uh, it's very important to have uh, Indigenous people in uh, influential places in government. And I think that's a real uh, lesson here for, you, uh, for the other regions to have uh, people in government to push uh, some of these issues. 
and uh, and it's important to have some of these positions uh, for Indigenous people to be elected. So moving on, um, and my uh, members of the First Nations Leadership Council in, on, on this file is, is Cheryl Casmer uh, from the First Nations Summit and Cook P. Judy Wilson. Uh, we're known as, well, I call ourselves the Three Amigos. We were <laughs> in charge on this uh, issue here uh, in terms of the uh, bringing the, uh, the declaration as, uh, as law in, in British Columbia. And I also want to acknowledge the other parties, uh, Green Party, as well as uh, the Liberal Party, who uh, all voted on this um, uh, bill and, and passed unanimously. So next slide. Really, it's a, it's a tectonic shift in terms of our relationship with the, the provincial government. And uh, last week, we, we saw the bill pass on November 28th and, and was de declared as an act and received royal assent. And right now, uh, the, the declaration is, is a firm and applicable to, to all laws in British Columbia. And where there is inconsistency, BC laws must change. So, so really, this is uh, some of the issues that we have to bring forward as part of our action plan, which is the next step. The legal doctrines of terra nullius and the doctrine of discovery has been rejected. And we leave that in the past in British Columbia. So on to recognize uh, the work of so many leaders in British Columbia, all the, the chiefs here to my right, and I see someone over here on my left. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, standing up strong for your people. And uh, um, really, this is a really important lesson where we all work together. And I, I certainly hope that uh, in your regions, you do the same. I also want to acknowledge the work of Romeo Saganish. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Romeo in the, in the legislature on, uh, I believe it was October 26, to, to witness uh, myself and my colleagues from the Leadership Council to make that historic day in the, in the first reading of the, of the legislature. So I pass it on to, to my colleague, Cheryl Kasmer. Thank you, Regional Chief. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, now you can. Um, really uh, honored to be on this um, panel to make presentation to you on the declaration, uh, Bill 41, and how we got here. Um, I just wanted to um, lead off from where Regional Chief was making acknowledgments and acknowledge our legal team, legal and technical team as well. Um, Merle Alexander, who is on the panel with us, Stacey Edzertza Fox, who is back home in British Columbia, and Mary Ellen Terpel Lafond um, also played a key role in getting us to this point. And of course, uh, we wouldn't be here for past and present leadership um, that did you know, a lot of the, the legwork, the foundational work to allow us to do the work that we were able to do. Um, I'm going to be really quick, or try to be. Um, we're all familiar with the Indigenous Crown relationship. It's undergone many dynamics since contact, ranging from military alliances, treaty making, to colonization and attempted assimilation through policies of denial, such as the doctrines of discovery and terra nullius. The attempts by the Crown to dispossess Indigenous peoples of their lands and resources and to assimilate them through various policies led to significant conflict. Once indigenous peoples had access to the legal system, our nations began using the colonial courts to seek compensation, restitution, and recognition and protection of our rights. Much of this litigation arose after Aboriginal and treaty rights were recognized and affirmed under Section 35, Constitution Act 1982. Most of this litigation arose out of British Columbia, where there were few where there are few treaties, where the courts confirm that rights, including Aboriginal title and self-government, exist, and the Crown has corresponding obligations. Court cases such as Delgamook, Sparrow, Gurren, Gladstone, Vanderpeet, Haida, Taku, Campbell, and lately uh, Silcotine. While we expected significant shifts in government policy after each of these cases, we did not see the transformative change required for meaningful reconciliation. 
After the Supreme Court declared Aboriginal title in Silcoteen, the chiefs in BC took it upon themselves to articulate four principles arising out of the case law that would guide effective relationships and reconciliation. Those four principles are, one, acknowledgement that all our relationships are based on recognition and, impl and implementation of the existence of Indigenous peoples, inherent title and rights, and pre-Confederation historic and modern treaties throughout British Columbia. Number two, acknowledgement that Indigenous systems of governance and laws are essential to the regulation of lands and resources throughout British Columbia. Three, acknowledgement of the mutual responsibility that all of our government systems shall shift to relationships, negotiations, and agreements based on recognition. And four, we immediately must move to consent-based decision-making and title-based fiscal relations, including revenue sharing in our relationships, negotiations, and agreements. So while the government largely ignored the four principles at first, they did find their way into what has since become the joint commitment document endorsed by the BC Cabinet and First Nations leadership. The commitment document, along with its joint agenda, setting out a shared vision, guiding principles and concrete actions, is now our shared roadmap to systemic shifts supporting reconciliation. When the NDP formed government in British Columbia, we added as our new priority action one, the development of, of provincial legislation, bringing the United Nations Declaration into provincial law. We wanted to build on the federal bill 262 and make it meaningful at a provincial level. In doing our work, we have taken very seriously all of the massive body of work and advocacy done to date, wanting to create a framework that guides what, what work we must do and how we carry out that work together. So we developed the commitment document to reflect key legal principles in Canadian jurisprudence. The BC government also borrowed from Canada's playbook and adopted its own 10 draft principles respecting the government of British Columbia's relationship with Indigenous peoples to signal a shift within the civil service in how they interact and conduct business with First Nations. And in 2019, in the 2019 BC throne speech, the government committed very publicly its intention to see through its commitment to developing provincial legislation on the UN Declaration. Like Kwaitep, uh, Cook with Judy Wilson. I just wanted to acknowledge the unceded territory of the Algonquin and also to acknowledge the many uh, leaders have, who have worked on the UN Declaration for most of their lives uh, globally and the ones that are in the room and the ones that are watching maybe from live stream. I wanted to be able to explain some of the background on the advancing of the UN Declaration. I always wanted to honor those, the ones that originally penned it, that wrote for many decades what that UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People would look like. And then uh, also I wanted to acknowledge, you know, the spirit and the intent of it. It wasn't to set aside our own Indigenous laws or our own Indigenous jurisdictions or any, any of those things. The, reason for the declaration was because we were not included in the human rights the universal human rights declaration that's used globally because we weren't thought of as human beings i mentioned it yesterday but every time i think about that you know it, it's really profound that we're actually having governments today give us that rec important recognition it's not displacing us as a persons uh, you know as our indigenous people but it's the state finally recognizing we are the original people of the land and we also are, have our title and rights to the land. And uh, I mentioned Chief Harvey McLeod in the BC caucus, uh, no, the, the uh, AFN uh, children and family uh, meeting. He said it had a profound effect on him, which was that, you know, he was actually recognized as a person now. Uh, not as a ward or uh, of the state government. So those are the kind of things I think uh, we reflect on when we think about what the UN Declaration means to ourselves as Indigenous people, but also what we're setting out as the framework, what it would mean to the state governments. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, it sets out the minimum standard for survival and dignity of our people. And as you heard our Grand Chief uh, Stuart Phillips say many times, 
indigenous rights or human rights. So that's really important. Uh, to, and I think Cheryl mentioned it as well yesterday. Canada did endorse the Declaration Without Qualification, and that's important to know because uh, there's obligations when they set out uh, to endorse it. And BC endorsed the Declaration and, and its commitment to the implementation, and as directed by our chiefs and mandated by our chiefs in the commitment document, the, the BC Cabinet approved the commitment document, and the number one commitment was the implementation of the UN Declaration. Uh, one of the main uh, bases in the uh, UN Declaration is the right of self-determination. It's a critical basis in the Declaration as it is in the Section 35 rights. Indigenous uh, peoples are the talent and right holders and are decision makers with inherent jurisdiction. We're seeing that, as uh, Paul mentioned, in some of the nine different legislations federally and some of the provincial legislation as well and policies. And now it's, uh, you know, the steps of the full implementation and alignment with the, those laws. And this is the basis for a, a meaningful, uh, to address our 150 years of colonialism and achieving true reconciliation with our nations and our people. The legislation supports a shift in relations to the proper Thailand right holders on a government to government basis. I'm talking uh, with BC. Uh, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, with the federal one, we need to work on that uh, relationship if it's going to be a nation to nation re relationship. But in BC, it would be a government to government uh, basis. Uh, Bill um, 262 was not passed, as you heard, and we lived that whole uh, climax, I guess. So we went up and down with that whole Bill 262. And, um, but work must continue because they're, they're not giving us the, you know, the recognition uh, and also the uh, true nation-to-nation -nation relationship. They need that framework. And uh, the advances key part of the commitment document is to achieve a strong and valued government-to-government -government relationship. And I wanted to just end on just what Cookby uh, Ron Ignis uh, mentioned to me as before I came up, his concerns about co-development. He said it must ensure it's directly involved the town right holders, not just government. So I just wanted to re-emphasize that, Cookby Ron Ignis, that, you know, uh, we have to be mindful, watchful, and, and effective for that full implementation. Thank you. Uh, back to me again. Hello, hello. Second microphone to my left. Thank First you. First microphone, thank you. So to get us to this point, um, we had resolutions passed at our respective leadership council chiefs assemblies through the BC Assembly of First Nations, First Nations Summit, and the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Those resolutions mandated the leadership council to advance the implementation of the United Nations Declaration, um, including through legislation. So as mentioned in my earlier comments, when the NDP formed government, we added action one, goal one, to our joint agenda of the commitment document, which was to jointly develop provincial legislation, not dissimilar to federal private members bill 262, to establish the United Nations Declaration as the foundation and coherent path for Crown Indigenous relations and reconciliation in British Columbia, including aligning provincial law and policy with the United Nations Declaration and Indigenous Rights. So we began specific engagement with the province in 2018 to implement the United Nations Declaration and provincial legislation. Um, initially, the province did not want to get ahead of the federal government when uh, Bill 262 started. And when it started to get tied up in political processes, Premier Horgan decided to show leadership and pursue provincial legislation notwithstanding what ultimately happened to Bill 262. We undertook a collaborative process to, to develop Bill 41, taken measures to push the limits of the restrictive legislative process. While we did not have the opportunity to actually draft the bill, the province did implement mechanisms to engage with us in such a way that we could influence the intent and the effect of the bill. This required a significant amount of technical work supported by political dialogue and intervention to ensure the political will remained intact. 
It also required regular reports to the chief's assemblies, as well as formal dialogues with leaders from business, education, political groups, civil society, to discuss key concepts of what we hope to achieve through this legislation. Significant, significantly, uh, the province prepared a consultation draft for review under non-disclosure agreements, enabling chiefs and leaders to view it and be informed of its content. On October 24th, Bill 41 was formally introduced in, into the BC Legislature and the Leadership Council representatives were provided an opportunity to speak to the importance um, of this legislation to the province. And the House was filled with dignitaries and observers and I don't think I'll ever forget that day. It was a, it was a historical, um, wonderful day. After a two week break, uh, Bill 41 went to committee and underwent over 20 hours of deliberation. And on November 28th, it passed, oh sorry, November 26th, it passed third reading without objection, unanimously and became law. On November 28th, it received royal assent. Now it's time for the hard work as a key part of the legislation is the alignment of provincial laws, and we understand that there are over 5,000 in British Columbia, to align those laws with the United Nations Declaration and the co-development of an action plan on implementation. We will have our first meeting with provincial officials upon our return from Ottawa this week to begin the important discussion of how we go about building the action plan and how we can ensure that it is shaped by First Nations title and rights holders and their priorities. Go ahead, Rimmel. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the NCD territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg peoples. Um, it's my it's my pleasure to be able to uh, speak a bit more about what does the actual act do. One of the most I think important elements of the of the act is that it silences the characterization of the declaration as being merely aspirational. It specifically says under in uh, section two that the uh, UN Declaration uh, fully applies to the laws of British Columbia. There's also a, uh, it confirms that the recognition of right, recognition of respect for Indigenous rights is a foundational shift for the relationship. Um, it will also create not just political certainty, but legal certainty um, in terms of the affirmation of the Declaration's application in British Columbia. And that in itself, I think, will create a significant amount of predictability and legal certainty in British Columbia. And lastly, it sets a real, um, through the action plan and the annual reporting and some of the mechanisms, it sets a real transparency and for public and transparent uh, development of the action plan for the interaction of stakeholders, rights holders, and uh, in future development of legislation. I think like one of the most important elements of, of, of the act also is that it is now law that all re legal reform will be done in, in consultation and cooperation with, indi with indigenous peoples. That goes beyond in some respects actually the, what the UN Declaration actually has and it goes beyond Supreme Court Canada case law. Next slide please. Now some of the specifics about, about sections. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the, about the, the action plan. That's really where I think where, where the rubber, rubber hits the road. And that process internally will be, will, be, will be conducted by BC First Nations and the government coming together, determining what areas are priority for, for, for legal reform and how we can start the very substantive process of, of amending BC laws to be consistent with the UN Declaration. There'll be, there's two, me two measures there. There's of course the action plan and there's a legal requirement for annual reporting, which the first, that first annual reporting will be March 31st, 2020. Under section 1.3, uh, there is, as is there is in many pieces of, of legislation that confirms that there is non-derogation to the inherent and aboriginal treaty rights and title. So any concerns that the, that the declaration might might impede or uh, on treaty and existing Aboriginal rights 
um, need not be concerned. Under Section 1.2, there's, there's specific language about respecting the diversity of Indigenous peoples, rights, and territories. Under Section 3, there's a very, there's a, there's a legally binding commitment that the province align all provincial laws with the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and the province is required in cooperation and collaboration with Indigenous peoples to take all necessary measures in that, in that legal reform process. One of the, one of the um, really, um, Gla I think like glass ceiling shattering uh, sections of the of the act is unfound under section 1b 71b which allows the province to enter into consent based decision making processes with indigenous governing bodies as of like a bit of like a, a, a slight background piece often when 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 decision making comes up in any negotiation on government to government, there's a, a variety of terms used, co-management, cooperative decision making, collaborative decision making, joint decision making. For the longest time in British Columbia, there's been a glass ceiling and the province has been prohibited from entering into consent-based agreement. There's, there is now, there's now a, a break in that glass ceiling. The province is now legally capable of entering into consent-based agreements. And that's, uh, that's my part in the presentation. Thank you. So we're just on, uh, so we're just on to... Thank you. We're just on to the next steps. So the action plan process will begin. The law and policy review will begin, as Merle uh, pointed out. Um, to underscore, the direction will be provided by our chiefs and a plan, a robust process in developing an action plan and priority, priorities and monitoring. Uh, the keys on the actions will be required according to the UN Declaration objectives. And it's more than mere continuation of existing work. It's resetting that work in a recognition of rights framework. So I, I think that's really important. And as Merle said, it's beyond a lot of the different case law and uh, beyond a lot of the uh, existing tools that we had. And uh, the ongoing outreach to business, public, environmental, education, labor, and civil uh, society groups is gonna be important. Uh, there's still a lot of groups that don't understand the UN Declaration. Uh, there's going to be a lot of presentations and uh, dialogue with the different groups to explain. And uh, the action plan will be based on the collaboration and cooperation between First Nations and the province, and, and as Merle pointed out, based on Section 4 of the Act. Uh, the reporting is going to be really important uh, to the legislature of BC and public examination of the progress. I think it's, it, and as Merle pointed out again, it's law. Uh, they're going to have to be doing that. And I think by March of next year, uh, although it's going to be reporting on the plan on how to do this, at least there's going to be visible and concrete uh, outcomes and reporting uh, that we're going to see. Uh, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of work for a while uh, in doing the realignment of the laws and all the different things that uh, are included in, in, in this work. But at least uh, what I'm seeing is we're all at the table doing that. Uh, all the voices will be heard, and uh, it, it's part of those fundamental next steps that we will be doing. So I, I think the, uh, that sums up our, our presentation from the First Nations Leadership Council, and we had our, our uh, minister here, Scott Fraser, and our ADM, uh, Jessica Wood here, and I believe they're speaking next. Amasai Sisa Yauk Stibayu. I'm really honored to be here today, and I'm honored to be here as a public servant with the province of British Columbia who has had the um, immense honor of, of working with the First Nations Leadership Council as well as the province of BC to, to lead this legislation and, and to bring it into the House um, uh, with Minister Fraser. 
And what I can say is that our role as the province now as public servants is there's 30,000 public servants within the province of British Columbia. And our task is now to support this act and the implementation of this law across uh, the province. And what it does is pretty phenomenal. It not only recognizes Indigenous people and Indigenous governance, it recognizes our humanity and it affirms that that humanity has meaning. And to have a positive piece of legislation about Indigenous people within the province of British Columbia is nothing short of phenomenal. And it puts some obligations on the province. It puts these obligations really clearly through the bill, and this is the work going forward. It ensures that we must take all measures necessary in collaboration and consultation to align our laws. And now, a slightly um, a difference from 262, which contemplated reporting on this progress for 25 years, is we have put no limit on the time limit in this bill because there is no end to reconciliation. This is the transformative work that we need to do together going forward, and that partnership should not end. The other is that our action plan does not limit what laws should come into alignment. If it is not in the action plan, that's okay because that is not the defining factor of what laws need to come into alignment. That is a separate piece of work and can include things like policy and operating procedure. The, the third piece on the annual reporting, um, which, which I, I don't want to argue with my, my partners, um, on the mic, uh, we will report by June 30th uh, for the period ending March 31st, because uh, as the one who's going to have to get Minister Fraser's approval on that report, I didn't want to have to do it uh, in three months. Um, but you'll see probably at the beginning a plan for a plan, because we need to take the time to build this with Indigenous people. Uh, the process with the province has been really, has been really phenomenal, but um, there's, there's some time and there's some depth uh, without the restrictions of, legis of cabinet confidence that we're going to work through. So I wanted to uh, just say a couple of words there about the public service and I'll pass it off to Minister Fraser. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Uh, well, good morning. My name is uh, Scott Fraser. I'm BC's Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. And the trick to being a minister, if you want to have any success, is to surround yourself with strong Indigenous women. It's, uh, that's the trick. So just if anybody didn't figure that out already, that's the way to go. I deeply, deeply appreciate uh, Regional Chief Terry Tiji for the invite to be here today and also, of course, our partners from the First Nations Summit and uh, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, uh, Cheryl Casimir and Cook B. Judy Wilson. And uh, we work together as a team, which is what it's about. I learned some wisdom, if I have any, uh, back in the 90s with, uh, I know there's, uh, we have uh, dignitaries from Ahouset here. Uh, and, and I just want to thank them. Uh, the, um, Earl McQuinnett George, hereditary chief uh, who passed, uh, taught me Hishukishwak, all things are connected, everything is one. And that has helped me, I think, on my path towards what we have been able to work together and accomplish here together. Before I start, uh, formally I've already started, but I do want to recognize the territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe. And uh, I want to thank also and recognize the elders uh, up at the front here, the matriarchs and the youth in the room. I've had the honor of being BC's Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation for just over two years now. And before that, almost 12 years as a, uh, as a, uh, as a critic for Aboriginal affairs in British Columbia. When I became minister, our government committed to a fundamental change to the province's relationship with Indigenous peoples. Indeed, one of my first meetings in the interior with the Karis Kani Nations and Chiefs, uh, they told me, my, they gave me my walking orders, they said that my job was to do constructive damage to the status quo. So I hope that, uh, that we've had some success there. Uh, in, the, in recent times here. And it's in the way we sit down at tables. It's in the way we support uh, uh, the priorities of Indigenous communities. But at, at its heart, it's about recognizing the right to self-determination and self-government. We've made historic investments in housing, uh, off-reserve and on-reserve. And provinces don't do that. And we are doing that now in British Columbia. Uh, we've invested in language revitalization, uh, new legislation on child welfare, leg uh, child welfare, environmental assessment. Uh, that's the environmental assessment work was, uh, I know, done closely with uh, Minister Heyman and uh, Regional Chief Terry Tiji. 
and, and also a long-term commitment to share gaming revenues, which uh, happens in many other provinces, but had not happened in British Columbia. So we now have $100 million going to communities every year uh, for their priorities that the nation set. And that, that's $3 billion uh, legislatively set over the next 25 years. And just last week, as I think uh, we've mentioned, uh, we unanimously passed legislation on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indig Indigenous Peoples. The implementing of the UN Declaration as a framework for reconciliation, as called for by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, and, and as cited by Willie Littlechild just uh, earlier, uh, that's uh, Article 43, I believe. Anybody who attended the, uh, the hearings of that uh, commission the great work they did uh, would uh, would certainly support the work that we've done in British Columbia in in uh, recognizing in law the human rights of Indigenous peoples. Uh, the first jurisdiction in Canada to enact such legislation, and it takes it takes courage for all of us to forge that path. But this legislation shows that we can approach uh, that when we approach uh, any tough task uh, that government and Indigenous peoples working together can make it happen. And it was not always an easy road. We, we, we had, uh, there were challenges we de that we developed uh, over the 18 months of building the bill in partnership with the BCAFN, the First Nations Summit, and the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. It took work and it took commitment, making sure that we were doing it in a good way. And we knew that we, to be successful, the province had to do it together with Indigenous peoples and it was critical to our success. This kind of collaboration on legislation is unprecedented in British Columbia, it's unprecedented in Canada. Sometimes uh, we had to get creative uh, and uh, our, or challenge long-standing uh, systems and processes within, uh, often legal processes within, within the, the, the system of government. It took difficult conversations with leadership and technical teams for, for our respective partners. But we all kept going. We had a vision at the end. Anne-Marie Sam always told me, Minister, it's the long game, and we just kept plugging away. The legislation is a concrete step, and we, celebra and we celebrate our, our historic achievement. Uh, I know we're we'll be celebrating it for a while. My time is up. Uh, this is uh, historic. Uh, uh, this historic uh, legislation lays uh, at the hands of a whole bunch of people that I can't begin to name, and I just want to thank them all so much. Kleko, Kleko, Chu. Thank, thank you very much for that. We'll ask the National Chief to provide the concluding remarks and our transition to our next guest, but I do want to make a couple observations. Uh, the slide presentations will be available, as is our custom. The French translation is in the works right now and will also be available. And I do want to, con again, be ask the people in the side conversations and particularly in the back of the room to be a little bit conscientious about how that can fill up the room and make it difficult to hear. And so with that, to thank our panel and our honored guest, the National Chief. Just uh, again to thank um, the panel members up here to my right and to my left, to Grand Chief Willie Littlechild and Jennifer Preston and Paul Joff for their words and everything they've done locally, regionally, nationally, internationally. Chief Terry DG to my left and Chief Kazmir, Cookby Judy Wilson, Merle Alexander, Minister Scott Fraser and Jessica Wood. All the people here, you know, they've done good things and we wanted to bring them all up because we wanted to show what's possible and uh, we don't always see eye to eye with these little governments called premiers and provincial governments. But when you do have a collaborative work relationship, you can get one, two or three things done. And that's what we see over here. So we wanted this team here from BC and these ones on the national, international file, always helping us. So let's all lift them all up together and say a big thank you for sharing their wisdom and their good work here in their panel. We have much work to do about getting all the laws and policies now in line with the UN Declaration. And so that's the challenge going forward. And we want to learn from you all again. Thank you very much for joining us here at our assembly, guys. Thanks, chiefs and leadership. So, chiefs and, and delegates and staff and relatives, um, again, we have ministers coming to our assembly and the, and the next uh, lady is uh, again been around for many years she was uh, she's a medical doctor and she was also a critic before becoming the minister 
of Crown and Dish Relations. And she's been around for many, many, many years helping each and every one of us. And we wanted to, to make sure that we had ample time to hear from the Minister of Crown and Indigenous Relations. Uh, she's been a minister since 2015, and she's since been newly reappointed as the Minister of Crown and Indigenous Relations. And she's done a lot of work focusing on things like we've got to fix spec claims policy, comprehensive claims policy, additions to reserve policy, the inherent right policy, and anything to do with this crown, the honor of the crown. We work with this lady, this very special individual. So please join me in, in helping to welcome to the stage Minister Carol Bennett. This is a, a kind, kind introduction, and uh, and we are uh, so grateful to to be here with you and the all the regional chiefs and tri council, the chiefs and assembly, premiers, ministers, and it was great to see that BC panel uh, just uh, just a, ahead of us. So, suis honoré de m'adresser au chef en assemblée. I speak to the chiefs in assembly. I thank you to have invited me to uh, be part of this special assembly, uh, which is taking place in the traditional territories of the Algonquin Nation. I guess I just want to say it's great to be back. Um, it uh, it feels good uh, to be able to get back to work on the things that matter so much to the future of Canada, the unfinished work of Confederation. It's great to be amongst uh, friends again and uh, and to make new ones as we congratulate all of you in the room that on your new positions of leadership and uh, it, it really is uh, um, a, an exciting time it was great uh, to be able to sit down last week with the national chief and to reconfirm on behalf of the government of canada and as i reiterate to all of you assembled here today we will continue to place the utmost importance on the relationship between the Crown and Indigenous peoples. So it's great um, to, to actually have my colleagues, uh, the amazing uh, Mark Miller, the Minister of Indigenous Services, uh, Minister Lametti and Ministers Gibo, uh, that are, are able to join with you uh, um, in, at this special assembly. And uh, I think for all of us, the Prime Minister, all of Cabinet, all of government, and really, hopefully, the Parliament of Canada uh, to make sure that, that reconciliation is, is really uppermost in the minds of Canadians as we go forward. On October 21st, Canadians were clear. A strong majority voted for parties that had made strong commitments to reconciliation and to climate change. Deputy Minister Watson a wise man reminded us that an election doesn't mean that we've just pushed pause on a movie that's already scripted and shot. Elections mean that we actually have to have a fresh look at what worked and what mistakes we have learned from. We can now look at what we can change in how we work together. The Assembly of First Nations has been clear in identifying a number of key issues that are foundational to advancing First Nations' relationship with the Crown. Implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is among the top priorities you've made clear to us. And as I've uh, been asked to keep my remarks brief, I attempted, uh, when you said I had 15 minutes and then it changed to seven, I thought maybe I'd just read every other page. But um, I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to try and keep it down so we've got lots of time for, for questions. Um, I think that we all in this room believe that C-262, it was a, a shame that that wasn't able to become the law of the land, but that we also know that it is a floor, not the ceiling, and that we're going to work together to co-develop the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People legislation. 
And it was wonderful in, to be in British Columbia yesterday to feel the real excitement over the passage of Bill 41 from last week and then to hear the panel this morning. This is, this is again, an example of what the provincial government, together with First Nations Leadership Council, it recognizes the importance of the relationship and the everlasting partnership between a provincial government and Indigenous peoples. And it's wonderful for you, uh, uh, National Chief, and, and all of you to, to see the blanketing ceremony and the, the real recognition of, of the Premier and Minister F Fraser uh, yesterday. Uh, it was also exciting to celebrate uh, the crafting of the BC policy with the BC Summit and the BC government, which once and for all will relegate the words extinguishment, seed and surrender to the history books as we describe the approach to modern treaties, agreements and other constructive arrangements in British Columbia. I think some of you know I was in British Columbia yesterday in Victoria at the invitation of Minister Monsef to attend the FPT meeting on status of women with the Indigenous leadership, including your Doris Anderson from the Women's Council to discuss the work ahead, co-developing a national action plan as called for by the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls and for the 2S LGBTQQIA communities. Come nous tous savons. The national investigation uh, on uh, the murdered missing women uh, should be a beginning, not an end. Each has a role to play in the future. The calls for justice were clear. In order for the action plan to be effective, it had to be distinctions-based and address the unique needs, experiences, and cultural context of Indigenous peoples and communities from coast to coast to coast. Co-development will be the key to getting this right, but we know that the plan has to be built on the wise practices of Indigenous women, those with lived experience and those with expertise. Every community must be able to see themselves in the plan. And so yesterday it was so impressive to see Elaine I, Alec present her, wor her work in the BC communities, A Path Forward, which is, is the really listening about what is necessary in community safety plans for all of the communities. So as we go forward, it, what I think all of us felt yesterday was that a true national action plan will need to also determine the best possible indicators uh, as well as collect the necessary data to demonstrate that the reforms to the policies and practice that we need will indeed be saving lives. We've heard that some are worried about the June target for a national action plan. They're worried it's too ambitious. But I do believe that an action plan is a living document and that we can fulfill the wishes of the families and survivors that they shouldn't have to wait to have concrete actions put in place to stop this national tragedy. As Murray Sinclair has said, the question needs to be, do Indigenous women and girls and the 2S LGBTQIA people feel that they are safe in their communities and on the streets of our urban centers? We are looking to you and your Women's Council for advice on how to best to co-develop the National Action Plan. Ultimately, our work together is about decolonization, which is why we are looking forward to continuing to work with you on the meaningful reforms to comprehensive claims, specific claim and inherent right policies. And this leads me to the last issue, the establishment of a National Treaty Commission, to make sure that Canada implements the spirit and intent of treaties going forward we will work together with you to co-develop a process for the ongoing review, maintenance, and enforcement of Canada's treaty obligations between the Crown and Indigenous communities. We talk about moving from paternalism to partnership, but I think you know that I believe that it will only be a partnership if you think it feels like a partnership. You are setting the path for decolonization and reconciliation. I want to thank you for your leadership and your continued partnership.
for helping us break from the unacceptable status quo and build a better future for everyone. I love and will steal Minister Scott Fraser's famous mission to do constructive damage to the status quo. And we thank you, Minister Fraser, for that every day. And I think all of us in this room just want to get to work on exactly that. Thank you, Messi Chimigwich. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. We have uh, some speakers making their way to the uh, microphones. Microphone number one, please. Okay, Ninak. Nistoko Makinima. Thank you for being here, Minister. Um, I am the elected and the traditional chief of the Kana blood tribe and I was elected by a majority of my electorate, uh, which is somewhat greater than what your government just got re-elected. You did okay in my riding. <laughs> so anyways, anyways, I want to thank you for the good work that you have done over the, over the years and how you have uh, uh, represented uh, the federal government in ensuring that we uh, uh, are, are uh, accorded the, uh, the rights that we have. Um, and much has been talked about the reconciliation that the federal government has undertaken uh, in your dealings with Treaty First Nations people. Um, however, at times uh, it is hard for some of us to, uh, to accept that, uh, that mode of reconciliation that your government has, uh, has, has talked about. Uh, when a tribe, when a nation such as the Ghana Blood Tribe defeats the federal government of Canada through your own courts, through the federal court system, on important um, land claims, uh, treaty land claims, and that court makes a decision uh, that allows us to get some of the land that was stolen from us. Uh, well, we've gone along with that decision by the federal courts, by your courts. However, you have not gone along with it. I'm just wondering how that fits. If we're saying one thing and doing something else, doesn't make sense to me, Minister. So I'd like to have some, some response as to who makes that final decision. Is it yourselves as the political leaders of Canada or is it your justice lawyers who makes those decisions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chief. <laughs> Microphone number two, please. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to wish Carol congratulations on your election. What I, 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 I want to talk about uh, the issue of uh, reconciliation. Okay? I'm not elected. I've been pastored out. But I'm, <laughs> I, I proxy for a lot of my chiefs in Saskatchewan. All right? I've been at these assemblies for over 40 years. And you know, the buzzword across this country is about reconciliation. And I want to share with you, I'm a survivor. And I tell you, you talk about indicators. You're, the indicators you talk about are different than my indicators. The indicators for myself and the leaders in this room is the poverty within our communities. And you guys have a role and responsibility to deal with that poverty. The suicides, the opioids, the health system, the offloading to the province and the province not offloading off to our communities. That system is just not working. 
when you bury people on a weekly basis, a normal person like you, you go to maybe six, ten funerals in your lifetime. I've been to over 600 funerals. And that's very hurtful. You know, the reconciliation we talk about in this country, it's a buzzword. It's, it's not reaching our communities. There has to be a lot of reconciliation going on in our communities. But you're giving all these monies to universities, to all these white schools, none to our Indian schools, none to our communities. And that's where a reconciliation, that's my reconciliation that I talk about. And I call them the nobodies, and that's us living in our reserves that, have, that really have nothing. And our, our, and our poor people run to our leadership for help. And our leadership can't help them for the simple reason you people do not give funding to our leaders based on our needs of our, our people. And that's wrong. I'm very excited about the, UN, uh, about the UN declaration. Very excited about it. You know, we, uh, uh, we got provinces, we got Alberta, we got Saskatchewan talking about alienation. We've been alienated as Indian people for hundreds of years. The province don't get us involved. Their excuse here a federal responsibility, which is true. But the natural resources of this land belong to the Indian people. And nobody wants to talk about that. So Carol, Caroline, I, I reach out to you, to your ministers, to your cabinet. You know, you guys had four years. You've done a lot. You put First Nations agenda on the national first time since confederation and i said this yesterday to the minister and you guys learned a lot in four years and you got to finish the commitments that you made to our people because there's a lot of hurt out there my friend our youth cried in front of all our chiefs yesterday and when our youth that are sitting here when nobody listens to them, you know what happens? The suicide crisis. Two years ago, Pillipot, yes, Pillipot announced $850 million for a suicide crisis across the country. You know what was the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian share out of that $850 million? $1,200. When it went to 600 and some bands. So that's the sad part. You could make major million dollar announcements, but when you have to levy it out to all the bands, it's a different story. Nothing gets to the communities. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone number one, please. Good morning. Uh, Chief Calvin Bruno, Papa State's First Nation, uh, based out of uh, Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, I have a few questions for you, but first I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional territory of Anishinaabe and um, Algonquin. And I want to acknowledge all the chiefs here, vice chief, national chief, minister, and everybody in the gallery. And um, well, we can't forget our elders too, and, uh, and, the, and the prayers that have gone up for us. I have two questions for you, minister. Uh, one of them is, um, in terms of uh, setting aside reserves, and I'm referring to Treaty 6, and it talks about setting aside reserves for our use and benefit. And, and also it says that we're to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, given the lands where we want them. Now, the lands are outside Edmonton, and the thing is a lot of our people are coming from the reserves to the urban center. So if we're going to have some uh, backbone to these reserves and live up to the promises, we should have them, uh, uh, the lands given to us where we want in terms of the ATR. You know, we should have them in the urban centers where a lot of our people are going. We have the second highest population in Canada. 
So we should be setting aside lands in urban centres for our people, for use for economic use, for residential, because these are big issues. And um, my second question is, uh, you know, in a, one of these bands in Canada, there's many of us that are still not fully recognized. Now, on behalf of these bands, what I'm asking is um, to look at acknowledging us and recognizing us and helping us to get to a place where, where the other bands are, to build a capacity. We need that because we're basically playing catch up. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, with that, I just want to say uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for all that you do for us. And uh, we just continue to have that uh, working relationship with you. And I was uh, recently re-elected as well in September. And uh, I had a majority too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recognize the theme uh, that we're going on, but I do want to re remind the delegation that um, we have six minutes left with uh, the minister, and, and uh, she will want to respond to the, uh, the, quest the questions and the comments from the delegation. There is another minister that's coming up uh, at 10:30 uh, sharp. So we have four more speakers. And then uh, if we can get it all done in six minutes, I would really appreciate that. But it's not my assembly, it's your assembly chiefs. And microphone uh, number two, please. Yes, good morning. My name is Wendy Jonko. I'm from the Algonquins of Pequamtigon First Nation, an hour and a half and away from here. I'm here as proxy on behalf of Chief Kirby White Duck. So on behalf of Chief Kirby White Duck and the members of the Algonquins of First Nation Pequamtigon Council, we invite you, uh, Minister Bennett, to our community, along with the National Chief Perry Bellegarde, to come and visit us and discuss further um, our land claim negotiations. So in the new year, you'll be getting a formal invitation from us to come to our community. So, miigwech. Thank you very much. Yes. Microphone number one, please. Excellent, excellent cook's jam. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge the traditional lands of the Algonquin, and um, I also want to express gratitude for all the great work that you've done this year, last term with First Nations, and your advocacy. But what I'm up here today for is I have missed the uh, uh, dialogue that you had with the BC Caucus, and I came in thereafter, and I really would love to extend the opportunity to meet with you and have some advocation in regards to um, our day scholars class action and working towards that residential school um, reconciliation. Um, today, I just wanted to inform you that we are putting two motions to the floor, one for our day scholars and one for our, our um, descendants and one for our, our band class. So you spoke of the election, what worked and what didn't work. I just wanted to share something with you as well. So the previous Liberal government has expressed a willingness and in many other areas to resolve claims through negotiations and other cases. So we're looking for that same opportunity. So that's something that did not work last term. There was no sitting at the table to have that discussion towards negotiation. We want to see that for our members. We are advocating for 105 bands across Canada. So we want to see some resolution, and we are going to be seeking support from the AFN today, so I just wanted to let you know that as well. And I look forward to having, um, you know, I'm hoping to hear that we have some commitment to looking towards some resolve in that area. And, you know, extending the fact that, you know, we want to be sitting with our executive team. I know that um, Joanne Goffertson, who's been advocating um, endless hours towards this reconciliation as well and um, you know hands off to her as well and we just want to see some closure we want to see reconciliation we want to see um, steps towards that progress so i just wanted to express that to you today miigwech can you please identify uh, who you are and where you come from sure i am cookie rosan kasmer at the kamos de Schwabek. thank you very much Microphone number one, please. Wire Kohart up, Kalmuk Squas Munukchina, Jaw Cook, Peace Bellachina, Chief Lane Christian from uh, the Sokwapan Nation. Uh, Minister Bennett, uh, in relation to the, you know, what uh, Cook B. Uh, Roseanne just presented, it really relates directly to the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. You know, we're talking negotiation versus litigation. So what are you going to do with the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal in the same, in the same vein as we're 
What we're asking for is no more what's been before the courts now for 10 years in terms of the, the issues of children and what's happening with this government, talking about reconciliation, talking about the most important relationship, et cetera, et cetera. But the actions don't speak to what you're doing. So we need to see some action on this stuff. In relation to the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, get out of court and get into the negotiation process ASAP. Those children deserve better. Those families and the impacts that that is having across this country, and it is an effect of the colonization process and what I call legislative genocide of Canada. Your laws put us in this place. We need you to step forward and your government to actually do something. Let's stop talking about it, let's not litigate, let's negotiate and get in the room with us. Let's create solutions for those children and our families. Kukstrom, thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing, thank you delegation, seeing no other speakers, I would call up uh, Minister no, one more. One more. Bennett. One oh, we have uh, one, more. one more at microphone number one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to everyone. I thank the Creator for the gift of a new day and the rest of the night. Good morning, Minister Bennett. Congratulations on your re-election and your reappointment. I represent the Lakalzap village government from the Niska Nation. I carry the proxy. My name is Kevin McKay. As you will know, in a matter of some months, Nishka Nation will invite everyone once again to celebrate the 20th year of implementing BC's first modern treaty, the Nishka Final Agreement. I have here in my hand my copy, 252 pages long, 22 chapters. It took our nation 113 years of negotiations to produce this sacred document. And yet, Minister, I don't have to go very far in the Nishka community to see the remnants of the Indian Act. Our oral history places us on our lands into the tens of thousands of years. The Indian Act was imposed on the nation of the Nishka people for 124 years, and it did a tremendous amount of damage. We have a story to tell, and it is not a pretty picture. However, having said that, we have no regrets about where we are today. I am here to remind everyone, we have a sacred duty and responsibility to make this treaty work for the Nishka Nation, for British Columbia, and for Canada. And in that regard, Minister Bennett, I thank you for your comments and your commitment again today to work with the modern treaty groups towards a more effective implementation of our sacred treaties. This will allow us to achieve true reconciliation. One heart, one path, one Nation. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Minister. Thanks so much. That was, um, I will start uh, with uh, Roy Fox, uh, Chief, uh, about, about the court case and how we really do believe that that we want 
whenever possible to not be in court. And we, we really do believe that on so many issues, it is about, about the path to self-determination and having a thriving nations that, that are able to have the resources and, and the land to be able to, to look after their people. And I look, I look forward to, to, to the path forward with the Kanai community and, and, and your treaty. I, I think that um, our friend Ted from Saskatchewan gave us uh, very good advice in terms of the kinds of indicators that, that will really matter on not only um, MMIWG but for all of the issues, whether it's child and family services in the first five calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation, whether it's poverty, whether it's suicide, whether it's 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 high school leaving and and post secondary that that what you're describing is really the need for 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 self determination and 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 the kinds of needs based funding until we move to that that approach with resource revenue sharing and where where communities actually do have the the resources they need um, or the, and the revenues they need from the resources on their lands. I, I, the Prime Minister has committed to a First Minister's meeting on the priorities of Indigenous peoples, and I know that resource revenue sharing will be very much part of, 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 of how, how we, will, we need to, to be able to explain that uh, Section 35 rights aren't optional and that we have to move forward in a good way and it is about the youth and it is about trauma and it is about about how how we we have to acknowledge um the the effects of colonization and and how we move forward in what chief willie littlechild talked about uh, reconciliation action but it actually needs to feel differently on the ground if and in communities if, if we are going to be able to go forward. Chief Byrne talked about uh, Treaty 6 um, and, and how, uh, and congratulations on your re-election. But again, the issues around reserve lands and ATRs, we also believe um, that some of the work that you are all doing as treaty groups to be able to move to self-determination as treaty groups Will, will help solve a lot of these problems as, as I think that we were so grateful to see Treaty 1 um, work together on, on what will happen with the Campion Barracks in Winnipeg that, that gives all of, of the, the communities in Treaty 1 an opportunity for urban, de, urban resources, urban development, and I think that that will be um, really exciting uh, to watch as other treaty groups um, work together to again uh, on their their urban lands and 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 economic opportunities, uh, we thank uh, the national chief and I thank uh, Wendy for um, the inv invitation and uh, and and please give our best to to Chief White Duck uh, that uh, we look forward to to visiting your community. The, I did speak a little bit this morning at at. Um, at uh, the BC caucus, I apologize that I'm sort of only getting short visits to each of the caucuses, but it, I am going to get to all of them. But I am, um, I think you do understand that with the FPT meeting um, yesterday, that my time's a bit short for the S SCA. But I will. Um, we want to be able to always have have the real conversations in your territories. <clears throat> we did. Joanne Godfordson did speak at BC Caucus this morning on the Day Scholars issue. Uh, I think that it is uh, it is about uh, um, us moving forward. We do want to get out of court. We do want to be able to negotiate. But I think some of you know that the band class has made it more difficult for for Canada to understand how what would be the 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 best way forward and we we i think still at the tables are discussing whether there there would be an ability to settle the with the survivors and their families first and 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 then decide um what we do about the band class because that is a an um that is a uh a, a 
different approach than we've had with McLean or with all of the, we as Canada, um, as, as, uh, well, as uh, Kupke Christian mentioned, um, we are committed to deal with all of the childhood litigation, but also deal with, with all of the children who were harmed by these failed colonial policies. And so it is going to be hugely important that, that not only the CH are the, the children and families covered by the time frame of the CHRT um, that we deal with from 1991 when the 60 scoop settlement finished to the, 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 the children and families in between from 91 to 2006. And I think that Minister Miller is, uh, and Minister Lametti are, are completely committed to doing the right thing and, and to make sure that those that were harmed, um, they are, are dealt with in a, in a just way and that we, we really do want to get um, to work with you on that. Uh, it is about, um, I think uh, um, Kevin McKay's intervention for NISCA was hugely important in that um, as, as you approach your 20 year anniversary and that story to tell that you mentioned that I, I want, I think is must say that going into this minority government, um, I remember being up all night voting on NISCA because it was turned into some, some partisan game uh, where as were changed to thus and people were changing words all the way through it. And instead of saying this is what Canada and the Niska Nation have decided that we actually do need to be able to honour those negotiations and go forward in a good way. And so I, I think that there's much to learn from that, that first um, um, self-government agreement and, and that we, we need to again keep learning to make sure the, the, the remnants of the Indian Act and the poverty and the things that, that still are go ongoing in communities can be, can be turned around bottom up with your leadership and, and that I really can't thank the self-governing nations enough for the hard work they did over the past two to three years on the collaborative fiscal arrangement. This new collaborative fiscal arrangement really means that communities will get probably close to three times the, the re resources that they would have had under the Indian Act, and it means they actually have the money to run their own governments and to be able to make, set their own priorities and go forward. So I uh, think this is about finally um, making uh, uh, the treaties work and, and all of the modern treaties agreements and, uh, and constructive arrangements. So I, I really thank you for the, for the really important questions and look forward to an ongoing dialogue. And, uh, and uh, I uh, just, chi miigwech, masi chok. She brought it to a close. Minister Bennett, we have, uh, for your work and your uh, efforts and ongoing relationship you have with our assembly and all the leadership across Turtle Island, we do have a, a gift for you to present and uh, to thank you and acknowledge you for your effort. And you're the Minister of Crown Relations. And so we have two things. We have this cedar box, the beautiful carving on the front. And we have a kihil. You'll need help to see far ahead and to work with us for our rights recognition and implementation and everything else. So. On behalf of our assembly here and our executive team, thank you for your words. We have lots of work to do to maintain momentum. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. You got that? I've got it. So Thanks so much. Good. Okay. We have to move. Okay. Now, Chiefs, I have uh, the next minister here, Honorable Stephen Guibault. He was elected the Member of Parliament for Laurier St. Marie in 2019. Minister Guibault is a prominent advocate in the fight against the climate crisis and has been leading the charge from Laurier St. Marie for many years. Minister Guibault's commitment to environmental issues started at the age of five when he climbed a tree to protect, to, to protect the tree from real estate developers who were about to cut down the woods behind his home in Latouk. 25 years later, 
He scaled the CN Tower in Toronto to call for Canada to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. In 1993, Minister Gibault co-founded Equiterre, the largest environmental organization in Quebec, and served as its senior director from 2008 to 2018, 2018. He also worked as a director and campaign manager for Greenpeace, and he was a strategic advisor for more than 10 years at Cycle Capital Management. It's a Canadian fund dedicated to the development of clean technologies. Minister Guibault also worked for Deloitte & Touche as well as Copticom, a consulting firm specializing in the green and social economy and transportation. He's an activist. He's a strategic advisor for dozens of governments and businesses in Canada and abroad. Minister Guibault, he's a pragmatist. He works to make a difference by building bridges and relationships. He's an avid cyclist and a sportsman, and he's been riding his bike 12 months a year for the last 30 years. He's a father of four, he's a stepfather of two, and now he's the minister tasked with the responsibility for implementing Bill C-91, the Languages Revitalization Act. So please join me in wel welcoming him to the stage now for his words, Minister Gibo. He sometimes calls Spider-Man for scaling the CN Tower. No, I just can't. Donc, simplement pour des questions techniques, je rappelle que la période va être de 30 minutes et que nous allons avoir, donc nous allons mettre 10 minutes sur le compteur, 10 minutes, on the meter, 10 minutes yes. et ensuite une période de questions-commentaires et réactions avec le ministre Guilbeault et nous allons lui laisser aussi un moment pour pouvoir répondre et avoir quelques commentaires so, euh, finaux. Alors, merci, honorable ministre Guilbeault, Minister, the mic is yours. Elders. National yeah. Chief Bellegarde, Grand Chiefs and Chiefs, Council members and Community members, AFN staff, Cabinet colleagues. Kwe, Tansei, Bonjour, Bonjour, Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. It is a great honour for me to meet all of you in my new role as Minister of Canadian Heritage. I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. I'm delighted to take my first steps as minister with you. I'm here partly to introduce myself, but mostly to listen. As a new minister, I'm making it my priority to listen and to learn from you, as well as the hundreds of First Nations communities you represent. In fact, it was with you, National Chief Perry Bellegarde, that I had my first official discussion as minister. Perry, it was a real pleasure talking with you. You're a strong advocate for First Nations rights, and I think we're both coming from a place of strong conviction, a belief in doing what's right. Before going into politics, I spent 25 years working on environmental issues. In that career, I work with, and sometimes against, politicians in order to protect the planet and safeguard our kids' future. So I have a great deal of respect for the work that you do, including your advocacy on Indigenous languages. Our culture, our history, our languages are vital to who we are. Our ways of expressing ourselves, telling our stories, dreaming of our future, all that is what defines us in a fundamental way. Notre culture, notre histoire, Nos langues our history, sont une grande richesse. Our, uh, Nos façons de nous exprimer, rich, de raconter et de rêver notre avenir. Express and to dream Tout cela, our future. Ce qui nous All of this defines so us. So I feel privileged to join in you as minister to make every effort and to work tirelessly to preserve, protect, and revitalize indigenous languages. On June 21st of this year, we took an important step forward together. The Indigenous Language Act received royal assent. This historic milestone would not have been possible without the AFN's leadership. The Indigenous Language Act is the result of two years of collaboration and co-development with Indigenous people, specialists, knowledge keepers, and experts. A lot of determination, energy, and wisdom have gone into this legislation. 
la loi sur les langues autochtones est le fruit de deux ans de collaboration avec vous, Which has avec les peuples autochtones, of les experts et les experts. Avec beaucoup de bonne volonté, d'énergie et de sagesse ont été investis dans cette loi. Dans cette loi. To the chief, the Chief's Technical Committee on Languages and all those who contributed to the legislative process, Chimigwich, we could not have done it without you. I would also like to recognize the work that has been done by my predecessor, Minister Rodriguez, as well as all the people who supported the legislative process. With this legislation, we're stepping into a new era in the relationship between Canada and Indigenous people. The Act builds on the spirit of collaboration that got us to this point, and I look forward to our ongoing cooperation and dialogue as we implement the legislation. Implementation and providing adequate funding for it are key priorities for me when it comes to Indigenous languages. Budget 2019 set aside substantial amounts for the implementation of the Act. My officials have met with the AFN to look into the, these issues and begin the discussion. Indeed, the Act includes determining with you the funding methodology. With clear obligations for consult consultation on how to meet the goal of providing adequate sustainable and long-term funding for the reclamation, revitalization, maintenance, and strengthening of indigenous languages. The Act also establishes the Office of the Commissioner of Indigenous Languages. I'm also happy to note that the work to implement the Act started immediately following the Royal Assent, even through the election period that officials from the Assembly of First Nations, the Inuit Tapirit Kanatami, the Métis Co National Council and Canadian Heritage are working collaboratively through a joint implementation working group. That there have also been outreach to other indigenous organizations, such as the National Association of Friendship Centers and the First Nation Confeder Confederacy of Cultural and Education Centers to seek their perspectives. I want to hear your point of views and concerns. I want to continue the dialogue with you and all indigenous communities across the country on the important work needed to implement the legislation. Your knowledge, vision, and experience are essential to ensuring that the act truly serves the people for whom it is intended. You have already achieved a great deal. I'm honored to join you here today and look forward to working with you in a spirit of mutual trust and respect. Je suis honoré de me joindre à vous aujourd'hui. J'ai hâte de travailler avec vous dans un esprit de confiance today. et de respect and mutuel. I'm looking forward Miigwech. to working Thank with you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci monsieur le ministre. Mr. Minister. Donc, euh, on so, a une période de questions, commentaires, question comments, Alors, réactions. Euh, nous allons aller au microphone We're going numéro to go un, to to microphone microphone one. one, please. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, welcome uh, to our gathering, uh, <coughs> Minister. Uh, loosely translated, I called you uh, which means the real white man in our language. But sometimes I wonder. Anyways, uh, we are glad of the work that you have done with uh, uh, the National Chief and uh, some of the other organizations with respect to the uh, uh, protection of our indigenous languages. We look forward. Uh, to that participation. Uh, but however, sometimes we have to ask hard questions uh, in the responsibilities that you have now inherited. Um, there is a valuable resource uh, that is found on our lands. Uh, our people, it's also a very sacred uh, article, uh, and our people have used it for millennia. It is called Iniskim, loosely translated buffalo stone. Modern day scientific name for it 
is the ammonite, which produces amylite um, jewelry. It's a semi-precious uh, stone. And uh, about two years ago, Heritage Canada claimed ownership of that at a border crossing uh, between Canada and the United States. As some of our people who are into that uh, into that business sector, uh, uh, the Amalite, Ammonite was confiscated by your government, by your ministry, uh, stating that it is Heritage Canada's property and not the property of my people or my business people or my sacred people. So you've held that up, not yourself personally, but your ministry has held that up, and you continue to claim ownership of that. Alberta government tried to do the same thing many decades ago, and I told the minister, uh, the uh, premier of the day, his name was Getty, where to go. So they backed off. They realized that it's our property. I think you have to look into this matter, uh, and you have to straighten it out, because that is our property. Just the same as if Canada is claiming ownership to our oil and gas. Same thing. It's ours. Thank you very much. Thank you. M microphone number two and microphone number two as well again after. Thank you. Okay, I'm just uh, Chief Mackinac from Rumskin. I'm just uh, giving the floor to Grand Chief Wilchild. He wants to make some comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good morning, Minister. I, uh, I'm taking the floor as the uh, founder and ambassador for the World Indigenous Games. I'm also ambassador for the World Olympic Games, the Winter Olympic Games. And I was very, very disappointed and discouraged that portfolio of sport has appeared to be sidelined or has disappeared. But I understand it's under your portfolio and hopefully you will give equal weight to the consideration of sport in your ministry. Because as you talk about language, language is key to sport and sport is key to our languages. So I just want to make an urgent plea to you that you give special attention when we call on you to consider sports, physical activity, and recreation for indigenous peoples. Thank you. Hmm. Yes. Thank you, Chief. What, little child. Microphone one, please. Good morning. I want to first of all acknowledge the pipes that were lifted on our behalf this morning and acknowledge the territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg. And I greet you all this morning, the executive, the elders, um, and um, all, of our, all of us, my friends and relatives gathered here today. Um, Minister, um, thank you for your presentation. I, um, I just want to raise the issue of um, a resolution that was brought forward, resolution number 43, brought forward to the AFN last, um, last, gen last July uh, regarding the commemoration of the numbered treaties. Uh, it's 150 years coming up beginning with Treaty 1 in 2021 and the resolution was passed um, directing the AFN to seek commemorative funding for the, numbered, the 150th anniversary of the numbered treaties coming up. And I, th I think that this is um, a, an excellent opportunity for us to spread awareness about the importance of um, the numbered treaties to the, you know, the, the, the um, you know, as an economic driver in Canada in the early days of um, Canadian expansion on the prairies. And we want to commemorate and bring uh, focus on the unfulfilled obligations of treaty during this time. It's very important that we do this 
for the 150th anniversary, but also um, to um, create some commemorative projects in our in our number treaties areas. So I I, um, I ask that uh, the AFN and uh, Canadian Heritage look at this um, uh, with um, with due haste. 2021 is coming up very quickly. Miigwech. Thank you. Donc, juste en termes de, de temps qui est limité, il y a trois personnes au micro et nous allons fermer la période de questions après les trois personnes qui sont déjà au micro. Alors, uh, so we're closing the speakers list after the three person already at the microphone. So, no, microphone number two, please. Délégué Damash, come on. Thank you. I'm very thankful. Kihtam, Ogamag, Ogamai Skui, Agota Suit Nog, Kitatam Skat Na. I acknowledge all the chiefs, so you're present, council members, headmen, women. I know Sky Gisagak, Nanashkoma, the minister. I uh, thank the minister uh, for the report. A uh, couple of things, a couple of issues is, uh, with uh, Heritage uh, Canada. Many of our, uh, in our territory, uh, uh, somewhat to the uh, previous speaker, the uh, commemorative. Uh, 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 sites, uh, memorial sites uh, in our area that uh, need upgrading. Uh, 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 some of the historical sites, I guess, to do with a more with the fur trade in, in the north. So just your attention on that. I, uh, my name is Brian Hardlot, uh, Minister, uh, a uh, Grand Chief of the Prince Albert Rand Council, a uh, four uh, sectors in the uh, Prince Albert Rand Council, uh, four to three uh, thousand membership. A uh, just with the uh, language uh, legislation, uh, Minister. A heads up, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. You know, that's uh, very historical. Uh, yeah, we are, we are. Kita uh, uh, tanano, We are losing our language. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, I thank the government for doing that. We thank the government and the Prince Albert Grand Council, although a heads up minister, that needs to be resources in this legislation. They needs to be funding. In our band control schools in, in our region, uh, yeah, we've had cultural and also language programs in, in our schools, but that's still, still, the numbers go up in terms of losing our language. Uh, so there, has to, that, there has to be that resources. It has to be uh, resources given to the, uh, the First Nations. And the community, like my community, where I come from, I have to I admit, yes, we are losing our resource, and it has to be the community start from the community because we have we, we we've taught language in our schools for for many many years in our band control schools in our first nations saskatchewan in our region but still the kids don't they uh, they, um, they uh, speak a language i am very very happy proud when i go to a community like the uh, walston lake hadjet lake denny nation and you see these small ones speaking their language their denny language Boy, that's a, that's history. and that's what we need to do. That's what we need to build in our all, in all our First Nations. But the community has to say, "Yeah, we are losing." We, the community has to buy in, and then the home. It has to be spoken in the home, because we've tried teaching it in our even in our universities. You know, and they, <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's sad to see when you Asians, you know, a, 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 go to our universities. And our people fluent in the language, and these people have higher marks in, in, in our universities. You know, I, I just wanted to mention that also. But the community, the home, and then the school. I think we can we can bring our languages back in our First Nations. I just wanted to. We need those resources yeah. and the funding, Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you. Microphone number one, please. First of all, I would like to uh, recognize the peoples of this land allowing us into their house to conduct our business, and we're grateful for that. Uh, but also, I'm uh, Chief Ron Ignace, Cookby Ron Ignace of Skeetis and Nation. I also uh, 
Uh, I'm the co-chair on the Chief's Committee on Languages along with uh, our national chief. Uh, my message is simple. Uh, uh, I call upon you, Minister, and uh, congratulate you on your new post and look forward to uh, our, our, our committee working with you and carrying on the co-implementation of the, 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 the language legislation. And I call upon you to ensure that the commissioner is independent of the government and that, uh, and that as we have stated, the funding resources for our languages across the country and the government should live up to the spirit and intent of the legislation to ensure that the funding is appropriate, sufficient, and dependable, and as core funding, which is uh, native and treaty-based, community-driven, and child and family-focused. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, look forward to working with you. Good day. Thank you. Our last speaker, microphone number one, please. Proxy for Nation. Um, Minister, I'd like to. Um, we did start working when we did our um, review with SIA and NRCAN of the KGHM Ajax Abacus, and I'd like to thank the AFN for helping us and supporting us, as well as our BC um, uh, governments for what we were doing, but part of it is within our um, decision that was done by our family panel was the recommendation to declare it as a um, Canadian and a World Heritage Site, and we'd like to meet with you in order to move that forward. Cook B. Ron was tasked with doing that, but the language legislation is something that was really important to all of us, so we let that go, but now we're going to be moving forward with getting that that done and so we'd like to meet with you on that and i do have some papers for you uh, if i could give it to whoever it is that's your uh secretary one of the other things and i have brought that up because i do know that there is some things and uh, with uh, chief fox um, we need something in canada that is equivalent to the native american Re uh, religious freedom act that means that it's all of our traditional, cultural, spiritual practices, customs, beliefs, and traditions are embedded within an act that is across this country so that we can cross freely, we can utilize our religious in instruments without prosecution from anyone. And then we also need to look at uh, the Grave Repatriation Act. Um, we have been working with the uh, American Museum of Natural History to uh, repatriate our ancestors that were taken. And I know that there are a lot of our other ancestors that are in museums across the world, and we need to have free access to go and bring them home instead of having to go through a lot of red tape. So that's something that needs to be looked at from the AFN, from all of the different uh, regional chiefs in the provinces and territories, but it also needs to be something that is within um, that we need to work with across this country to ensure that we do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, okay, could be wrong. Um, create a policy for repatriation. It needs to be an act legislation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Donc merci. Merci à toutes et à tous Thank ceux qui sont venus s'exprimer au microphone. Nous allons maintenant spoke, donner la parole au ministre Guilbeault pour uh, la, ses réactions, ses réponses et le mot de la fin. Merci, Monsieur le ministre. To to these queries and preoccupations. Thank you very much for, for, for your comments and questions. Uh, Chief Fox, I've never been called a real white man before, but I'll, I'll remember this. Um, Having, having been elected a, a member of parliament for the first time less than a month ago and minister for just about two weeks, I will talk uh, to, to, to Heritage Canada about uh, the, the Buffalo Stone uh, issue. I know nothing of it, but I, but I will get uh, behind it. Grand Chief, little child, uh, let me reassure you, uh, sports has not uh, disappeared uh, from, our, from our radar screen. It is. It has been brought back to, to, under my responsibility. I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a sports enthusiast. I'm not necessarily very good at them, but I, I like practicing them, and it's very, very uh, high on, on my list of, of priorities. Um, and I, if, if there are things we can do better, I'm, I will be happy to sit down with you and, and listen to, to what you, you have to say. 
Um, in terms of um, uh, um, uh, Linda Ecus, um, for the uh, commemoration of uh, the 150th year anniversary of the number treaties, uh, we should meet. Um, uh, Heritage Canada does have some pro programs for commemoration. Uh, we should definitely uh, lo look, in, uh, look into this. Uh, regarding um, historic and um, uh, historical sites uh, and, and heritage sites, uh, interestingly enough, it is not under the um, Heritage Ministry's uh, purview or mine, uh, but it, it is under Parks Canada and my colleague uh, Jonathan Wilkinson. But those of you who have projects uh, under these auspices should should co contact us. There's a number of my uh, either staff, uh, some people from uh, from the ministry that are right over there. If they, some of them could, Charles, uh, the assistant deputy minister, we would be happy to, to follow up with you on uh, on on those issues. Um, uh, regarding the implementation of of the Language Act, the Indigenous Language Act. Uh, I mean, I, I said it in my speech, without you, this would not be a reality today. And it will only be a reality uh, when, we can, when we can work together to, to implement it. It's not about us telling you how it should be done, but it's the, it's the other way around. And we have, in, if, if you look carefully at the act, we have set obligations for ourselves as a government to be able to deliver in terms of resources and funding for the implementation of the act. So I and, and everybody at Heritage Canada and the Canadian government really look forward to working with you in, in developing what is adequate and how it should be implemented and, and in a way that makes sense for your languages, for, for your communities and for, for, for your nations. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Minister Gibo, thank you so much um, for being here. It's your, uh, the new guy on the job. And um, because the language was so important, and uh, thank Kukpi Ignace for his words and all the chiefs that helped so much. And we've always viewed the uh, Indigenous languages, First Nations languages, as Canada's national treasure, not spoken anywhere else. And um, we've also said that our language is amongst our young people. And we saw Odeshkin last night. 10-year-old speaking uh, Algonquin, but singing with his drum. Such confidence at that assembly last night. We've, studies have shown that when young First Nations men and women are fluent in their language, they're more successful in school and therefore more successful in life. And it's also linked to sovereignty and nationhood as Indigenous tribes, Indigenous nations, First Nations peoples. So it's very vital we keep working on this very, very important piece about the implementation of the language bill. And so to help us on our journey together, to help you, as the, the minister in charge of this very, very important file, we have a gift for you from our assembly. Some moccasins, and uh, they're beaded as well with a, a thunderbird here to help us and guide you on your journey as you go forward. Thank so you. thank you for coming to our assembly so dancing. much. Thank you very and dancing shoes. there's not dancing shoes, <laughs> but as well this summer, because sports is part of your file, it's July 7, 8, and 9 is our next assembly in Halifax. That weekend as well, is the North American Indigenous Games. So Chief uh, from Eskasoni, he's the uh, interim acting regional chief, uh, Leroy Dini, has also said, don't forget to invite him over there for the NAG. <laughs> so <laughs> you're officially invited from the, the tribes from that territory. So chiefs, uh, join me in thanking him for his words and being here at our assembly. While the minister is uh, shaking hands, chiefs, we have the next minister that's uh, going to be with us this morning, the Honourable uh, David Lemetti. He's been a member of Parliament since 2015, and he represents the riding of La Salle, Imard Verdun. He is a former professor of law at McGill University, and we wanted him here for a number of reasons, of course, restorative justice and all those things we've talked about last number of days, MMIW, CHRT. He is currently the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada. We've met with him a number of times. His heart's in a good place. We also need to work with him to bring restorative justice in Canada. And so please join me in welcoming to the stage Minister David Lametti. <laughs>
with you and shake hands with you. Yeah, I will. You don't. Thank you, National Chief Belgard, for that kind introduction. To the elders here today, to National Chief Belgard and all the members of the Assembly of First Nations Executive and Chiefs in Assembly, thank you for welcoming me to the Special Chiefs Assembly being held here on traditional Algonquin territory. I'm honoured today to be speaking at today's forum for the first time. I'm here today for many reasons. First among them, to meet and to learn from the leaders in this room. I'm not my predecessor. My life experience is different. I will not claim to understand the colonial experience from the vantage point of an Indigenous person. I can't. What I can do is commit to listen to you and to your narratives, to your stories. What I can do is to work to ensure that First Nations voices and perspectives are lifted and meaningfully reflected in our approaches and institutions here in Canada. This means working in full partnership to affirm the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples. You in this room all know that reconciliation is not a single moment in time. It's a process. It's a cultural shift. It's a change in the way in which we think about Canada, Canada's institutions, and who we want to be. So what do I mean when I say that? As National Chief Belgard has already mentioned, I was a law professor at McGill uh, for 20 years before I jumped into political life. One course I taught at that institution was Quebec civil law property. First year course, starting right at the beginning, first year. New students would come through the door with a civil code in one hand and a notebook in the other, later a laptop, ready to learn about Quebec's unique private law legal system. But that wasn't where we started the course. Instead of looking at Quebec civil law, our first day and indeed our first week was spent exploring the traditional property system of the Watswetan people a system that predated Quebec civil law and grew completely outside of the uh, Western legal tradition and abides today. We would spend the rest of the week using the materials that we had to learn and discuss the legal traditions of the Watswetan, the social traditions of the Watswetan, and trying to learn about some of the traditions, we couldn't do it all, of the many legal communities, Indigenous legal communities across Canada, legal traditions across Canada. When we did finally arrive, months later in that course, at landmark Supreme Court decisions that tried to define Indigenous rights, including a famous one that dealt with the Wet'suwet'en people, it was already clear to my students that the system was flawed one legal system had completely engulfed the other one, allowing the majority to impose its laws on the minority, the essence of colonialism. But the point I made to them, to my students, and the one I'd like to repeat now, is that it does not need to be this way. In our pluralistic country, with its deep, dark history of colonialism, we have a responsibility, I have a responsibility, as a Minister of the Crown, to rethink this approach. For meaningful reconciliation to happen, Indigenous legal traditions must be recognized in their own right and applied alongside Western legal traditions. Not everyone is going to be comfortable with this approach. But the alternative is simply unacceptable from overrepresentation in the criminal justice system to ongoing conflicts over inherent rights, 
It's clear that the status quo has certainly not served the best interests of Indigenous peoples. This is what the TRC identified, as did the report of the Commission into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. It goes to the heart of a shift in culture that people in my position have a responsibility to listen, to foster, including elevating the voices of Indigenous peoples who are at the forefront of this work. We are a long way from our destination in this journey, but I believe what we have accomplished in partnership over the last four years is important. My colleagues, Ministers Miller and Bennett and Gilbo, have talked to you about some of those accomplishments in their remarks to you. But I believe we need to move forward. One last thing I'll say about my time at McGill is that legal pluralism is part of my DNA. The idea that in the same space you can have multiple legal systems that interoperate and that cooperate and coexist and that the same people can, can move between and among those various legal systems is part of my DNA. And I think that represents the only possible future uh, for the legal systems in this country. Before I turn to some issues specific to, to my department, I want to acknowledge the elephant in the room. Specifically, the recent ruling of the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal on compensation for First Nations children and families. Many of you believe that our government's response to that decision is a sign that we are not, in fact, moving down a new path. And that question weighs heavily on my mind and weighed heavily on my mind as I was preparing to speak to you this morning. I want to be crystal clear. First Nations children and their families have suffered and have been hurt. Canada has caused that pain and it is our responsibility to help them heal, which includes fair and equitable compensation. Our issue with the tribunal's decision is about how it interpreted the law and the limited exclusionary path it has set out for a remedy. But make no mistake, these children and their families have suffered and it is Canada's responsibility to help repair the damage. This is what partners and advocates have been fighting for for years and we are committed to working with partners like the AFN to achieve fair, equitable and inclusive healing for victims which includes compensation. We must do it once and we must do it right. The recently filed class action litigation is an opportunity for victims and their families to have their stories heard to have their stories acknowledged and to begin their unique path to healing. This is the same approach that resulted in comprehensive settlements for residential school survivors and the 60s scoop. And it is my hope that this approach will result in a comprehensive settlement for these children and their families. As Attorney General of Canada, it will always be my approach to resolve issues through discussions and collaboration with partners whenever possible. Thanks to the vision and leadership of my predecessor, my officials and I will continue to be guided by the Directive on Civil Litigation Involving Indigenous Peoples. But I am also cognizant that real partnership does not always mean agreement and smooth sailing. We have a larger goal to reach together. A better future for all of our children and grandchildren is one where we are actively decolonizing our institutions, where Indigenous voices are elevated and where Indigenous peoples are in control of their own destinies. At the heart of this work is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Our government has committed to co-develop legislation to implement the declaration by the end of 2020. 
I know that Minister Bennett spoke about this ongoing work earlier this morning. I want you to know that I stand by that commitment and I am ready to do the hard work with you and with my colleagues that this entails, but can only, it can only be achieved through your collaboration and through your partnership. J'ai parlé plus tôt de l'importance des lois et des perspectives autochtones dans le cadre de mon travail en tant que professeur. I spoke I earlier about the importance of Indigenous laws and perspectives to my work as a professor. As Minister of Justice and Attorney General, I am fully committed to working with you to advance those same laws and traditions in our justice system. Your systems will reflect your Indigenous cultures, your traditions and your values while they operate in harmony with justice regimes and processes across Canada. The work to make that happen is going on as we speak. Budget 2019 provided $10 million over five years starting in this year, 2019-20, in support of Indigenous law initiatives across Canada. This funding will help make a real difference for Indigenous peoples doing the challenging and exciting work of revitalizing their legal systems. This is one important part of what decolonizing Canadian law looks like. In the same vein, Justice Canada is exploring how we can support Indigenous communities that have shown a desire to take control of justice responsibilities. The goal of these projects is to support Indigenous communities in assuming control over this core function of self-determination. In turn, communities can address crime and violence in a way that better reflects their legal traditions and is more relevant to community members. Since November 25th, Canada has been marking the 16 days of, ad, uh, of activism to end gender-based violence. No discussion of gender-based violence can ignore the fact that Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited people are impacted by violence more than any other group in Canada. The National Enquiry's final report brought these facts into stark focus. We recognize that these are your sisters, your mothers, your aunties, your daughters, and your cousins. And the inquiry's calls for justice raise key issues facing Canada's criminal justice system. My department will continue to work within government and with you to identify ways to strengthen existing policies and programs. We want to increase the safety of Indigenous women, girls and two-spirited people in Canada. One successful example is the Family Information Liaison Units, also known as FILUs. The FILUs were established in every province and territory to increase family members' access to information that they are seeking from government agencies about their missing and murdered loved ones. FILUs, by all accounts, help families on their healing journey. They have organized the return of loved ones' remains to the community, sometimes from across the country, and have helped to organize releasing ceremonies with the family. They have also helped family members to access ceremonies and other services they are seeking. As part of our response to the National Enquiry's interim report in 2018, family information liaison unit operations were renewed for an additional year. We have listened and we have heard from you that FILUs have been an extremely important resource to ensure families and loved ones have somewhere to turn for help in finding answers. We know the need for support and for answers hasn't ended. We want to make sure that these important services continue to be available moving forward. Which is why I'm happy to confirm this morning that our government is committed to extending FILU funding for another three years. Change is happening. The government is evolving 
and learning to do things differently. The most fundamental element of our efforts is strengthening our relationship with First Nations, to hear your opinions, to learn from your expertise, your knowledge and your experiences, as well as work together to achieve your priorities. To truly recognize the importance of these legal traditions, our Indigenous partners, uh, uh, the legal traditions of you, our Indigenous partners, we must actually build them into our justice system. I believe this can be accomplished by continuing to work together. As International Human Rights Day reminds us each year on December 10th, this is part of the broader human rights project. As Senator Murray Sinclair has said, we must proceed one step at a time. It will not always be easy. There will be storms, there will be obstacles, but we cannot allow ourselves to be daunted by the task because it is our goal, because our goal is just and it is also necessary. I believe we can advance our shared goal of walking the road of reconciliation together. My father was a builder. He built houses. And while he died young, I did spend the first 13 years of my life on construction sites, learning how to use tools to build. So building as well is in my DNA, and I hope to build with you. I would like to once again thank the elders, AFN National Chief Belgard, for his leadership and for all the leadership that all of you have brought to this room today. I'm humbled by your partnership and appreciate the many opportunities that we will have to work together. Thank you, Megwitch. Thank you very much, Minister Lametti. We will, um, with the permission of the Chiefs, we'll take these eight speakers and then we will um, um, turn to the Minister for closing uh, remarks and then we'll move on with our program. I'll begin with microphone two. Fancy. Can I ask a bit? I don't step in my act. I don't. David Bonias, the sneer, son. The bits of Kabago, see? Kabago, eh? Just wanted to uh, greet you and say hello. My name is David Monias. I'm the chief of the nation for from the uh, My question relates to uh, Bill C-92, as it reflects your uh, uh, your judges and your lawyers and your crown attorneys and all so forth. You know how are you going to implement uh, Bill C-92, and how are you going to get uh, instruct your uh, judges and your lawyers to kind of back off and honestly have the First Nations take control over this system. Because we, everything we want under Bill C-9 for child welfare must be community controlled, must be community based, must be community determined, and must be, must be community specific to our traditions and our customs. That's what it says. And that includes justice. That includes the lawyers and the, the courts. They have to back off because a lot of our children are being uh, best interests are being determined by one person, usually the judge, based on their values and their beliefs. It's time for our beliefs and our customs to, to take, uh, and our practices to take precedence over, over those decision making processes. That's what I want to ask you how, how are you going to implement that? But I also want to recognize my counselor, he has a justice question with respect to policing and uh, justice, uh, Councillor Lee Thomas. Minister Lametti, National Chief Belgard. Uh, uh, I have a bunch of questions actually um, in relation to uh, justice. Uh, first and foremost is the restorative uh, justice uh, as uh, Perry uh, alluded to and uh, we need to uh, implement uh, restorative justice because the, the old way of uh, rehabilitating uh, our people is not working. Uh, there's more disconnect with our uh, with with their culture, with our culture, and uh, they, they become lost, and the frustration builds and builds. Um, 
I have a friend that uh, has been in and out of prison that uh, that spoke to that. He was just one and broke the law. Uh, broke the law once and broke the law all oh, time and time again. And it was just a frustration that uh, the lack of support that he had from uh, anyone. That that that's where his frustration lied. So with that. Uh, I believe that uh, we need to move forward on the restorative, uh, restorative justice uh, in a, uh, a very positive manner. I think it's uh, very important for our people to uh, come back to our culture, to to maintain our, our language, our traditions, so on and so forth. Uh, the next thing that uh, is, uh, is the, uh, the next question I want to ask you is that, uh, is it uh, why are people incarcerated for less serious offenses as opposed to people that are seriously with serious offenses, namely murder, uh, violent assaults. So you got people that are in jail for, for uh, impaired driving. In some instances that uh, a person that has taken a life only went to jail for three years. Now, when a person has caught for impaired two times, he goes to jail for six years. So it's a serious question that needs to be answered, that needs to be addressed. It has to be fixed somewhere. And uh, the, set, the last one is that the, uh, the RCMP. We have serious problems with the RCMP all across the nation with, with Aboriginals. There's some uh, serious disconnect there as well. Uh, when we call for, you know, to, for them to come down, we have to an we have to an answer 20 questions before they send an, send an RCMP to this place. By the time they get there, the perpetrators are gone, and you know, like the the people that are that are uh, that are the victims are treated as criminals. So those questions have to be and need to be answered on a national level, not not just locally. Thank you, Councillor. Thank, Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, I do want to note that the rule is you surrender your time when you're asking or giving the permission. At best, we try to split the time. It is not adding time. Microphone two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd swallow ten a while. Uh, I'd like to thank the people of this land for um, allowing us to be here today. Um, my name is Chief Leah George. Wilson I'm from the Slavitic Nation in British Columbia, and my co-chair from the First Nation Summit is Ray Harris. I'd like to say um, thank you to the Mr. Minister for your words today. I'm really happy to hear that in your discussions you talked about building with us and you mentioned our Indigenous legal orders. Those are important, important things to mention in your talk. You also mentioned Minister, uh, sorry, Senator Murray Sinclair, we're happy to hear anybody that's going to quote Senator Sinclair. He's our friend and he's our colleague. I want you also to know, don't be shy about saying the name of your predecessor. The Honorable Jody Wilson-Raybould is our friend and our colleague who came from these floors here at the AFM. OCM, OCM. So don't be shy about saying who she is. What I'd like to know is around the Attorney General's directive on civil litigation involving Indigenous people. That is the 10 directives that were brought in by the Honorable Jody Wilson-Raybould when she was in your position as Minister of Justice and Attorney General. I'd like to know what is the status? Are they being implemented? And is there any plan to repeal? Thank you. Haitsepka. Thank you very much. Microphone two, Chief Sayers, just as a matter of procedure. I see you don't have a red lanyard, but I oh, presume sorry. we... It's <laughs> on my table. Yeah. Good morning. Aklama Kakanasak, Supachasak, Sup, Nuchanathat. I am here as a proxy for Toquat Nation. Mr. Minister, I appreciate the tone of your presentation, but we have a case comes out of Nuchanath um, called the Ahausa Taital versus Canada. Ten years ago, Ten long years ago, five Nutanov nations won a court case that granted them a commercial right to the fishery. We're still waiting for 
the implementation of a case that actually went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. They didn't want to hear it, so all these years later, we still haven't got anything. We are forced to go back to court, and we have been waiting 10 months for the Court of Appeal to give us a decision. So my question to you as Attorney General, is that not your role to ensure that cases that were won should be implemented? And, you know, this is the highest court of the land that has said that. And I think there's much frustration. You talk about reconciliation and walking together, but if you can't see a way to ensure that cases that were won in your courts are implemented, can we actually walk together, can, mm -hmm. that we can actually reconcile together? And I really look forward to the day when we can celebrate that. 10 anniversaries, that's not an anniversary to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate it if you could do something about this because our fishermen have been sitting on the banks for too long and their right to a livelihood is being put on hold because of your government's reluctance to work with us. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Judy. Two chairs. Microphone one, Makinawa. Hoki Ninaukakchima, Nistoakok Makinima, Nitsikane. The name that I used for you in our language is uh, uh, Justice Leader. That's what I've called you. Uh, my traditional name is Makinima. I'm also known as Chief Roy Fox and the Ghana Blood Tribe. You'll forgive me if I don't wear this because when I went to boarding school, I had to wear a similar number. And so I, I, I'd rather not do the same thing at these kind of gatherings. Couple of questions, very quick question. Um, and I think one of them uh, has already been brought out by the, one of the previous speakers. And that is many of our indigenous treaty people, unfortunately, are incarcerated. They are incarcerated within uh, the legal systems of Canada. However, when it comes to uh, employing more of our experts within the Attorney General, within the Solicitor General's departments of Canada, I think more work has to be done in that regard. I think we, we have proven that we can uh, uh, help ourselves. And I think we've proven that there are many experts, treaty indigenous experts in this field that can help. However, they're not being utilized, they're not being employed. Uh, second one is I, I asked a question of my good friend, um, uh, Minister Bennett, but unfortunately she didn't really answer it. And that was uh, with regard to an important legal case that we launched 40 years ago. Okay? And during that period of time, uh, Canada suggested that we ought to negotiate. We listened to them. After, thir after 36 years, nothing worked out. So we went back to court and we won our case. The Federal Court of Canada deemed that the Ghana Blood Tribe were shortchanged. 162.5 sections of land, according to the treaty formula. So we won the case. Yeah, we kind of expected more, but we said, okay, we'll accept that decision of the Federal Court of Canada. However, Canada did not accept it. Instead, they appealed. So I'm just, again, questioning, in the spirit of reconciliation, that this would have been a great example of how the federal government is uh, embarked on a new paradigm to settle with First Nations peoples, people in an honest way. I'm just wondering again, who made that decision? Is it you, our political leaders of Canada, or is it the justice lawyers? Because I have a great fear and disdain for justice lawyers, as with most other 
leaders in uh, uh, indigenous leaders in Canada. So, again, a very simple question. If not, I'd like to suggest how we may, again, try and, and, and get together and for the federal government of Canada to accept the decision of its own court in regards to this case. Been going on for 40 years. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Microphone two. Check. Short and sweet, my friend. Mr. Awesome. Lametti, welcome. I got two questions. First question is, uh, do your comments with regard to the Canadian Human, Human Rights Tribunal ruling on child welfare mean that Canada is no longer seeking to quash the order on financial compensation for the children? No. That's one question. <laughs> Second question I have is, uh, is the, the, we had a very positive discussion this morning on UNDRIP. Uh, a lot of work has been put into it and I'm very proud of the Premier of BC and hopefully all other Premiers follow suit. But my question in regards to, uh, one question to you is, what is your view on the meaning of Article 46 of UNDRIP? For instance, does it mean the sovereignty of Canada supersedes that the First Nations, does it mean that under must be implemented within the constitutional framework of Canada? And uh, I'm really glad uh, uh, Wilson Rabel's issue was, was brought up here today in regards to your former colleague. And uh, us as First Nations people were very proud people of. She was our, one of the first Indian people that was a justice minister, and we carried that. Another important uh, person I want to mention, a colleague, a friend of mine, an individual that put a lot of work into UNDRIP. The ears, the hours in his life that he left his family at home. And that's my good friend, Ed Johns. Mm. There's a man that has to be complimented for where UNDRIP is today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Microphone one. Microphone one. Sir Simon. Oh. <laughs> no, go. Oh, uh, National Chief, uh, Executive Committee, uh, Elders, Youth, uh, Fellow Chiefs, um, Minister Lametti. I appreciate you uh, all being here today. I appreciate speaking to you. Uh, I wanted to just make a quick comment about uh, justice. And um, justice, uh, I think, is as complex as every First Nation that we have here in this country. And uh, the view of justice is the same way, is the same principle as our worldview. Each, uh, each nation has a way of looking at things, whether it's hunting or fishing, education, everyone has a certain way of doing things. Now. When you look at the international commitments that Canada has made, um, the UNDRIP and we discussed the American, uh, our worldviews uh, are to be recognized on how we also interpret our treaties. So how we interpret justice and how that justice is implemented and served uh, is, I think, has to be considered in, in many ways with uh, First Nation people across the country. Under international commitments, uh, you all, it also says that other means other than incarceration shall be considered uh, in view of First Nation people. Now, we also have, I'll quote Ovid Merkezi from the past, one nation does not tax another. Neither does one, ta one nation take a member of another nation and extradite them without our participation. This is something within your, uh, your, um, your ministry where I think extradition also, because we have many bands living across uh, this, uh, this artificially made border, and members are being taken from here and brought to the U.S., and uh, anyway, they serve their times there. Uh, when other means here in Canada, our ways are being ignored, that we can serve the purpose of rehabilitation, but it must be taken into consideration, Mr. Minister, like I said, Justice and the perception of justice, the serving of it, is as complex as the country itself. So something of that nature, I think, involving First Nation leadership, especially when you're taking our members and extraditing them, 
uh, over the protests of, uh, of the uh, local governments. So um, I could go on with justice with policing and um, uh, other things that were done in the past, uh, you know, the injustices that we're trying to correct today. And it's going to be as complex and ever evolving, just like all the issues that we face. And it's going to take a lot of cooperation and understanding from both sides. So this is something I think you and your government, it's not only your department, but also that of Indigenous Affairs, Indigenous Affairs and Indigenous Services and all. Everything has to come together. They can't work in silos. So there's a reason why we have such high rates of, uh, of, of criminality sometimes and suicides. and It's all related to all those past injustices. I think we can make those links. But by making those steps and recognizing that First Nations do have a unique perspective, especially at the justice level. This is something that I think uh, you could advance reconciliation and make it, I think, a little bit, uh, a little bit more permanent in the way we do business together. So I appreciate your time, and I hope to hear from you soon uh, about other issues. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> no, no. Mm. Microphone to you. Minister, I, um, I acknowledge you. Thank you. The national chief, I, um, I acknowledge the national chief. Also, our regional chief, I, um, I, uh, Bobby Cameron, and all the executive members. I acknowledge the elders that are sitting here. A um, very important minister, I'd like to remind you. And this is uh, respecting a, um, our region in Saskatchewan, particular part of the region, Battleford. And I just want to remind you, Minister, of the Colton Boucher case, the injustice that was done in that case, how the jury selection was done in that case. I encourage you, if you haven't already, watch a documentary on that case. I had the opportunity to watch it flying, flying to Ottawa here from Saskatchewan in Air Canada. But I, um, I sat in the table with, a, uh, with the chief, regional chief, asking Don Morgan, our Attorney General, Justice Minister of the province, to do something to help us out of what happened in that case. So we, we can't forget that the, uh, I say that to all the nations, the people of the, uh, the justice system that we're in, the colonial justice system that we're, that we're faced. So I just want to remind you of that, uh, Minister. Let's not forget about that. Also AFN. Mm. The, uh, the other thing, a, um, Prince Albert Grand Council, and that's where I'm Grand Chief from, We've just completed, hosted a, a national uh, policing and justice symposium. Minister, I thank uh, your department for, uh, for the funding. We're able to host a, a successful a, um, a symposium. But I ha we have recommendations from that symposium in policing and also the justice. We had many, many lawyers from across Canada that came and they uh, were the part of the panel and the presentation. I'll leave with this. If you get an opportunity, and there's a lot of talk on restorative justice, in Saskatchewan we have an agreement with the province, and it's called the alternative measures. It's a court worker system. But it, instead of enhancing this program, it's, we've been losing the funding. I encourage you, and we will do the work, Bobby Cameron here, regional chief myself, and the chief of Saskatchewan to try to enhance this program. So our young people, our young people, don't go start off their life with a criminal record. So I thank you for that. Thank you for listening to me. Yeah. And that's mm. the one I have. Microphone two. Or a microphone one, my apologies. Good morning, Tony Morgan. I'm from Northwest British Columbia. I just want to thank you for your presentation, Mr. Minister. Um, it's, we're now walking along that uh, path together, and I just wanted to um, 
give you a heads up that I do have a proposal that I want to put forward. We have around eight uh, bands that are working together and we want to make sure that um, that we achieve this um, major um, um, reconciliation process together. And we see uh, the work that we're doing um, very important for our nation and our people to be able to achieve um, clearing out some of this uh, incarceration um, matters. So uh, I look forward to uh, discussing that with you and presenting my proposal to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was not lost on me that uh, our good friend and colleague, Chief Maracle, was uh, sneakily approached the microphone, and so let us turn to him as the last speaker. <laughs> microphone one, please. Uh, Minister Lametti, thank you very much for attending and for your leadership. Um, Section 35 of the Canada Constitution Act recognizes and affirms the uh, Treaty and Aboriginal Rights of Indigenous People. When we look at Aboriginal rights, our people have always held that the right to hunt and fish and gather is integral to our culture, to our identity as a First Nations people, and we have the right to exercise the right to hunt and fish and gather to help feed our families. The province of Ontario is introducing Bill 156, which would create severe fines uh, to our hunters for going on somebody's farm field to kill a deer and to feed their families. It, it, it's imposing uh, very serious heavy fines. So really you cannot have a right and not have the, the right to access uh, the land to hunt, fish and gather. And you have a responsibility to defend that right. Okay. So does Minister Carolyn Bennett, because the treaties contemplate our rights would be preserved and protected. And so does the Minister of Canadian Heritage. And so uh, you need to take uh, all three ministers, need to, and so the Minister of Indian Affairs as well, uh, Mark Miller, because there's a lot of poverty in our, in our communities and a lot of people depend on it, uh, deer to help feed their families over the winter months. And so I'd like your commitment that you would look at this legislation in the, in the eyes of the defense of the Aboriginal rights that are protected under Section 35, and that the federal government would speak out on behalf of the government of, of uh, the, uh, our governments and our people to defend that right, because right now they're never what we've never surrendered that right. We were never consulted, and we've never given our consent to have our traditional uh, practices infringed upon by the colonizing nation. So really, the issue that provincial government needs to focus their attention on is how are they going to accommodate that right instead of denying the right. And right now the legislation is about denying the right and infringing and limiting the Aboriginal rights that are supposed to be protected under Canada's constitution and your leadership is needed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I note that Proxy um, Kazimer at microphone two has indicated as an issue that has not been raised. She wishes to raise. Let's go to microphone two for the absolute final speaker in this session. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Giso Kyokyo, Cheryl Kazmer, proxy for Takla First Nation, British Columbia. And um, I appreciate your indulgence of me to raise this issue. Um, I believe it's really important to raise it, Mr. Minister. Um, you're fully aware that um, of the over-representation of children in care, Aboriginal children in care in this country, which tends to lead to the over-representation of Indigenous youth um, young adults in the justice system and being incarcerated. And uh, I just wanted to uh, raise that with you so that we can, we can garner your support when it comes time to nations assuming jurisdiction and authority through C-92, um, where there's um, opportunity for nations to develop their own justice systems and, and even to the extent of developing their own tribal courts to, to deal with um, justice concerns. And so we'll definitely be looking to you to support us in, in developing that. Um, the second thing that I want to raise is in relation to the calls to justice and the recommendations and ask for your support in terms of implementing it as soon as possible, um, particularly the, the um, national, call, uh, national action plan. We're all too familiar with the fact that um, there's too high of an acceptance and normalization of violence against Indigenous women and girls. And, for the mo and in some cases, um, 
it's perpetrate the perpetrators are the very people who are responsible for looking out for our safety and well-being and that's the RCMP and that still continues to be an outstanding issue in terms of bringing them to be accountable for what they do against women and girls in this country and so there needs to be some major reform major reform in the justice system and we um, we call on you and urge you to have that happen as soon as possible thank you thank you very much Minister Lametti. First of all, thank you uh, for all of those questions. I, I know that, that they are heartfelt. I, I understand the emotion, uh, the pain, uh, but also the, the goodwill and the commitment uh, with which uh, those questions uh, have been asked to try to, to get us all uh, together to a better place uh, to get to solutions. Um, so let me try as best as possible to address a number of the, uh, a, a number of the issues. First, let me say in an overarching way, um, there has to be a change in, in attitude throughout government, throughout the federal government, throughout policing at whatever level, throughout provincial governments, uh, municipal governments. Um, the, the litigation directive, government lawyers, the litigation directive that, uh, that my predecessor, the Honourable Jody Wilson-Raybould, uh, brought in will be implemented. It's being implemented. It will not, uh, it will not be uh, um, ignored. Uh, and, and it certainly uh, will not be overridden, so you, you need not worry about that. But what it represents is an attitudinal change, and we're going to keep pushing to change attitudes, uh, both within the Justice Department, with, with lawyers. And that kind of change has to happen with the RCMP, it has to happen with, with uh, provincial police uh, services where they exist, uh, and, and local police services. So a lot of the dialogue, a lot of the listening that we have to do to listen to you has to, has to help us in government, in all of these areas of government, uh, to, to change those, those attitudes. So that, I want to say that in an overarching way, that I'm committed to helping to be a positive agent for that change. I'm committing committing to listening to your specific suggestions in terms of how to make that happen and to build upon, uh, upon some of the good things uh, that have been done uh, already. So for example, uh, on uh, Bill C-92, uh, Child Welfare, uh, Chief Monias, you brought that up uh, at, at the outset and a number, a number of, of chiefs and proxies uh, raised that point. How do you implement it? Well, piece by piece, uh, we have to um, we have to move from apprehension to prevention. We have to work on the social factors that um, lead to kids uh, being uh, in in vulnerable positions, um, and we got to reduce the number of times that that uh, kids are taken into care. Um, that can only be done, and, and, and Chief, you, you referred to this uh, through a community-based, uh, community-sensitive, community-driven uh, process, and we're open to that. Uh, that's how we have to make that work uh, in, terms of, in terms of implementing that. Um, Chief Casimir, you, you, raised, you raised this at the end as well. Uh, Yes, the overrepresentation of children uh, in the, the care system, uh, and then later the overrepresentation of, 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 of uh, First Nations, uh, Métis, and, and Inuit in the criminal justice system are all things that we, we have to continue to address and we have to fix. Uh, C92 hopefully is one of the places uh, where, uh, where we can do that. Um, with respect to the criminal justice system, a number of people have raised uh, have raised um, uh, juries. Um, sorry, Chief uh, Chief uh, Brian 
Hardlock from Saskatchewan, you, you raised that in, in context of, of jury selection in the Colton Bushi case. Um, first of all, with respect to Colton Bushi, I'm a parent. I, I, I can't even imagine the pain uh, in that kind of situation. Um, and we need to do everything we can to make sure that that kind of situation never happens again. Uh, I will, I haven't yet seen the film, uh, uh, Brian, if I may uh, call you that, uh, but I will, uh, I will commit uh, to watching that. Um, I'm open to any kinds of alternative measures uh, that, that we can come up with, uh, whether they be for the, for the justice system or whether I can, I can bring those suggestions to the table for the policing syst uh, system for my colleague Bill Blair and other people around the table. But what I can say is that jury selection, uh, we have made changes, so hopefully that kind of jury selection will never happen again uh, through uh, Bill C-75. Please continue to watch how that works on the ground. Um, this also, uh, there, there was, um, it was uh, Chief Lee Thomas who, who brought up uh, incarceration for less serious offences. I hope that C-75 helps to reduce the number of people incarcerated for less serious offences. One of the goals of C-75 was to try to address the over-representation of, of First Nations people, of Inuit, of Métis in the criminal justice system. And so your reflections of how that is working on the ground will be helpful in terms of seeing whether it actually is working or not and whether we have to, we have to tweak that. Uh, and in all cases, moving forward and trying to make uh, changes uh, for the better. Um, Chief Lee Thomas, you also brought up, uh, or Councillor Lee Thomas, you also brought up restorative justice um, and the need to implement that. I fully agree with that. Uh, one of my tasks as Minister of Justice will be to try to get more resources for those kinds of programs. We've already started with some through um, through the JPIP program, which, with which some of you are familiar, uh, but we need to do more. And anybody that we can, uh, restorative justice systems work, period. Um, and, and the more we can do to use restorative justice in context, and all of your contexts are different, and it's critical that, that the restorative justice systems be tailored to your traditions and your communities. Um, the more we can do that, the better it will be for everybody. And the more people we can uh, keep out of the formal incar incarceration system, the better it will be for everybody. Um, and so I I'm committed to doing my best to make that, uh, to make that a, a reality. Um, Chief Leah George Wilson uh, from Tsleil-Waututh, I, I, I have, uh, answered the question uh, on directives, they will be implemented. Um, and uh, as, as for uh, particular cases, I, will, um, I am happy uh, to hear more, go back and see what, uh, and see what happened, uh, and, uh, and commit to good faith uh, in, in dealing with you and with negotiations uh, as we move forward. Um, Chief McEnema, Chief Roy Fox uh, of the Blood Tribe, uh, I think I've discussed your point on, in, on the incarceration uh, numbers and, and needing to do more. Hiring more people in the Justice Department, yes, uh, we agree. Suggest people, push people, get young people, middle-aged people, older people to apply. Sometimes uh, it doesn't happen, um, and then from our end, I, you have a commitment to read uh, to read those uh, applications and to and to with an open mind, and to try to see the experience and the and the the qualifications uh, that are being put forth. Um, on the specific land claim, I, I commit to to getting more information uh, and working with my colleagues uh, to see where it, where it sits and where it stands. I, I unfortunately. Uh, don't know the details uh, and so can't go into, can't go into more there. Um, Chief Ted Kuisatz, is that correct? Did I get that? Kuisatz. Apologies for, for, for mispronouncing uh, your name. Um, 
we will negotiate. Uh, my, my colleague Mark Miller has made it clear. Uh, I have made it clear that we will uh, negotiate to get to a fair and comprehensive settlement for uh, the whole swath of, of kids and families uh, who were hurt. Uh, we think it has to go wider than, than, what, uh, than what was envisioned uh, in the CRHT uh, decision, CHRT decision. And, and you have, our, you have our, our commitment. I know that Minister Miller said uh, yesterday how he was planning uh, to begin to move forward, and, and I'm going to support you, and I'm going to support him uh, in, in getting to that result. Uh, as for UNDRIP and Section 46, again, uh, we're, we're, we're pleased with what British Columbia has done. We had committed uh, at the, end of the, at the end of the last government to support the private member's bill brought forward by, by a great colleague, Romeo Saganash. Um, sadly, it didn't, it didn't uh, quite make it past the finish line, uh, but we will, um, we will, we've committed to implementing uh, UNDRIP. I don't know exactly what form that takes, but we're going to watch uh, very carefully what happens in British Columbia and work with our colleagues uh, in BC and work with you uh, to make sure that that happens. And I uh, forgive my ignorance, but I pledge to learn more about Ed Johns. Thank you. Um, Chief Simon, uh, good to talk to you uh, face to face this time as opposed to over the telephone. Um, you're, you're, the point that you raise is very interesting, and I'm going to get more information and take more information from that. Um, in another, in another forum, extradition can give me headaches for other reasons, as, you, as some of you know. I say that with a smile. But uh, with respect to First Nations people, and with respect uh, to your nation in particular, I, I pledge to uh, look at the impact uh, of extradition and how it might have a, a particular impact on, on, First, Nations, uh, on First Nations people. Um, Jumping down to Chief, uh, Chief Tony Morgan uh, from Northwestern BC, thank you uh, for those comments uh, and, and uh, that your eight bands, I look forward to the proposal that you will bring uh, and, and the particular suggestions uh, on incarceration. Um, Chief Don Maracle on Section 35 of the Constitution Act. Again, I was unaware of that, uh, that Ontario bill, so I pledge to look more into that. Um, you're absolutely right about what section, I'm not sure where you're sitting, you're absolutely, there, you're, you're absolutely right about what section 35 of, of the Constitution Act says uh, about recognizing and affirming uh, rights. The Supreme Court has held on a number of occasions that uh, Indigenous rights to hunt and fish uh, for sustenance are, are protected, and so I will, I will uh, take a look uh, at what is happening in Ontario um, through that lens and, and pledge to, to speak to you about it. And, and certainly at a basic level, as Attorney General, uh, we will always defend uh, rights that are legitimate in that regard. Uh, so let me let me uh, come back to you on that once I've seen the actual parameters of the case. Okay. okay. And the last, so the last uh, point that I didn't raise from Chief Cheryl Casimir, uh, I, I, I addressed one of the things that she had said on C92. Um, the 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 plan for uh, implementing the report on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls um, is moving forward. It is to be co-developed with you. Uh, that's a critical part uh, of the engagement that we made and that the report uh, suggested. So my understanding is that is moving forward and we should, we should see things uh, begin to happen. And again, the, the critical point is that we, we simply have to develop this uh, in partnership uh, as we move forward, and uh, the RCMP part will be will be uh, one of the things that we look at. Uh, I, I I I hear from a number of voices here the 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 pain uh, when 
referring to the police services and the RCMP in particular. There were a number of, of people who have spoken to that this morning. I hear that. I will bring that back uh, to my colleagues around the table uh, and to the appropriate officials. Okay. Chief, Chief, can it be dealt with in a sidebar? Okay, yeah, so we'll do that on a sidebar. I only noted just because we're well into the lunch hour. Uh, as a result, we will make some adjustments. Uh, there was an honoring on your program. We will move that to mid-afternoon. Uh, following uh, the National Chief's uh, thank yous and remarks, uh, we will be in recess until 1.15. So please be back here at 1.15, but here's the National Chief. Thanks, Harold. Just very quickly, Chiefs, I know it's going into the lunch hour, but again, uh, Minister Ramedi, for your words, take, taking the time to take questions, um, dealing with everything from the jails being full of our people, the need for restorative justice, the need to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, National Action Plan for MMIW to be implemented fully, basically the litigative directive from uh, former AG Jody Wilson-Raybould to be followed and respected. It's like... The judicial branch of government is saying one thing, and we're winning all these Supreme Court of Canada decisions. We need the executive and the legislative branch to keep up to those directives. That's right. And we also need the right to self-determination recognized, because in 1867, when the feds are saying what their responsibility are, and the provincial governments were outlaying who's responsible for what, they forgot First Nations government jurisdiction. And we have a lot of work to do together. And so with that, Let's keep our minds and hearts and op open together. And we have a presentation on behalf of our Assembly of First Nations to present to you. Winter time is coming, it's gonna get cold. So keep your hands warm and let's keep our path going in a good way together. Thank you so much for being in our assembly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We are in recess to 1.15. We will pick up the order of the work by addressing Bill C-92, the uh, Child and Family Services Bill. Uh, we do have a number of things on the program, plus we will do some protocol things around the honorings and the MOU. And then, of course, we also pick up the business on our resolutions. And we do have uh, two resolutions from Housing, Infrastructure, and Emergency Services remaining. And then we will move to the UN Declaration uh, resolution that we also have uh, prepared and then move through as many as we can this afternoon. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy your lunch. Back here at 1.15. David, we'll see you at the top. I'm sure you're...
want to thank those of you who are already back in the assembly hall for that. I just wanted to note that we are reconvening in eight minutes. It's now 107, so at 115, we are reconvening the session and we are beginning with Bill C-92 and our speaker, Mary Ellen Turpel, is already with us. So if we could have words sent to the regional caucuses to ask them to begin making their way uh, back to the room as promptly as possible. And we will look to get started at 115 and restructure our order of the day. Thank you.
Oh, merci. Thank you very much. Sorry? Okay. Yeah. I don't need you to start. <laughs> I can do that. I can do that when you're doing that. National Tuesday, do one. All right, ladies. Hey, you. <laughs> Eric, a little bit later, we'll bring the kids up. We'll take a picture as if they're sharing. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, we are at 114, and we are scheduled to reconvene in a minute. I'll ask the delegations to begin making their way uh, into the assembly hall. We do want to get started. We do have a busy agenda. As noted, we will be turning to Bill C-92, and uh, I'll reconfirm this with the delegation, but... We're going to look to that presentation, then we're going to table Resolution 9, which is, deals with uh, Bill C-92, and then we'll use that as a frame for the discussions. Following that, we will then pick up with our program. We have a brief presentation on students on ice. I'll ask our, our, our speaker, Jeff Green, if he could be uh, brief uh, for us. Um, my plan will not be to open the floor on the students on ice presentation. We then also have an update from the veterans, and so we'll do that one. Again, it's a bit of an information update, and uh, as we have often done that in our openings, uh, at the present, my plan is not to open the floor at that point. Uh, we will then turn to the honorings, and so we have an honoring from this morning. We have an MOU signing that's going to involve some ceremonial protocol, and then there has been a request for a blanket dance, so we'll do all of that uh, sort of as a bit of a bundle. Then we will turn to the Day Scholars, and at the Day Scholars piece, that's when we'll open the floor for more dialogue. And uh, following that, we will then turn to the, the resolutions, and we will pick up the resolutions from where we left off, finishing the housing, infrastructure, and emergency services resolutions, and then moving through uh, to the UN Declaration uh, resolution, which is number 12, and then proceed accordingly. We'll get as far as we can. Uh, it's a busy afternoon. Um, We'll probably, we might push it a little bit to about 5.30, but not much more beyond that. Um, we do have uh, most of tomorrow dedicated to deal with, with the resolutions, and so we'll uh, see where we can get uh, this evening. We do tomorrow have a hard cutoff in this room. We have to be out of this room by 2, 2.15ish, and so we want to be very conscientious uh, about that. And once again, I'll ask that the uh, caucuses be informed that they are two minutes uh, behind where we designated and where I assumed we agreed we would re re meet at 1.15. And so that we will look to get started uh, shortly. You will note to my far right that the stage for the signing has been set up. So when we get to that part, we will turn our attention there. The National Chief will join Tom Denomi, who spoke on the floor last night around occupational uh, health and safety. Uh, over there, they'll provide some context, do the signing, and we will have an honor song uh, for that, and then proceed uh, fairly immediately when the drum's ready after that to the uh, blanket dance. And uh, we'll provide context to the request that's been made there to help a family uh, in need uh, in relation to a, uh, uh, a pretty serious uh, car accident or vehicle uh, pedestrian accident.
Okay, I see our delegations making their way back in, so we'll just give it a few more minutes and allow people to get uh, seated. As noted, uh, we do have a, a busy afternoon, and so uh, we will start as soon as we can. We are coming up on 1.30, so we'll adjust our schedule as, uh, as much as we can. We'll look to go till 5.30, uh, just to give us some time. In terms of our order of business, we will begin with C-92, the Act Respecting First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Children, Youth, and Families. Uh, with your permission, what we'll do is have the presentation from Mary Ellen Terpel. We'll then put Resolution 9 on that uh, Act, the uh, Resolution for Reaffirming First Nations Regional Implementation Priorities for that Act on the floor uh, to um, make sure we process that one and uh, use that as the uh, frame for our conversation. Following that, we will have two information items, brief information items from Students on Ice program, and then the update from the veterans, which we I've often done as our, part of our opening protocol, but we've moved it to here. Um, at this point, I'm not anticipating opening the floor on the Students for Ice or uh, Students on Ice or the veterans update, um, and then we will then uh, continue to move on. As you may recall, we did move some items from this morning, particularly an honoring that we're going to do. And we have a couple of ceremonial pieces. So we will do an honoring uh, for one of our uh, senior officials. We will then turn to the MOU uh, signing um, on the side stage on the AFN and Indigenous Center for Occupational Health and Public Safety. There's a bit of protocol involved with that as well and some uh, smudging and uh, honor song. Uh, we've also received a quest, request to do a, uh, a blanket dance, and so we, given we are in sort of a bit of a protocol point at that point, uh, we will uh, then do that uh, and then return to our agenda uh, for the day scholars and residential schools uh, discussion. Following that, we'll open up the floor uh, for conversation and then move to the remainder of our resolutions that we're able to get through until 5.30 uh, this evening, and then we will recess for the evening. Uh, just as a reminder to all of you that there is the uh, uh, video film session on Audrey's story hosted by the Ministry of the Attorney General for Ontario of their Indigenous Justice Division. So that's at 7 uh, p.m. tonight in the ballroom, it says, so I'm assuming that's here. here. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just wait a few more minutes for other, a couple other delegations to make their way back in.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, look to uh, begin our uh, conversations. I want to welcome the uh, delegations back in. And again, as a reminder of the order of the day, we are sort of moving a few things around. Uh, we do anticipate working till 5.30 tonight. Uh, so we have four hours to do many hopeful things uh, throughout our afternoon. Uh, we will start with Bill C-92, uh, the um, Ch Children, Youth, and Families Act. Uh, that process, we will do the presentation, then we hope to table Resolution 9 on that act, uh, the regional priorities on that act immediately, and use that as the frame for discussion. Following that, we'll turn to two brief information items on Students on Ice and the Veterans, Pro uh, veterans Update. Uh, I'm not anticipating opening the floor on those two topics at this point. Uh, following them, we do have some honorings to do, an honoring for one of our senior officials, an honoring for an MOU signing, and an honoring uh, in, in the nature of a, of a a blanket dance for a family who suffered a, an accident uh, this week um, and needs some support. Following that, we'll turn to the agenda item on the Day Scholars Residential Schools, at which point we will then, of course, open up the floor following a conversation on that. Then we will proceed with the remainder of our time to address the, uh, as many of the uh, on-time resolutions as possible between uh, that time and 5.30, noting we have uh, tomorrow morning to finish up that work and those late resolutions as well. Yes, that's in the list of resolutions that we will then pick up as we go this afternoon, and we'll pick that back up in the order that we had them. And we did have two housing infrastructure and uh, emergency services resolutions. Then we would be prepared, I think, for resolution 12, which would be the United Nations Declaration resolution. So that's on our program, and we'll proceed through those in the order uh, that they are there. Ideally, we had hoped to do that this morning, but as you could see, based upon our conversations, um, it was really fruitful relative to exchanges with the ministers, and time overtook us. Uh, we are joined uh, for Bill C-92, the Act Respecting First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Children, Youth, and Families by, of course, our respected colleague, constitutional advisor, provincial court judge, uh, representative for children and youth, among a number of her accolades. Um, and, of course, she is so well known to us for her work uh, with us, um, for, really, since she was called to the bar uh, with that, let, please help me welcome our colleague and our friend, Mary Ellen Turpel Lafond. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to uh, the elders and chiefs and delegates present and staff and friends. Uh, the purpose of the presentation is to catch up on where we are with Bill C-92. I've been able to come out to a number of your delegations and we've been having quite a few meetings, but this is just to kind of catch up, give a bit of tour of where we are. Um, as the National Chief indicated in his opening comments, uh, Bill C-92 is the first legislation that has been passed to be based on affirming uh, the inherent rights of First Nations and also to affirm treaties and to be clear that there is a right of self-determination. So that's very significant to talk about why this bill is different than anything else. It affirms pre-existing rights. It doesn't create new rights, but it helps us create a national structure to address some of our child welfare issues. It does a couple of key things. And as you know from the conversations we've been having, it comes into effect on January 1. So we're some 27 days away from it coming into effect. Um, because we've had a situation where the federal government adopted something called the Caretaker Convention and they did a blackout across government, we have not had a discussion on a plan with government on implementation. That's not because on the First Nations side we were not trying to do that. There's been a blackout of sorts. So we are in a very unusual situation uh, where we're just a few weeks away from this complete reset coming into effect. And many First Nations, chiefs, families are asking, how am I going to be able to benefit? We don't have funding sorted out and other issues. I think it's important to say within AFN, the work that's been going on with the Chiefs Committee on Children, Families, and Self-Determination, 
They've been pushing very hard to address that and advocating very hard to get that resolved. So we're going to have a lot of communication possibly over that next few weeks when many of your offices are shut down. So you might want to make sure you're checking in because things are going to probably be late breaking because the government has been a bit slow on this matters. And I expect, expect it will move pretty quickly. What are some of the highlights I want to emphasize sort of today? And what are some of the strategies that might be considered? First of all, What's the most significant thing in terms of affirming those rights of self-determination is it's really important to know that if nations don't want to use the tools, you know, it's your choice. However, what are these tools? We had a chief's committee, as you know, uh, that was a legislative working group. I wouldn't say it was perfect co-development, but it was a lot of work. And some of you may have seen Bill C-92. Be very certain that you have the accurate version be sure you have the final version that was passed and proclaimed and will come into law on January 1. Because we pushed hard to make improvements to it that were necessary for it to be supported by First Nations. So that's really critical. Make sure that you have the right one. It allows and firms, sets out a process for recognition and support of First Nations jurisdiction and lawmaking. And it's very important to remember that the purpose of this bill and it can be confusing because we've had human rights tribunal discrimination case about past policies that's ongoing, it's got to be resolved. And again, as National Chief said, that's outstanding. That's in addition to this, that's not instead of this, that's also there, it's critical. You're going to hear more about that in January as well. On this is, there's three fundamental purposes of this bill. And I just want to come back to them because it's so important to remind and remind. First is to infirm the inherent right of self-government for First Nations and that it includes child and family services. The second is to set out some principles applicable on a national level for how those services are provided to First Nations children. And thirdly, and importantly, given the discussion you had this morning, to contribute to the implementation of UNDRIP. Now, in terms of what these national principles, I think it's very upsetting for First Nations when we hear our people imposing national principles on First Nations. That's not exactly how this works. How it works is it sets out certain fundamental issues based on First Nations priorities so that on day one after January 1, children and families in the system will also have new tools that they can use put in place really by First Nations leaders who insisted that they go in there. And they're pretty fundamental what some of these are. So what are they? A new approach to best interest of the child based on keeping the child in the family, keeping the child connected to their culture, language and territory, and that it's in the best interest of the child that those children be properly connected to their actual nations. So one of the keys in this bill is to get away from the pan-Aboriginal, pan-Indian. You know, we have a Cree child, but they're in a Mi'kmaq home or they're in a Métis home. We're trying to get proper tribal-based work with families to support nation and nation rebuilding and nation recognition. There is also important principles on cultural continuity, what the obligation of the provincial and territorial systems will be to make sure children are not taken away from our culture and our language and our communities. There's a commitment to substantive equality. So there's some very significant changes that we need to pay attention to. And some sort of when we talk about it, it's kind of up there, very high level and sounds very legalistic, but I want to make it kind of really real. And that is some of the discussions we're having in different delegations like Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba and elsewhere is after January 1, there's going to be a birth alert somewhere in Canada and they're going to try and remove a First Nations child. This legislation has a provision that we advocated very firmly for to end removals at birth, to require you to work with families and to not flag the system and have that continue. Just for Saskatchewan alone last year, there's about 300 removals at birth. We were able to, in, Sask in British Columbia, thanks to the leadership of the BC Chiefs, get the province of British Columbia to voluntarily, through the minister, in September, declare an end to birth alerts. And in BC, we're still having some cases. We're still fighting it out on the ground because hospital workers and others, it takes time. But it's a big shift, right? We've gone from maybe you know 400 a few years ago, we're down to less than 50. We want to say, make sure there's no First Nations children. 
But after January 1, I can tell you that there will be a child that will be removed somewhere. And it will be very important with these national principles that family members, grandparents, chiefs, maybe the regional AFN, the national chief, and others take a very strong position that under Bill C-92, this is no longer permitted. Which will mean we'll have to have a very strong presence inside those systems immediately to challenge that. And we will be asking the federal government to support us in that stand. Because one of the reasons why these national principles were put in was to address that. I use that as an example because if you have your own First Nations laws ready to go, there's space there for you to do it. You may not have it by the first week of January, but the legislation already will start to challenge. It'll change some of those systems. And there are provinces and territories, unlike British Columbia, that's been pretty cooperative, where they're dead set against this. They have no choice. It's the federal law. It has to be applied. Um, and we have a lot of provinces, and I know myself just dealing with Saskatchewan as an example, where they've said, you know, we like to, but we can't. And it's like, and they have a lot of reasons why they can't do things. All of those reasons are going to be out the door as of January 1. So it's going to be very significant to realize it's a fundamental change, but like everything, tools are only important if you use them. A couple of other things I want to emphasize about the bill is like, it's based on inherent rights. It's based on taking authority, jurisdiction over children and families at your pace according to what you'd like to do. It's not being forced on you. It's not based on an Indian Act model. That is not to say Indian Act band councils can't take advantage of it. It's just it allows for nation building. It allows for some new approaches to happen, more consistent with Section 35 rights and the rights of peoples. It's important to note that, in my view, it's not like you have one approach or another approach. You really need to think about it as certain steps that are there. You can, as a community, take key steps. I know many, many First Nations the first bit of work that they're doing is designating who will decide where a child lives if a child cannot be with the parents at home. For some First Nations, they've already been doing work, it's grandmothers, matriarchs, they've already taken full leadership and that will just be clearly articulated. Others, it might be heads of families or what have you. So it's important to know that you have that opportunity to articulate that. It doesn't have to be some big complex law written up like a provincial child welfare law. It's about steps. Um, at the national level, at the AFN level, the role at this point through our chiefs committee, which consists of chiefs appointed from every region and technical advisors, is to keep a very strong inherent rights approach and to be clear that where space has to be made for First Nations to occupy that jurisdiction, to get that support, to get funding and other things flowing, that's the space the AFN Chiefs Committee has. It is not a service agency, of course. A national chief has been very clear that is not what this is about. It's about making, we're changing a system and about kicking it open so there's more clarity on the ground about funding for this, making sure that they are, they're working with nations and again, making sure there's a First Nations path to implement this legislation. And I say that because as a matter of, I think timing really, they, they, they passed legislation on First Nation, Inuit and Métis. And for AFN in particular, during this journey, it was very clear, National Chief and the Executive was very clear from the beginning, we understand you might want to do it like that, but implementation has to be standalone First Nations. So National Chief has written multiple letters, including a letter that went out today that you will see, re-emphasizing that it has to be First Nations standalone. And we have also articulated that for a couple key reasons. One, most of children in care are First Nations, Situations are different. It's got to be based on First Nations, this culture and attachment to territory. First Nations have a very different situation than Inuit or Métis. We, we don't want to be in an implementation process like that. We are on a First Nations process. So that has been very strong, and that's been heard very strongly, we believe, at the technical level by Canada. So we expect that's going to emerge relatively quickly. Um, 
as I said, it's based on rights on Section 8. I want to talk a little bit, though, about the bigger project of what are you going to do with these new, we got these individual tools to protect children that are there. We have some tools to allow grandparents and parents and chiefs to have standing. And as, I, as you all know, in child welfare, it's been challenging because often in those systems where the province came in and applied without any consent to First Nations, they'd always say chiefs can't know anything, it's privacy, stay out of it, you have no role, you can't be involved. Well, actually, Bill C-92 is about you have to become involved because these are your children, these are your families. Not only do you have you know, a right to be heard, you know, your children require you to be heard. So it's a very different model. It's not the model where we keep people out in a way so we have the bureaucrats do it. It's actually about these are rights holders that are connected to your families. For chiefs, councils, and leaders, you have a new right to be heard, right? You've got some really strong muscle to exercise, but you're exercising it for a reason. It's your obligation. And of course, many, many chiefs have been frustrated for years about being told, stay out of it, you can't be involved, would actually, it didn't turn out very well because the mainstream system wasn't working and it hasn't done the work. So you will have that role now, very clear role. Um, I think it's also important to note that how, like a lot of the questions I'm getting, which I'm sure you are all having and in your regions, looking at your nations, looking at it, what does it mean? Like, what do we do? How do we make it work, right? So we have material in your, your kit about what to expect on day one, how some of these things are going to roll out from our view on the First Nations side. It may not be exactly the same as what the government says, and we are trying to say to the government, we need to make sure we see what you're saying, that it's accurate, because for many years, Canada had no role in child welfare. They said they were just a passive funder. They had no authority, no responsibility, no fiduciary obligation. This bill puts that to rest. The federal government is firmly there, but they're there to support and stand up beside First Nations. So that'll be a new experience as well, because we've never had them in an affirming role. So they may have to back you up with provinces in a very direct way, and I suspect those cases are going to emerge. In terms of how the bill works, I just want to say that there's many ways you can go at it. Don't think of it as black and white and don't make it too complicated. The one issue is your jurisdiction is your jurisdiction. Some of the language I've heard is really deeply offensive sometimes because people outside the First Nations world don't get this, but they'll talk about we're going to have a coordination agreement where we'll give you jurisdiction. Well, that's not what it is. A coordination agreement is where you coordinate your authority and jurisdiction with a province. If you want to, you can go that path. They're not giving it to you. You already have it, and it's recognized. You're simply coordinating it. Some of you may have tables with Canada where you're talking about a whole range of issues in rebuilding your governments, and they want to negotiate child welfare, for instance. You no longer have to negotiate child welfare. You have full recognition of your authority over it. You just have to coordinate it if you choose to. So there's options in this legislation. You can choose, notify the governments. If you're in Saskatchewan, you can notify Canada and Saskatchewan that you want a coordinating agreement because you're exercising your jurisdiction. They have one year to come to the table and work with you. And there's some principles about how that must go, including some fiscal principles about supporting your ability to occupy that field. If, and as we all know with these tables, sometimes it takes six months for anything to get going. So the one year, at the end of the one year, the legislation is very clear to say First Nation laws are paramount over federal and provincial law. That's very significant. Now let's say you don't want to coordinate. Maybe you're a Treaty First Nation and says, I don't want anything to do with that province. That's the wrong crown. I'll, you know, I don't want to deal with these people. We're just doing it our own way by self-determination. You have that choice. You can go your own path, past your law and go. That doesn't mean your laws are not paramount. It just means it's not coordinated and you might get challenged, right? Because the province maybe hasn't had a chance to talk to you. You may not know what happens to a child in an emergency, whatever. But our view from the First Nations lawyers that have been working it is, if you have inherent right to self-determination, self-government over child and families, you have it with or without a coordination agreement. A coordination agreement is a courtesy to make sure for child safety there's not gaps. So. I have seen some material at some of your provincial presentations and some material by Canada that sort of makes it sound like 
you must have an agreement, like it's like a self-government negotiation thing. That's not what it says. Just be absolutely clear. That is not what was negotiated. That's not what's there. And that's not, from my respectful view, what the chiefs are saying will go forward for implementation. So if you face any of that, please make sure you surface that up through your chiefs that are sitting on those chiefs committee, up through the AFM, because we continually challenge that. Uh, because the transition to inherent rights and self-government, it takes time for government to catch up, really. Um, but I see they often fall back into that language and how they're working with uh, our nations. So I also wanted to highlight a couple of other areas where we're going to be in some active discussions over the next while. And that is, this legislation contains a new definition of what is the family for First Nations. And it's not being imposed on you, because you can have your own definitions, but it's important to know what the new definition is. First of all, it is not the Indian Act, Section 6. Absolutely not. But what it is, it says family, as you can see on the screen, family is a person that the child considers to be a close relative or the Indigenous people or First Nation uh, views, belongs with them, including according to, and I've highlighted it, customs, traditions, or customary adoption practices of the nation. So if you are needing to serve children that are not registered Indians because they're family, you should serve those children. There shouldn't be a funding formula and a or whatever about on and off reserve, who's an Indian, who's not an Indian. People may or may not choose to be registered. We have massive backlogs. We have a lot of issues in child welfare service about it. The definition of the family is that customs, traditions, or customary adoption. So as you can see, we now have national recognition of custom adoption. Many grandparents have raised grandchildren, hundreds, probably several of them up here. Uh, and that was a custom adoption. It may or may not have been recognized by the provinces or so forth, because under provincial laws and territorial laws, when you have an adoption, you're required to sever all ties to birth parents. That's a legal concept. They don't exist. You are now the birth parent, which is not consistent with our concept of adoption. Our concept of adoption is we take a child because my sister's passed, I'm taking her children, that doesn't mean I don't pretend like I, they didn't have another mother, right? It's a very different concept of the family. So we're not taking that mainstream white concept of custom adoption. We are bringing our concepts. That's very significant. So you may already have a bunch of kids living with grandparents and there may have already been, according to your traditions, adoptions. They might need to get a passport to travel over across the border or whatever. In my view, the custom adoption is recognized placement, where the adoptive, according to the First Nations custom, parent, grandparent can make decisions for the child about their medical treatment, about traveling and so forth. There should be no discrimination based on the First Nations practices. So I just highlight that as one area. As you know, none of that is what's in Section 6 of the Indian Act. So it will be a process to get that implemented because you know, more than 150 years ago, we had the beginning of the Indian Act. It wasn't co-developed. <laughs> and uh, we're in a very different situation where we have something that was co-developed based on our concept of family. So you can see that this legislation was designed to support nation building and rebuilding of nations and families. It was not designed to control and gatekeep, right? It's a very different idea. A lot of flexibility at your nation level. Um, and so I've talked a bit about some of the new principles. I want to highlight just a few because you will need to kind of reorganize how you do business a bit if you want to fully take advantage of it. And we will try our best to support you. Some regions already have very active tripartite tables. Again, I comment about BC. They have an active tripartite table with the First Nations leaders. Um, BC, Canada, they also have nation tables. But if you look at the second point uh, on that, slide, you cannot remove children due to poverty, ill health, and lack of services, services to parents or caregivers, and that includes substandard housing. Very large category of removals are dealing with poverty and bad housing. That's how we got into this mess from the beginning. No resources and lots of removals. If you have situations after January 1, there's two scenarios. 
If you have a situation where you have an urgent housing need because of that and you have to spend money, keep track of it, I think they're probably responsible to cover that. Number two, if you can't provide appropriate housing and support because you're dealing with poverty, we need to carefully keep track of those children, surface that, and be very clear in your region and area as well as nationally that we're not able to change this because we need these extra resources. So this legislation is, more, is, is about children and families, but it's about the conditions that have caused this, right? So we're gonna be doing work at that level. Housing and child welfare are gonna be working more closely together. Right? We're going to have to compare notes. We're going to have to work together. Some First Nations have had you know, dozens of new homes already approved, but it's very significant. I talked about birth alerts. The legislation already has a priority on prevention. It has a, a list of how, where children can be placed so that, that it doesn't say stranger or foster care. They have to be placed with birth parent, if not birth parent, extended family, if not extended family another First Nations person in that nation and community and only as a very last resort, someone outside. And I have to tell you, at the First Nations side with the regional chief Hart, we pushed very hard. We didn't even want that last category. We wanted it restricted to only First Nations placement. We argued long and hard to try and not have that last one. Provinces and territories really wanted that fourth kind of escape clause. And they, they did get it, but we were going to push really hard for the first three, which is the children don't go out into stranger placement. Um, so in terms of the reasserting jurisdiction, I'm going to advance because I know we're a bit behind. I want to talk about, talk about your options. This material is on your thumb drive, so you have it. You'll be getting more. The big thing is if you want to, like we, you know, the National Chief frequently talks about occupying the field. It's your jurisdiction. You need to decide what you want to do with it. But one of the things we know about occupying jurisdiction is you gotta tell other people what you're doing. So if your kids, like, you know, if you're from, I have a case now where, um, you know, we have a situation from a First Nation in Saskatchewan, the kids are in Vancouver, the grandmother's trying to get the children. If I have the law from Saskatchewan that says, this is our way of doing it, cook home, grandmother gets a child, and we know it, I can say this is the law that applies here. It's, it's, it's this. James Smith Nation Law, for instance. But we have to know what those laws are. So Canada has agreed to do a registry of laws. If you pass a law, you can send it to Canada, they'll translate it into French and they'll post it. So no matter where it is, the child from your nation can be governed by your law. Very important. So Canada has been very generous to say they'll do it. It's not up and running yet, but they tell us it's in development, so it'll be really critical. If you don't yet have your law, but you want to get one, you can notify Canada that you intend to do it under Section 20, and you follow a, you follow a pathway that occupies that field. Now, a lot of you will have, through band council resolutions or otherwise, Aboriginal Delegated Child Welfare Agencies. There are delegated agencies like Vancouver Aboriginal Child and Family Services that don't have any delegated basis. There are urban agencies funded by provinces. The issue about who is the service agency, it's your choice as First Nations to decide who your service agency is. Maybe you'll keep the existing arrangements you have. And it makes sense if you're pooled together and it's working to do that. But they're gonna come under your law instead of the provincial law. And that means, like say you have nine First Nations in a tribal council and they're going to um, go forward, you can designate your agency to be your service agency under your law. But one of those nations may say, we're grandmothers decide where children get placed. They have to follow that. The other one may say, heads of families, they have to follow it. So there's lots of flexibility. But you choose your service agency. The service agency doesn't tell you what to do, which has been the case with the provincial system. Um, this is just a pathway of how you can have a law without, of course, any coordination agreement. Again, it's in the material. You can look at it, how it goes. There's, there's a, there's some helpful information and material there. Uh, what about your own laws? What are the restrictions? You might hear some things saying, well, our, you know, occupying the fields means we're very restricted. Well, there are some things that are very important, and that is your laws should conform to UNDRIP. They should be consistent with human rights of your children and families. Not only there are Section 35 Aboriginal and Treaty rights, but fundamental human rights. Right? You can't have discrimination in them against 
LGBTQ children or what have you. You have to make sure we address that. That's fair, that's appropriate. Nobody wants anything but that. There is a requirement around the Charter of Rights. What does that mean for the Canadian Charter of Rights? Well, it's very important to remember, and I put it up there because Section 25 of the Charter says nothing in those rights should abrogate or derogate from Aboriginal and Treaty rights. And in my view, that means you have a lot of space to occupy that law, and you cannot get pushed back by people who might be trying to drive a wedge using that against you. That may happen when you have mixed families and things like that, but it's very important to know there's a lot of space for that tribal law. And remember, Section 25 of the Charter also recognizes the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Like, there's a reason why this authority is there, rights that might be in land claims agreements, so forth. Like, you have a lot of space there. So I wouldn't be too concerned about some of those bigger limits that are a part of it. I think they're probably widely supported. Um, so I've talked a bit about... Um, the process to now, it's been, you know, change is very difficult in this area as someone who's worked in it. And, you know, the research on change in child welfare in any system is often like it takes five to seven years in these mainstream, mainstream systems to fully adjust. We're doing a pretty radical change on January 1, which is great. Is it, is it planned and perfect at this point? Far from it, I would say to you. But this is how it works when things change. You have to fight through the process. You have to go forward, right? You have to lean into those key things that you negotiated for and that you asserted that are gonna bring change. So we've given some stuff for you, as I said, about what happens on day one. So you can give it to your families and communities. I expect by, you know, maybe this time next year, by the time we get to the end of 2020, we will have some First Nations exercising jurisdiction so we will have more and we will need to develop cooperative ways to share the information about the experiences, whether it's like Kupti Wayne Christian or others. I know there's about 15 First Nations that are ready to go under their own systems. So by, you know, within a matter of months, I think we will see how that emerges and we'll no doubt be able to talk about where we are. And because it's about recognition, a lot of the work has already been done. It's like bringing it in to this framework to move it forward. Um, so that gives you a bit, of, um, a bit of background. Obviously, we're around to ask more questions. Through your regional chiefs, uh, you can bring issues forward. You have a chiefs committee. I think it's just really critical to emphasize in closing the terms of reference for the chiefs committee on children, families, and self-determination is to assist at the issues that are at the national level but it is not to occupy that field of jurisdiction. It's to defer and respect the rights holders and the nations who are doing it and to create advocacy where needed and clarify some things where needed. Like we need that registry set up. There's a few tools that we need to clear the path federally, but it is not to interfere in the work that you're doing in your nations and your regions. And that's written into the terms of reference. So again, I think if you find situations where that's not working, you should bring it forward because we will need to address that and work that out as we go forward. <laughs> On the other hand, if you find issues at the nation level where in your region you're not getting enough support, reach up because we will try and find some ways to support you. So <laughs> we'll have a lot more to say. Please refer to the material. Don't hesitate to come back uh, for questions through your regional chiefs or through the committee. Um, and it will be very important for you to consider what you want to do in the month of January if you think there will be a removal at birth, because I'm going to say it again, the view that we have with this legislation is that it ends birth alerts, and it ends the surprise removal of children in a hospital for First Nations mothers and First Nations families. And I know many in this room have fought very hard for that, but now we've got to make sure that happens, right? So we really need to pull together to be clear about that and to be very clear to judges and hospitals and everyone across Canada that that's what this is going to require. So I'm sure we'll be having more discussions and you're probably reading about some of those cases in no time at all. But if you have one and you're not too sure what to do, be sure to reach back in regionally if you have tribal council support, regional support, or to bring it up. Every case... This is national law. Every case will be a case of national importance. What happens in Quebec is going to affect us in British Columbia. 
every case is going to be a case of national importance. So we really need to keep that in your mind and have those conversations. If you need expert assistance or if you need political assistance or if you need anything around that, because it really is important to make it a sharp break for January 1. Uh, so that gives you a bit of an overview. As I say, I'm happy to um, answer some questions if we have time, and I'll leave that up to Harold. I don't think we do. But um, come through regional chiefs. They know how to reach us, and we will give you more information if you need more. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, we don't really have time for questions on this one, and noting the fact that I've already bumped the regional chief who had speaking notes on this as well, and so I do apologize. I do apologize for that, and I do apologize to the delegation. I will note that uh, Mary Ellen is around, is available to talk, and I will also note that this afternoon when we turn to resolutions, our third resolution this afternoon will be resolution number nine, which deals specifically with this topic. And so, again, unless there's specific questions which could be done on a sidebar, uh, there will be opportunity for the delegation to speak directly to this uh, issue. Um, and, and so I do apologize once again, uh, but again, it's as we struggle to um, with our common enemy, the clock, as I like to refer to it. I will now turn uh, to uh, co-chair Catchaway to move us to the next information item. Calling up Mr. Jeff Green, founder, executive director, expedition leader for Students on Ice. The floor is yours, Mr. Green. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, Quay Quay, bonjour, good afternoon everyone. It's an absolute uh, honor to be here with you today uh, to share a few stories and some information. I was also very honored to have the opportunity to speak earlier in the week on Sunday with the AFN Executive Committee and also with the AFN uh, Youth Council. I first wish to acknowledge that we are gathered here on the unceded traditional territory lands and waters of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. I'm fortunate to call this area uh, home. Uh, my family and I live just north of here, past the mighty Ottawa River and on the beautiful shores of the Gatineau River. My name is Jeff Green. Uh, my Inuktitut name is Pitsulak, which is a little bird with red feet. <laughs> uh, I don't have red feet, um, but uh, it's also named... Do I have red feet? I do. It's also... Uh, <laughs> um, I'm gonna have, yeah, uh, they might be read by the end of this presentation, but um, they, it's also named after Peter Pitsulak, who is an educator from Cape Dorset, and it's a great honor that was given to me by the former commissioner of Nunavut, Anne Hansen. I'm speaking to you today holding this feather. It was a gift from the amazing Lillian Howard, who I know some of you know. Uh, she gifted me this precious uh, eagle feather um, on the final day of our Canada C3 journey, which was a 150-day, 25,000-kilometer journey coast to coast to coast around Canada. And I, I know many of you here, we visited your communities, uh, you welcomed us, and there's many of you here that are also members of the C3 family. And uh, thank you, and it's just wonderful to see you all. Um, the ship we used for that journey was this one. Um, and this was the journey we took from coast to coast to coast, out the St. Lawrence River from the Great Lakes, all the way up the coast, east coast of uh, Nunatsiavut, the Innu Nation, Nunavut, Inu, uh, Inuit Nunangat, zipped around Alaska, and then all the way down the incredible BC coast. Um, it was a journey that reminded us that when we all paddle together in the same direction, we can get to where we want to go. Um, or as Marie Wilson said, who's here today with us, she said, we don't have necessarily have to be in the same canoe. We can be in kayaks and punts and different boats as long as we're paddling in the same direction. And C3 reminded us and showed us that that does really work. Lillian told me that this feather should serve as a reminder to continue learning about the truth of our country, sharing that truth, and all the stories and lessons we learned on that Canada C3 journey. And it was Senator Marie Sinclair who first looked at the early plans for that crazy, crazy, crazy trip, C3, 
and said, this will be a journey of reconciliation before we really understood what that meant. It was also a journey of environment and youth and diversity and inclusion. And I know all of those themes are many of the things that you're here talking about this week. So I do want to share a couple of stories with you, particularly about our youth and the importance of giving them opportunities at the beginning of their lives and how that can shape them. And as National Chief Belgard said so well yesterday, it is so important to invest in our young people, to empower them, to give them hope, to give them the tools that they need for productive, healthy, and innovative lives ahead. I've been an educator, expedition leader, and social entrepreneur for the last 30 years. And that journey's taken me all across Turtle Island, across every ocean, and from pole to pole many times. And like many of you, if not all of you, I've had experiences that have showed the incredible wonder and beauty and awe and fragility of our Mother Earth. And that all inspired me to start a program called Students on Ice 20 years ago. It's a, basically a simple concept, which is to leverage the power of experiential education to inform, inspire, and empower youth. Um, when you touch youth in the heart, that's when action and change happens. And Mother Nature is by far the best way to touch youth in the heart. Imagine, we thought, um, giving this opportunity and, and having cross-cultural learning together with knowledge keepers and scientists and educators and musicians and artists and how it would shape their perspectives and impact their lives, their communities, and really the whole world. So 20 years ago, we started that program. And over the past decades, it's really evolved and grown and diversified considerably. We've had 36 expeditions um, to both the polar regions, which are these windows to the world and cornerstones of the global ecosystem. We've taken over 3,000 youth from 52 countries. And the largest expedition we led to date was the Canada C3 journey. Together, the, the youth learn about the ecological, cultural, geopolitical past, present, and future of the polar regions of our country and of our planet. And in doing so, they gain a greater understanding and respect for our planet and the opportunities we face as a global society. We see climate change with our own two eyes, and that becomes very personal and real when you're standing on a melting glacier or in, on permafrost that's melting, or you're talking to an elder about the changes that they've seen in their lifetimes. As we speak, one of our youth delegations is in Madrid at the COP25 meetings, having that youth voice heard by global decision makers. We use things like the Sustainable Development Goals and the TRC 94 Calls to Action as knowledge platforms and tools for learning and action to help guide the way forward. But that intergenerational, cross-cultural, and multidisciplinary magic is really what I think is required. It enables youth to have a holistic understanding of place and of the challenges and opportunities ahead of us. Every year, we have youth from around the world. Last summer, 130 youth from 20 countries and there's just some of the countries that were on board. So it's global youth addressing global challenges, which is absolutely critical. In 2019, we had youth from every province and territory, every circumpolar country. And the thing I'm most proud about, and there's a new benchmark for our program, is 50% of the youth participants were indigenous youth from all across Canada, but also from all around the world. They were Sami, they were Gwich'in, they were Inuit, they were uh, Mohawk, all together with youth from all other parts of the world. And, and there's a, there, were, there have been unexpected um, consequences from putting that mix together. The, the power of indigenous and non-indigenous youth coming together, learning together, bonding, creating lasting friendships, and learning from each other cannot be underestimated. Also youth from inner city, from big city, from coastal coastal areas, from rural areas, from small island developing states, um, 
together it's, it's magic. And I've also been told by some of our First Nation and Métis and Inuit um, participants how important it was to be visiting Inuit in their homeland and seeing things from, from their perspective. Over the years, we've had all kinds of First Nations youth. Here's just a few I wanted to point out. Um, Cadence, Haida, um, and Kwakwayakwath uh, from the northwest coast of BC. Tony from Bella Bella, um, Heltzik, Jessica and Nikki from Alert Bay were with us last summer. Um, Riley, who's right here, she's Métis um, and uh, Mohawk from Ottawa. You might recognize some of these youth from your communities. Luana Moore Anishinaabek from Winnipeg. Graham from Whitehorse, Yukon. Marissa from Masset, BC, ha uh, Haida. Jewel Charles Woodland Cree from Saskatoon. Carissa from Moosonee. And Kenzie from, she's Cree from Woodstock, New, New Brunswick. And last summer, we were so thrilled to create a new partnership with the um, uh, Assembly of First Nations in uh, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And these are the nine Mi'kmaq youth that we had join us uh, on that expedition, um, which uh, we hope to continue that partnership for years to come. On board with the, ex the, the youth are this global team of, of you name it, from, from knowledge keepers to youth leaders to politicians, sharing their knowledge and passion with the youth. We've had astronauts, um, youth or per, uh, staff that have been to the deepest part of the world ocean, the Marianas Trench, to the top of Mount Everest, even to the International Space Station on board. Mental health has been a huge uh, part of our program and we've got a, a new mental health and wellness program. When you put youth into a warm, caring, nurturing environment, Sometimes for the first time in their lives, a lot of stuff comes out and you have to be prepared for, for that. We have a, a mental health and wellness team of professional counselors on board. We also bring amazing people like the Twin Flames, musicians um, who saw, whose songs touch on uh, their life experiences, including issues like suicide and, and other challenges that so many of our youth are, are dealing with. So, so mental health isn't the elephant in the room. We talk about it before we talk about climate change and biodiversity. And when you come back from one of our programs, the expedition is just the beginning of the journey. Our alumni program stays connected with the youth for years to come. It nurtures, it mentors, it micro grants, and gives them the support and opportunities on their journeys forward. So, Here's a few amazing outcomes and successes. Um, Bobby Rose Gwitchen, she is from our 2007 Arctic expedition. Um, she's now a member of our alumni council. In 2019, she received one of our micro grants in support of her drum making workshop. Um, her experience on Students on Ice and other experiences has really made her want to make a difference in her community. And she tells me she hopes to one day be the chief of her community. So watch out for Bobby Rose. <laughs> Tristan Bent. Tristan is Okanagan Carrier Sakani from Takla Lake First Nation. He was on our 2017 Arctic expedition. That experience completely transformed Tristan and inspired him to take the pain from his past and transform it into a spoken word performance, which he delivered in collaboration with professional uh, musicians on our team. And it blew us away, the power of his words. And he's continuing on his journey and implying his new confidence and optimism. Avery Velez has just become the Northern Engagement Coordinator for the Canadian Roots Exchange, facilitating Indigenous policy and much more. And Chris White, he um, is Mi'kmaq, but he lost kind of touch with his culture and his community. And his experience really inspired him to reconnect and he's now the chair of the Nova Scotia Environmental Network. The stories go on and on. The youth go on to get scholarships. They become innovators. They, they um, get, just get, uh, find new pathways forward in their, in their lives. Uh, and they, they often just choose to live healthier lives. So just to conclude, there's that map of Canada. 
When we sailed around Canada from the time we left the tip of Newfoundland, if you can picture this, until we got to the tip of Vancouver Island, we were exclusively in indigenous community. That is 70% of Canada's coastline. And that's not to mention the other 30% that have indigenous communities spread out, but not exclusively. That's a narrative our country needs to, to tell more. Indigenous communities and cultures are the gatekeepers, the guardians of our, of our country's coastlines and are really of our, of our country at large. On the ship, we had a legacy room where we collected gifts from, from across Turtle Island. It was a sacred space and really the heart and soul of our ship on that Canada C3 journey. And some of the incredible people we had that are part of that alumni are Ganateo Horn from Oka, the amazing Stephen Kakfui and Marie Wilson who shared and taught us so much, Vicki Grant from Tomogamy First Nation who's now part of our Students on Ice staff, Chief Meisel Joe from, from Con River, Mi'kmaq, when he heard we were going around the country, he decided to give me a canoe. He didn't tell me I had to carry that canoe three times around the powwow circle. <laughs> that's, the, that's the heaviest darn canoe I've ever carried. But we did carry that as a symbol of truth and reconciliation on our journey all the way to BC. Harvey Humchit, honorary chief from Bella Bella. Um, chief Petishu, and this is really the last story I wanted to share uh, about our alumni. He gave me those snowshoes because they're made of caribou sinew and he wanted us to share the story of the loss of the George River caribou herd that's gone from 1.5 million when he was a boy to less than 11,000 and we've done that. Oh yeah, Nadine Caron and Raven, let's hear it for Raven Lacerte and the Moosehide campaign. Donovan from uh, Aquasasne and uh, looking ahead and this is where I want, I really hope to share this journey with the AFN, with all of you. We have some new programs like our Expedition to Community, our Arctic Expedition this summer, our 20th anniversary journey. It's not too late for your youth to apply for scholarships. 90% of the youth are fully funded to participate. So there's no cost thanks to scholarships. And we can create scholarships specifically with your communities. We're going to go to back to Antarctica. We're also starting a new program about the blue economy, which I'd love to work with you on because indigenous youth need to be at the front lines of the opportunities of the blue economy ahead. Good. To wrap up, because I'm getting the hook and my feet are definitely red now. Um, <laughs> connecting, reconnecting our youth with nature, with themselves and with others is absolutely critical. It's important for the health of our planet our communities, and tackling those big challenges that we have ahead. It's also important for our country to work. For us to be the best we can be, to be the best in the world, these relationships are so fundamental. Getting to know one another, becoming friends, learning from each other, and when that happens at a young age, the outcomes and the impacts are life-changing. Learning environments Experiences and opportunities like Students on Ice and many others have shown the potential and history has proven this to be real. It has the potential, potential to change the world. Miigwech, merci beaucoup, thank you very much. Merci, thank you. Donc, notre prochain point à l'ordre du jour, c'est le dossier vétéran. Donc, euh, je vais maintenant inviter le chef régional Yakelaya pour Yakelaya introduire notre vétéran. Nous allons appeler le chef régional Yakelaya pour ce prochain item. Merci. OK. Merci et merci à soutenir. Tutene Gona Zon. Grand Chiefs, Elders, Leaders, Distinguished Guests, I wanted to do an introduction to the special warriors in our communities, the ones that fought for Canada and fought for ourselves. 
These special warriors, known as veterans, and veterans in Canada and their families, the sacrifice they have made for the things that we enjoy today or take for granted, the veterans who have never returned back to their home country and their land. When I was in high school, I can't tell you the date because you're trying to guess how old I am. There was a course that we had taken called social studies. We learned about the World War I, World War II, and other wars. And I didn't think too much of it. Why are they teaching us about the World War I and World War II? Because it was all about other people. In high school, they didn't teach us that we had warriors that fought for us. It was totally out of the textbook. Nothing known about our indigenous veterans. So I didn't pay attention. All I knew about the Americans and Canadians, the Germans and the Russians and the French, but nothing on our own people. And so we were taught that. And these are very special people I've got to know over the year. When I was elected last year, I've asked for the veterans file. And like many of you here, I have a lot of relatives that have served and continue to serve today. I have relatives, and when I worked with the indigenous veterans file, I got to know them at a different level. Truly, these are our real warriors of what we have today in Canada. And my heart goes out to them because when I was in high school in Inuvik in the Northwest Territories, they did not teach about you. Shame on Canada. Shame. And what you have given up for us to fight for your country, to fight for people like me who have been was so ignorant of what we have today. Shame on Canada. Shame. And that you've given up so much and you have stories from your own people of the lands that you still want back and the health and the healing programs that you need and the services that you should be recognized at the most highest level in Canada and to honor the ones who have not come back yet that are still over there. God bless my mother, she passed, and her uncle is still over there. And they think that he's still coming back. Even mentally, they know that he's not there anymore. Shame on Canada. See us veterans, they're the warriors, and it's passed down onto us as warriors to fight for what we should rightly have in our own land. So I want to say to you how pleased I am to renew the energy into this file and serve my veterans. And I really want to say Masi Cho, thank you to the National Chief. for allowing me to take this file and to my AFN director, Larry White Duck, for both of their commitment. I am pleased to report 
that on the First Nations Veterans of Canada Advisory Council, we have a representative from coast to coast to coast and the other coasts, because we're working with the United States veterans too. They are our brothers and sisters. God bless them. I want to let, let you know that we are moving forward on a number of issues. And we want to build an Indigenous Veterans Bridge to Veteran Affairs Canada to set the path straight and letting them know they need to own up to our veterans. Now it's time that the Veteran Affairs Canada to develop programs and policies that support our Indigenous veterans. They need to work with us for this to happen. Their single window approach is not appropriate. We need our First Nations unique way of dealing with our challenges, such as health, and using our own medicines and ceremonies to help us and guide us. You have your medicine people. We have to get them in to help our veterans. We're having a hard time with housing, land, wellness. I want to say that it's important work that needs to get done for the veterans of yesterday, the veterans of today, and the veterans of tomorrow. In closing, I want to say how honored I'm here to be here because last year when I first came to the Assembly of First Nation, all this was new to me. And because I had the veterans file, I had the pleasure of doing an honoring of the Mohawk Code Talker. Man, that was touching. These people out here, your leaders, you're so kind and so powerful. I felt it when, when we honored the Mohawk Code Talker with the blanket. And as he sat in the wheelchair, I looked at him and I kind of shed tears. I said, this man, he saved the world. We as indigenous people saved the world because of our, our language. No matter where we come from, our veterans, doesn't Canada get it? how powerful we are, just by our language. We save the world, and that they don't get, that kind of, what do you say the word? P-O. Because our veterans sacrifice the highest call of life to give their life for us that we have today for granted. Let's think about that. And because of the Mohawk Code Talker, I have some tears because wonderful men, these Code Talkers. So I think we should also really think about asking a National Code Talker Institution to train our translators and our interpreters for the language so they can save our nation, let the government know what we're talking about, but we use our own language. So I just want to end there 
I'm very passionate about my um, file here, and so I want to pass it on to the veterans, Percy Joe. Percy Joe. Sir. No. Uh, thank you, Norman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, recognize and thank uh, Norman, the regional chief from uh, Northwest Territories, for breathing air into the veterans uh, file. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. And on behalf of all the veterans, uh, we definitely thank you for the work you've done in the past year. I'd also like to uh, recognize the regional chief, uh, Terry Tiji from uh, British Columbia for having the confidence in me to appoint me as the representative from British Columbia. And also, I'd like to also mention uh, the, my peers, the other veterans uh, that have been at the meetings and that for having the confidence in me to uh, appoint me as a spokesperson for the First Nation Veterans of Canada. There are a few, uh, I want to try and uh, run through as quickly as possible because I know you have a lot of business to do and uh, important things that need to be covered. But some of the issues, uh, key issues and activities, uh, First Nations Veterans of Canada work to address the needs and concerns to help facilitate uh, the flow of information to First Nation veterans and their families. The lack of our, just a second here, I'm just trying to run down my notes and skip out some of the issues. I think these will be available uh, on print at some point some table. Uh, there is a need, uh, sort of the important things that uh, there is a need for po access to services and as caregivers and uh, child care, health and other benefits. Uh, and I was just reminded by a fellow veteran from out in the audience there, there also needs to be housing, recognizing housing for veterans uh, off reserve. We need uh, uh, communications uh, of information to be delivered uh, the service to the rural and remote, remote communities uh, and other common issues that is regularly mentioned uh, during uh, witness and uh, presentations regarding First Nations veterans in Canada. As you're well aware, a lot of our communities, uh, a lot of the information comes through the internet. Uh, many of our communities do not have internet so that uh, we al always don't get the latest uh, information that uh, veterans uh, benefit benefits are uh, announced. Also, so one of our concerns is the lack of recognition and efforts of First Nation veterans of Canada members after many international conflicts and battles they have had a few opportunities to participate in international uh, commemorations, activities, and ceremonies. There's been very little uh, recognition of uh, First Nations veterans and also the opportunity to have ceremonies uh, during those uh, uh, ceremonies. The First Nations veterans would like to be part of these uh, commemoration activities and honor the fallen soldiers through ceremony. The other uh, priorities uh, identified by the, the veterans uh, at a meeting that was held in Calgary on March uh, 27th to the 29th. The, there needs to be an a environmental scan to, in, to be inclusive of all First Nations and Aboriginal veterans who have fought in major world conflicts, including First World War, Second World War, Korean, uh, present-day conflicts, such as in Afghanistan, Canada's UN peacekeeping. And also in there is included is our brothers and sisters that serve uh, with the U.S. Uh, armed Forces. Uh, many of those uh, 
problems uh, coming home to Canada have a difficult time uh, accessing their benefits in the U.S. They generally have to be at the border before they get their mileage paid. And if you live uh, deep in Canada, they have a difficulty going down the U.S. to service their, to get their service. We had uh, some activities uh, in uh, 2019. Uh, I'm not going to get into any depth of uh, what was discussed on that. Uh, we had, a, like I mentioned, we had a meeting in, uh, in uh, Calgary on the 27th to the 29th of uh, March. Uh, and uh, uh, we also had that with the with uh, Saskatchewan veterans who have a lot of uh, knowledge and a well-organized uh, team of veterans that helped us along on uh, planning our activities. Uh, uh, we had another meeting in uh, September in Montreal. It was a one-day meeting with Respect Canada. Uh, they, no, they noticed that we were not representative from any organizations that, uh, that talks to veterans' uh, affairs, and uh, that's one of the things uh, we want to become part of. Uh, there's been some groups that uh, that have uh, spoken on behalf of First Nations veterans without uh, consulting with uh, the First Nations veterans. So we want to ensure that uh, if there's any discussion about uh, First Nations veterans, uh, we want to be involved in that uh, discussion and we want to represent ourselves. We've had uh, some discussions with uh, the, with uh, veterans and budsmen. We've also had some discussions with uh, with the Dominion Ca Command, uh, the with the Legion. Uh, we've had uh, Veterans Emergency Transition Services. We've met with them, uh, the Veterans Affairs, uh, and also with uh, Respect Canada. And out of our meeting in uh, Calgary in uh, March, uh, we came up with uh, nine or t eight uh, recommendations, uh, and uh, I'll, I won't go into all of them, but uh, the important part of all those is uh, we wanted to uh, uh, also look back at uh, the treatment of our second world, First World War, Second World War, and Korean veterans on the compensation that they did not receive. They were not treated as equals uh, like any other s soldiers uh, coming back uh, uh, from the war. And uh, those, uh, one of the things, there was a, an offer made by, uh, there was a round table happening and the government unilaterally made a decision to what they called an offer, a gesture of goodwill that was offered to the, the veterans, which was $20,000, 20, 20, $20, and there was a very short window for them to apply for it, and we know a lot of the veterans did not uh, receive that, uh, that gesture of goodwill, so as uh, an organization, we are going to be pursuing that. And one of the other issues we wanted to do was actually try and get the the names of every person that served uh, between those times and pre-confederation uh, uh, because we know that there was uh, many of our First Nations were involved uh, such as the, the War of 1812 and uh, other wars that uh, uh, before Canada was in confederation so those uh, we want to recognize those people also. And uh, one of the, the important things, uh, there was a, uh, a report done uh, by AFN uh, called Search for Equity back in 2000, and that uh, is uh, one of the ones we also want to uh, update uh, and, that, and get it up to date. Uh, we've talked to the Dr. Sheffield, uh, who was at the uh, University of uh, Alberta, I believe, but now is uh, in uh, Victoria of British Columbia.
and the current activity that's happening, because uh, we know th this is all going to cost money. I was able to, by accident, get in contact with uh, uh, with a, 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 a firm that's uh, called All Tech and uh, had a discussion. And uh, the person that worked there, his grandfather served in the Second World War and uh, was actually stationed and served on the Bonaventure, the last aircraft carrier that Canada had. And he, he was a Métis from uh, Saskatchewan, I believe he said. And uh, so we had discussions. We had a phone call uh, last uh, week, uh, which involved myself, uh, uh, Larry White Duck, and, uh, and uh, three other members uh, to fundraise uh, to deal with a lot of issues that were that is ahead of us and that and uh, and the, what we had uh, planned uh, we want to be able to do and uh, not knowing that uh, uh, where we were going to get the money but we just thought these things had to be done and we were prepared to to do that but hopefully that uh, we can uh, uh, get funding uh, to do those things uh, there was a lot of discussions on there uh, uh, we haven't heard back from them so I'm not going to get into any more details uh, in case it falls through I'll probably fall with it so and uh, and one of the things that we talk about uh, and uh, is uh, the post uh, the PTSD uh, the thing uh, we, we want to change that term because uh, really uh, there's sort of a stigma held with that thing as uh, as a mental illness uh, 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 post the uh, uh, the, the PTSD is not a mental illness. Uh, uh, what we like to start calling is uh, operational stress injury and make it sound like it's actually a physical wound that uh, you get. And uh, so we want to move forward with uh, using that term and, uh, and uh, the things I've uh, talked about, particularly in British Columbia where we, there's a tripartite agreement in health uh, one of the things I've always mentioned there was, uh, you know, if we don't deal with veterans' affairs and how to deal with the, the 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 trauma that is happening with a lot of our veterans, uh, a lot of them homeless, that is going to fall on our health program, and it, we don't have enough money there to really deal with it. I know when I applied to to get an assessment whether I have a, a PTSD, uh, all I got offered was, uh, you know, pay it up front, we'll pay $75 of it. Who in the heck can afford a psychiatrist for $75? You know, I don't know what they cost. Do we have any psychiatrists? I don't think they charge uh, uh, less than $200 every half hour or whatever it is. Uh, so that you know, so there's going to be a cost if I have to, if I go through the process, uh, somebody has to pay for it, or I have to pay for it. Uh, so that's an issue that uh, you know we need to also look at. Uh, I've been requested at British Columbia to actually do a presentation to the, the health board there, so I'm not too sure. I was just warned about it uh, a week or so ago. So with that, uh, I'd like to. Uh, just uh, pass it back. Pass it back to Norman if he's got anything else to add. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. We have uh, uh, three more uh, items. On our agenda this this afternoon, there's a honoring that's going to be taking place. There is um, another piece, and then there's resolutions, which I uh, I don't have on my my agenda. Um, oh, sorry, day schools, residential schools, going to be up. We're going to be hearing from a presentation. Um, right now, uh, we are going to be doing uh, an honoring. Uh, Larry has. Uh, uh, lit the smudge, I believe. Larry? Yeah. 
We're good to go. Uh, okay, I would like to call on National Chief Perry Belgard to, to uh, bring us through this this next uh, piece here. Uh, sorry, Ch Ron. Chief Ron, uh, microphone number one. Hello. Yeah, Cook B. Ron Ignace, Weapon Nation, Skeet System. I just wanted to thank uh, the Regional Chief from Yukon and Percy Joe for the good work you guys are doing on veterans. Uh, my father was a veteran and he uh, suffered uh, PTSD. Uh, very seriously, unfortunately, throughout his life, and uh, we had to live with it. But what I want to come up here and ask is, I know that our my community and Kamloops community, we have family members that never came home. Why don't we should fight for uh, a, an all indigenous delegation of people who have representatives, family members that didn't come home to have representatives of the family to go over there and to have a ceremony of closure with the families over there. I would really request that, that uh, you guys take that on for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. All right, National Chief Perry Belgard. Thanks, Chief uh, Cook B. Ignace, for those uh, rec good recommendations, and uh, Chief Yakalea from the Northwest Territories, and Percy Joe, long-time uh, chief and um, now strong advocate for veterans, for sure will indeed follow up. We've got uh, three things we want to get done now, chiefs. And um, what we wanted to do, and uh, we always say to bestow honor amongst our peoples is uh, a big thing. And we've always said that to do it while people are alive is very important because our elders will always say, you go to wakes and funerals and everybody gets up and says really good things about the loved one laying in the casket. You go to wakes, you hear all the good things all the time. And then they say, wouldn't it be good to say those good things when that person's alive to hear it, you know? And... Um, that teaching we take to heart. And so this uh, lady we want to bring up, Paulette Tremblay, we want to honor her and we want to thank her because Dr. Paulette Tremblay is our CEO at the AFN and she's been our CEO for the last four years. And she's done a fantastic job because it's easy to show up for meetings. We always say as leaders, it's, yeah, Show up for meetings, but the kits are all done. Everything is organized. Information is set up. All these things are done for you. It's easy to come and just show up. But there's a lot of work behind the scenes. And you need a strong team to do the planning, the organizing, the controlling, the directing, all those good things. And so Paulette, she's an educator. She's a turtle clan of the Mohawk Nation from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory in Southern Ontario. She's got a long and extinguished, distinguished career in education and administration. As I said, she currently is our CEO. She's an educator and her passion is education. And she's found a new opportunity. And she says, you know, executive, national chief and executive, I want to pursue my life dream in this education field. And he says, Paula, don't do it. <laughs> but national chief, I love this education. So he said, we'll bring our team together and we did accept her farewell notice. She has been with us for many years, and she'll be moving on in January. But she was a former Vice President of Education and Training at AFOA, AFOA Canada. She was the CEO at the National Average Health Organization. She's been the Director of Education for Inspire. She's been the Senior Executive Officer for Six Nations Band Council in Southern Ontario, Director of Education for AFN. She's been a researcher at the University of Ottawa, federal government designer and trainer at the Public Service Commission, like this lady does lots and she's done lots. And she's got her PhD and many other degrees. And so this is our way of saying thank you, Paulette, for all your years of service here at our Assembly of First Nations. We want to wish you well going forward. We want to wish you best of luck going forward. We want to blanket you. We want an honor song for you because you've contributed so much of your time, energy, and effort to all of us.
Chief, she, uh, come on, Paulette, she's going to say a few words, very few words. Come on. Okay, Sego Scano. Um, 
I'm not very often speechless, <laughs> but I am today. Um, I want to say nyao goa um, for all the support I get to do my job for you. I always feel like we're serving you, the chiefs, who have the most difficult job in this whole country. I mean, you, the, the difficulties that you have to deal with on a daily basis at the community level, um, uh, it's just so profoundly uh, heartbreaking and, and you do it. You do it year after year and you come and you try to fight so hard uh, with this federal government and the Crown to move our issues forward. And so I am so proud to have served you because I think you, without you, these changes wouldn't happen. And so Nyangoa, to all the chiefs, I, I really care about our people, our grandchildren and their children. And I think when I see what you do and you speak up, this is our time. This is a time of reconciliation. When the national chief, um, who is my adopted little brother, in a Cyprus <laughs> anvil ceremony many years ago, my mother, who is now with our creator, um, loved Mr. Belgard, and we promised uh, in the Cree language that we would work tirelessly to help our people. And I see his leadership is opening doors so that you have access to talk to the people to try to make things better. And as we move from Indian Act Bend, that's, that's passe now. We're way past that now, to nationhood. We have to help each other know what that means and how we can do that. And so we have a job to create templates uh, at the Assembly First Nation, and as we reorganize and move into a more functional structure to help you do that, and we get out and educate, work with First Nations at the community levels, I think it's a win-win, because I think uh, to educate and, and to work collaboratively to help our own to move forward is the path forward. So I'm hoping as uh, the Assembly First Nations changes and becomes more relevant and more uh, in tune with the times that that can happen. I'm not going to be disappearing. I'm going to be working on education and making sure that we get to communities and we help with some of this because we think that we, we have to do this. We have to work collaboratively. And uh, I just want to say Nyawagoa. I want to say Nyawagoa to all of the regional chiefs, they work tirelessly. I see, I read every word in every report, and I'm so amazed at what they can accomplish in such short periods of time with such intense intensity. Um, and so, Nyawe regional chiefs, they've been wonderful, and I appreciate you and your leadership. And um, I want to, uh, of course, national chief, um, and Mike Mitchell, who has been my elder and our resident elder. He's been such a strong leader. Um, I'm, I just, I'm in awe of him. I hold him up. And I want all my staff, where are you? Stand up. Stand up. Staff. AFN staff, where are you? Where are you? And here. Nothing can be done without you. And young lady, young lady down there, I love her. <laughs> She's sitting here drumming. Young boy. Oh, it's a boy. I'm sorry. Oh. Sorry. I couldn't. Oh. All right, on that note. <laughs> sorry, on that note, I'm going to say Nyao Goha. Thank you. Tim, 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 take it over. We're going to switch over. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, honoring. And, and now that uh, she has been honored, uh, we can now call her the honorable or the right honorable Dr. Paulette Tremblay. So I'd like to ask uh, the uh, next uh, item on the agenda to get ready over here uh, to the right of the stage. Um, 
the uh, MOU signing uh, between the uh, Assembly of First Nations and the Indigenous Centre. Larry, uh, Director of Protocol, is uh, going and, and uh, doing um, some last-minute uh, smudging of the documents, of the pens, of the, the table, of the space. To, to clear it, to, for the energy to be positive, and that's happening. Um, the Youth Council, uh, there's a, another um, section of, of this, and I'd ask you to, to be uh, on standby, because uh, right after the signing, we're going to go into uh, your uh, section, uh, and then after that, um, we're going to be uh, moving forward with the agenda, so I'll queue up the, the Youth Council, you're next. Um, if the microphone at the uh, signing table uh, can be turned on, uh, audio, um, camera can be pointed that way. I'm sure everybody is yep. sick of looking at me. Um, can point it over there and here, here we go. So that I believe the mic is, is live there, National Chief. Just so the Chiefs, uh, this memorandum of understanding, and again we acknowledge uh, Toby Denemy from Pipixi's First Nations, our neighbor, uh, Kanacha Apel was their treaty signer back in 1874 as well, and um, they're working on this very important aspect on this, uh, basically dealing with uh, safety, public safety for First Nations across Canada. And the Indigenous Centre for Occupational Health and Public Safety is, is very new, but something at the band level that's very much needed. So if your workers get hurt in housing or even in NADAP for insurance or anything like that, Workers' compensation doesn't always apply. So there's an issue of jurisdiction about having access to good quality health care and safety out at the reserve level. And so Toby made the presentation in Saskatchewan to Chief Bobby Cameron, the FSIN executive, brought it forward to the AFN executive, and our AFN executive passed it by motion that we should look at an MOU between the Assembly of First Nations and this organization called the Indigenous Centre for Occupation, Health and Public Safety. Mm. Very important. So that's what this is. So we're going to have the signing now. That's the background. It's good. He says good. Done. Oh, I'll say something. Oh, Toby yeah. wants to say something oh, here. Uh oh. Uh oh, look out. gana acha pe Treaty 4. I'd like to thank Perry Belgard, uh, Chief Perry Belgard, for opening up all of our nations to occupation and health and public safety. It's very crucial that we look at our public safety when it comes to our schools, our economic development, as well as our nation building. It is the foundation to in which we build our nations is safety. Oma, exe, maguech. All right, that's it. So here we go. Right here, eh? That one there, Toby. Yep. Perfect. All righty. Well, let's keep working. This is uh, Perry. Hey, oh, oh. This is the traditional way when we start partnerships, is to give a gift and an understanding. We uh, we lifted that sh sh uh, that pipe uh, the first Walking. day. Mm -hmm. That signifies our partnership, the old way, and of course. The medallion oh, for you to keep oh, wow. and to hold. Public safety is very important. Thank you, so, oh, thank, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's a big honor. So with that, thanks, Chiefs, and uh, thanks, Toby, and uh, the executive, because the MOU here, and I've said, we will not sign anything as one individual national chief. We, com we agree to things as an executive, and that's how this came about. So I want to thank my colleagues at the back for the support. And thank Toby for your good work and your vision and for the Thanks, high sir. honor here. Iksanma, Kanas Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you very much for that National Chief and the Indigenous Centre. I now look to the Assembly of First Nations National Youth Council. Um, we, we are going to be doing a blanket dance, uh, of course, to raise money. Um, Chief uh, Jason Henry, uh, Chippewas of, of Kettle and Stoney Point First Nation, has, has requested a blanket dance. Uh, it was accepted. Uh, raised money uh, for a young man named Isaac Henry. Um, in his early 20s, he was on the uh, road near his uh, community, and uh, he was hit by a car, and, and um, 
he has severe injuries uh, and, and it's going to take uh, he's not covered by uh, insurance. It's going to take a lot of, of money to, to help defer uh, medical costs for the family. So a uh, young man from Kettle and Stony Point is, um, is injured and uh, the assembly is asked to uh, have a blanket dance. So that's what we're doing. The drum group is ready. I believe the National Youth Council um, is in the room with the, they're over here. Um, to my left and they have a blanket they're going to be doing one round uh, around the room um, this is the chief he's uh, shaking hands with the the drum group and uh, is very thankful for this uh, this this raising of the of the funds so they're ready to go uh, the youth council is over here they're going to be making a round uh, they're coming this way uh, starting over here going that way so I, I looked at a drum group now uh, to, to give us a give us a song uh, we're going to be like I said having a blanket dance for this young man from Chippewas of Kettle and Stony Point a young man named Isaac Henry um, who was injured in a, in a car accident he was uh, walking on the road and and was uh, was hurt so there's going to be a lot of uh, costs that are associated with that and the chief who is sitting at the drum um, requested this uh, is a way for the assembly to raise money so we have uh, the youth council there we have the the drum group is is uh, going through their catalog of songs to, to decide which one to, to sing and um, they're gonna be going around the room once and uh, and, and the only thing we're missing at this blanket dance is, is a blanket now. So as soon as we get the blanket, uh, we will be beginning this, this blanket dance. So we, we, we gave away all the blankets already. Uh, we honored everybody. And uh, now uh, we have no more blankets for the blanket dance. <laughs> yeah. Take the, the sheet off the table. <laughs> Off the, if it was if it was back home, we'd take the sheet off the window. But uh, we're we're in uh, we're kind of far from home to do that. Um, so we we need a blanket now for the uh, for the blanket dance. We got a blanket. Very good. Thank you very much. All right, Bear Nation.
you very much. Thank you very much, Bear, Bear Nation. Thank you so much. The Youth Council, the blanket is in the back over there. And, and from what I'm told, the, uh, the, the money is going to be wrapped in the blanket. It's going to be smudged. And the money is going to be counted. It's going to be reported back to the Assembly how much money was raised for that young man. And uh, the blanket is also going to be gifted uh, to the family uh, f for that young man. So thank you very much uh, to the delegation for making that donation. Thank you to Bear Nation for honoring us with that song. I will note that the chief of Kettle and Stony Point was at the drum singing, sharing his song. So he, he is there. He was with the drum. And I, I want that noted. Thank you very much, chief, for being there. Uh, moving on with the agenda, I will turn over the mic to uh, Harold Tarbell. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Appreciate that. Thank you very much, delegation, uh, for helping us with those uh, honorings. As uh, noted, we are going to uh, turn our attention to the Day Scholars Residential Schools, and so we do have the two pieces of work left to do then. We will deal with this issue. On this, I do have three speakers. I have Dr. Marie Wilson, with the, formerly with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Joanne, Go Joanne Gottfriedson with the Tecumseh and Wepham Day Scholar Coordinator, and then we will hear from uh, Regional Chief Norman Yakalila on the Federal Day Schools uh, issue. Yeah. Following that, uh, we will open the floor briefly before we proceed to the resolutions, pick up our work on the resolutions. As noted, we won't go any longer than 5.30 today, and we'll pick up our work tomorrow morning where we begin again with resolutions when we uh, arrive. And of course, Dr. Wilson is uh, well known to us both through her work uh, with her husband, Stephen Crackby in the NWT, her work with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and an extensive number of uh, credentials and uh, uh, work that she's done on behalf of uh, First Nations throughout uh, the nation. And uh, so with that, please help me welcome to the podium, Dr. Marie Wilson. Good afternoon, everyone, and I want to say how grateful I am to be here. Special thanks to uh, the Anishinaabe Algonquin hosts for having us here in this territory, and uh, to all of the regional chiefs and chiefs, and uh, all of the presenters today for the rich presentations. It's been wonderful to be here among you. Um, as was referenced, and I thought I was going to be standing here with my my co-commissioner, I served as one of the three commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and uh, Chief Littlechild and I, there he is, uh, uh, we thought he was going to introduce me, but for time that's been truncated, and uh, I know one of the things that, um, that we like to say, especially when Justice Sinclair is not in the room, is that we were the A-team. That's the joke we always make about uh, the commissioners. Uh, anyway, uh, when the commission ended, as you all know, we issued 94 calls to action, and I made uh, a promise, personal promise, that I would continue as long as I could to advance uh, what the survivors had taught the country um, and the implementation of the calls to action. And what we're talking about here today, and I'm just waiting for uh, a clicker that will help me advance this uh, presentation for you. Um, <laughs> Jeff Green had put it on ice. Um, <laughs> what, um, what this is about is one of the specific calls to action regarding commemoration. Uh, and I, just, I know that I have about uh, 10 minutes, so I'll just try to be quite brief. I know that, that the, um, the Assembly of First Nations is very familiar with the issue of commemoration, and especially as it relates to the TRC. Uh, you may also recall that in 2010, at the AFN Special Chiefs Assembly back then, um, there was uh, a motion passed which led to a, a major commemoration project which we as commissioners um, helped recommend for funding so that there could be markers in all of the places throughout the country where there had been schools. So the AFN's um, attachment to the principle of, recon of uh, commemoration is long established. In um, 2015, among our many calls to action, uh, we said that there needs to be more work done on commemoration. 
not just because of memorialization, but because we knew even then that the ongoing work of education and educating the country um, and, and reconciliation, it would need to continue as a, as a long piece of work. And so in Call to Action 81, very specifically, um, as you can see there on the screen, we, we called upon the federal government in collaboration with survivors and their organizations and other parties to the settlement agreement to commission and install a publicly accessible, highly visible residential schools national monument in the city of Ottawa to honor survivors and all the children who were lost to their families and communities. Well, in recent weeks, which is to say long after that call to action was first made known over four and a half years ago, um, we were able to gather, um, hosted by Heritage Canada, uh, to have a really fruitful and uh, encouraging workshop as to how to advance this call to action. And uh, I was asked to um, convene and plan and lead that workshop, and I'm very um, grateful um, that um, Commissioner Chief Littlechild was there with me, uh, along with uh, a, a number of other people, and I want you to know the nature of the gathering in terms of the perspectives that were there. Uh, we made it very intentional to have perspectives from all of these diverse um, uh, considerations. So we had First Nations, Inuit and Métis there. Uh, there was representation from every region of Canada. Um, two thirds of the original survivors advisory committee was in attendance and you may recall it was the Assembly of First Nations that first nominated the members to that Survivors Advisory Committee and they worked with us and walked with us throughout our TRC work. Um, and we've been sad to, to lose a number of our members along the way. But two thirds of that group was able to come and attend. We had intergenerational survivors there. A number of our TRC honorary witnesses who are those people who have pledged ongoing efforts uh, to help the educate uh, and I, I note um, uh, Gwendolyn Point here uh, at your Knowledge Keepers table, who was one of our acknowledged honorary witnesses. So I'm very happy to see you here. Um, um, we also included a number of longtime TRC collaborators because we realized we're not starting from scratch here. Um, this is a conclusion that came after 7,000 statements were received by the TRC and after six and a half years of work. So there was no need and no time, frankly, to start from scratch as if we had to begin all over again. And so we drew upon um, uh, perspectives that were already known and well established. We also took care to have spiritual leaders and health experts there and educators, because we know education is part of the ongoing work, as well as people who have experience in commemoration projects. And of course, Heritage Canada was there with some of their senior staff. I want to acknowledge today the presence in your room of Sandra Richards from the uh, Department of Canadian Heritage, uh, Patrimoine Canadien. She's a senior manager in that department and she and others have been extremely positive in their um, tone and their intention to help advance this as best we can, as quickly as we can. So what I want to share with you is some of the, uh, quickly, some of the very broad conclusions, which I think are really valuable uh, guiding principles that will serve. There will need to be a call for proposals, of course. There needs to be a process for determining who will uh, design and build such a project. But we wanted there to be a number of guiding principles established. So these words were once from the workshop, that it's not just it's not a token monument, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a magnificent piece of beautiful artistic commemoration um, that, is, um, that cannot be missed, that cannot be ignored, um, and that will continue in its work, the ongoing work of remembrance, honoring, educating, healing, and reconciliation. It has to be understood that it is fundamentally a sacred space because it will hold the spirit of the children remembered um, and it needs to have long-term impact for centuries to come, not for a few years while we talk about reconciliation, but for centuries to come so that this part of our history is never forgotten or denied. Um, it must embody the reconciliation principles which we talked about throughout our TRC work and indeed which we inherited from you and others who drafted the TRC mandate 
uh, which we were given to um, and entrusted to implement. Um, we talked all along about that work as being a sacred trust and we've tried to live up to that. And so those who guided us said that it must be honest, so therefore it must in its nature reflect the pain of what has happened, but also um, recommit to a desire for the healing of individuals and relationships. Uh, I think very importantly, we articulated, and, and I hope this is never lost in the process going forward, that the monument should reflect four very distinct areas of commemoration. So the first, and it's interesting and good that we've just had acknowledgement of the veterans, we're all very well familiar with um, the gathering place and the tomb of the unknown soldier, because we know that in, in contexts of conflict and harm, not everyone comes out alive and not everyone com comes home and not everyone gets found. And we know that there will be some children who will never be found and there needs to be a place that acknowledges them and that makes it known that they are not forgotten and that we will not forget them. Uh, secondly, as a national memorial site um, for the thousands of children we do know died in the schools, those names that we are still trying to find and continue to assemble, but that work is ongoing. Um, and we know that that's at least, we know for sure it's 4,000, it may be 6,000 or more. And um, so that there needs to be a memorial site for those who died in the schools. It needs to be a remembrance site uh, for those who attended um, but passed before they ever had a chance to speak about it or be acknowledged in any way. And then fourthly, as a national honor site uh, for those who did attend and survive, and that's many of you in the room, and I want to particularly acknowledge any and all survivors in this room, because you are the ones, as we said in our report, who are the heroes of this story, and who spoke up and who have, uh, in the process, woken up the country. Um, so for those four aspects of commemoration. We also talked about uh, guiding principles being about spirit, a, a sacred, spiritual space, a uh, site of national remembrance, conscience, and reconciliation, uh, a place that allows for sacred work to be done there, both privately and um, collectively, for reflection and ceremony and action. Um, very importantly, because we know how powerful that is, to speak the names and give voice uh, to those who have been voiceless. Uh, many talked about the uh, importance of place as a place to set down the load and, and, and indeed the shame for themselves and their grandchildren, but also the shame of the country. Um, and then um, in the enduring impact is about the ongoing need to, to teach and, and to unlearn the things that we have been taught and have believed about ourselves and our country. Um, location then was underscored the call to action called for it to be in Ottawa. There was a rich conversation about that and a, and a strong consensus by the end that it should, in fact, be in Ottawa. Uh, as one person said, um, the place where the battles took place, the scene, the scene of the battle and where the laws were passed that caused such harm. And not hidden or tucked away. Um, a place of honour and prominence and visibility. Um, where both visitors to our country as well as Canadian residents can feel it. Um, and that the accessibility needs to be, of course, physical accessibility, but also visible accessibility and also practical um, accessibility so that it's not an issue that you, you, you can't get there because there's no public transportation or whatever else. So these were all things that we talked about in, in much more detail. The practical use, and I'm, I'm jumping qu quickly here, but it needs to be multi-purpose in the sense that it will be for some for individual private contemplation and some for sacred practice, um, but it will also serve and can serve um, as a place for educational um, 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 visitations so that school children, for example, as part of that ongoing work we need to create opportunity for learning that it could be a space for that. And then the large-scale public gathering and what we were thinking about there is in the way that we have National Remembrance Day, uh, you'll recall that we've also called for a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Where does that happen ceremonially on a national scale? Um, and this is not instead of um, important commemoration, gathering places or monuments that either should exist or may already exist in many of your communities. 
elsewhere in our TRC report. In fact, we talk about the need for those as well. But this is um, to be the national um, monument um, and should allow for a national ceremony um, at, the, at appropriate times as determined. About the design elements, we were very specifically not there as designers because everybody's an artist, right, in their own heads. And everybody has an idea of what it should be, where it should be, how it should be, and so on. But what we tried to really focus in on is principles of design rather than design specific. And so you can see these here, and just to talk you through, and one is repeating it, but it is sacred space. So what does that feel like in design and tone and nature? It has to be a focus on children. These were harms that happened to the children of our country. Um, it, very important that names be used to make it not a theoretical issue, but little lives lived, little children who were loved and who are not forgotten. Um, diversity of Indigenous peoples and languages. So we know that there were schools in First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities, and that needs to be captured somehow in the design. A very strong push that Indigenous principles and perspective be considered and incorporated into design elements. And you can read those just as easily as, as I can. Uh, the four elements, the four directions, um, the four parts of the medicine wheel um, for healing, and, and also, very importantly, the communal strength of Indigenous community, um, the communal nature, both as resilient people, which has contributed to resiliency, um, and uh, as people who um, support each other and welcome others, particularly as efforts continue to have identity reconfirmed uh, and affirmed, those things that are, that are so rich and vital in Indigenous community. So uh, it needs to provide historical evidence but all, and a reaffirmation of identity, but also not just as a, as, a, as a place to go, but as something to experience, to be designed in a way that creates an experience, whether that's movement or walking or the sights or smells or sounds or the interactivity with other national monuments or any of those sorts of things. Um, so just to conclude and just to let you know um, with your um, support, I hope, and, uh, and your willingness, uh, tomorrow you'll be receiving a motion um, on the floor for your consideration. And it's really uh, because the, the AFN has already endorsed all the 94 calls to action of the TRC, but this is really um, to put a boost on the federal government to understand that this is important it is not supposed to be a little small thing, therefore it needs uh, substantial funding and when resources are scarce, then we need to put our creative minds together about how to find alternative ways of funding and we, we have examples of that in our country. Um, that the, um, the work that has been done so far, which has had indigenous and survivor involvement, that that approach must continue uh, throughout the process and not just as a one-off gathering. Um, and this very importantly, and I'm sure the survivors in the room will really relate to this as well. There is urgency because as one survivor said at the end of the day, we would actually like to see this monument before we're all gone. And so uh, we know and we were told about the length of process that is normal um, in government for monuments and we really stress and I think we were well heard um, that this can't be normal. Uh, we've already waited almost five years since the calls to action were released um, and we're just at the starting gate. So we have to find ways to fast track so that we can have a celebration and a national monument that is world class and inspirational that, that the survivors of Canadian residential schools can actually look forward to visiting and, um, and being honoured by. I just uh, do want to offer an opportunity if my... Um, my, my friend and commissioner colleague wants to add any words. Chief Littlechild. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, um, it's meant to happen, I suppose, in how majestic the great spirit works because today and yesterday, we were honoring veterans who served for us in Italy. 
If you saw the news this morning, they're commemorating that campaign in Italy. And my dad was one of those who served in Italy. But what I wanted to say more than that is that we're experiencing denial already. Denial by people who say that war did not happen. The Second World War didn't happen. So it's so encouraging to be here to witness you honoring our veterans. During our hearings at the Truth Commission, we always had an empty chair beside us. Now the purpose of that empty chair was to remember the child's spirit, to invite the child's spirit to come and sit with us and listen to the most horrific, horrific stories about what happened to children. It's those stories that we cannot forget, we must remember, so that 50 years from now, no one can deny the residential school history or the residential school story didn't happen. So we wanted to honor the strength and the resilience of those children. And I think it's only appropriate that Commissioner Dr. Wilson, it was her motherly and grandmotherly instinct, I think, that brought up the idea that we must remember these children in a very honorable way. And what better way than to have a national monument? So thank you, Marie, and thank you, all of you, for doing this. I can ask him now. All right, so um, as you'll note, uh, the panel has expanded from uh, three to five, so we will uh, take our speakers here, and then following that, we will move uh, to resolutions. Um, a brief comment, Cook, Cook Ignace, microphone one. Hello, uh, Chief Ron Ignace. In uh, 2002 to 2003, the Department of Indian Affairs at that time uh, brought me on board to do consultation as to what kind of uh, commemoration that the residential school survivors would like to see. And I've often wondered uh, whatever happened to those records that we gathered. Because the first day that we, when we went into communities across the country, the first day, uh, I, I, I still um, come to tears when I think about the grief, sorrow, and pain that the people expressed of their experiences through residential school. But on the second day, there was a total flip over and they came through with the most beautiful and wonderful suggestions of how people ought to be remembered and commemorated. And I often wondered whatever happened to those records. That's all I, I ask. Thank you. Microphone two. Thank you. I'd like to say good afternoon to everybody. This discussion is very emotional. And I say that because many of our survivors across the country have left us. And many of our survivors have been forgotten within our communities. There are times our survivors across this country carry that little boy or that little girl in them. And that is why today, my friends, you see the pain and the hurt to, to our individual survivors, 
to families and to our communities. And this is something, like we said, we cannot forget. You know, we got institutions across this country, corporations across this country that are benefiting off the backs of us that got sexually and physically abused. And we as survivors in our communities, we get nothing to reconcile our differences within our families. And I reach out. And I've been doing this for 30 some years. It's like talking to the wall and not being listened to. You wonder why we have what we have in our communities. The opioid crisis, the suicides, the elder abuse. Now it's the intergenerational families that are paying the price. You know, I fully support what our two commissioners are doing. 101% I support it. We used to have a National Survivor Society in this country. After the apology was done, Mr. Harper took all our money away and done away with our groups in each and every region across this country. And that tells you that apology that he made was not sincere. One thing I request in regards as we move forward, let's have inclusion. Let's have engagement of survivors. I hear presentations and there's always saying there's survivors input, there's survivors input. And everybody asks me what's going on. I know just as much as what's going on in the communities. But what's going on sometimes at the national level, the corporate level, and it's all about survivors, and it's all about a money grab. So I reach out to our two commissioners and pat them on the back for the good work that they're, they're, they're doing. One request, us as survivors, we have to have a teardrop on this monument. Some way, somehow. Because there was many tears that dropped. And they're still dropping today. So to the commissioners, that's a request. I talked to a lot of survivors. They like to be involved in this monument. And I think the decision is already made where it's going to go at the, in, within the national capital. But it's something I guess we've got to have to live with. But it's not only for our communities to see this monument, it's for survivors to see it and also the world to see it. And what it's, what's going to happen from this monument, it's going to be called and it's going to be about truth telling of what really happened. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, the chair notes that we have three more speakers on the panel, so we'll take the comment from micro, uh, microphone one before we return to the panel. To finish following the panel, we'll turn to resolutions, picking up the order. ACM. Thank you, Harold, for, for allowing me this time. I'm really thanking you for, for your report to, to the chiefs. It's our born right, it's our right to know what's going on with, with everything. So uh, my hands go up to you. I'm also a survivor and you know, I was, I was there the, the second last year it was open and um, you know. I always try to say strongly that our recovery plan, it comes from our, our matriarchs and patriarchs. They have the gifts to offer all of us to, to move on. I always put my faith into, into my matriarchs, mm. the law carriers of our homes. But I also wanted to, to, to bring up 
some of those that are, are forgotten about. Mill On Mill Street in Chilliwack, they have a St. Mary's there. A lot of our children were sent there, but they're never recognized. But there are still our people. They still need that healing. Mm. They still need our matriarchs and patriarchs. So I'm standing here to be a voice for them. Maybe one day they'll be heard. Mm. Maybe one day they'll have that, that, that choice of healing. They'll be guided by all of our matriarchs and patriarchs and give oh. that, mm. that opportunity of healing. So Yatu Kusai, CMCIS. Thank you very much. Let us uh, let us turn our attention to the Day Scholar issue. We're joined by the Tecumla Sewepam Day Scholar Coordinator and the co-chair of the Tecumla Seychelles and James Bay Cree uh, Executive. Please help me welcome Joanne Gottfriedson. Wake to wait up here, a wheeze been an ochen at Joanne Godfordson to come loops to show up mech as a lot the postman to white, white to just uh, introduce myself in my language. And I said, I'm glad to see each and every one of you to li leave your sacred homes to be here today to work for justice and to work for healing for our people. Um, I'd like to say that there are three sister nations that are involved with the Day Scholar Class Action, which is Tkamloops de Shewepmuch, Seashell First Nations, and James, uh, the Grand Council of the Crees and James Bay. Today, um, we have some background information, and, and you see that our logo is Healing One Heart, One Mind, and One Spirit at a Time, and that's really our focus. So some of the background is that on August 25th, 2012, the class action um, was filed in federal court on behalf of day scholars who attended residential schools but not received the common experience payment. We were certified under the common experience under the loss of language and culture. Um, our day scholars attended federally owned and operated residential school. There was 136 across Canada. We were left out of the process. So on June 3rd, the federal court certified our class action um, on in three classes, which is a survivor. I'm going to skip ahead because I only have a few minutes. So a survivor is a person who attended a federally owned and operated residential school during a day and went home every night and other children lived there. It's really important for you to understand because there's a big um, difference between day schools and day scholars. So remember that the day scholars are the ones who attended the federally owned and operated residential schools during a day and went home and other children lived there. So I want to go describe what a day school is. So the descending class is a, is a child of the survivor, whether they're biologically, legally, or traditionally adopted through ceremony. Then the third class is a band class. The band class have to have day scholars, a residential school located on or near their traditional territory. And there's 136 schools that are certified in our class action. I don't have the list, but on our website, there's a list per province. So on May 24th, um, we met with uh, Minister Bennett, who agreed to appoint um, an MSR, a ministerial representative, which uh, was uh, we thought was a good move. On October 31st, 2016, after months of following the MSR and his appointment, we, we went through a memorandum of agreement and understanding and to settle our class action in a timely fashion. As you can see, that timely fashion is still going. So where are we now? We are. We, after um, 12 meetings with MSR on January 20 to 2017 to the 18th, 
we agreed to um, go to court. The class action were, was in the settlement conference management and staged with the assistance of the federal court and this process is complete. No decision made. We now we are now in the process of documentation and preparation of court and that's a very that's a huge uh, responsibility for our communities to undertake because we again have to prove that the children need justice. So presently, whoops, this thing ain't working. Oh, how do we go back? Talking fast doesn't help. So presently, uh, we're going to federal court. The date is um, 2021. Um, and we are again in, involved in preparation of documentation. I've already discussed with you what the survivors are and who they are. Um, and we want the same treatment. And it's, the, I stated that this morning, um, that you know the, the day scholars should have been involved in that first settlement and we were not. We we're excluded. So we want the excluded to be included with the same treatment of the 10 plus three. And I know that they're, they're wrapping their minds around of, of uh, what does a band class mean and the survivor class. And I think it's the same, that, you know, when we look at the descendant class, the, the compensation would be the same manner because they deserve every opportunity to learn our language, to be active in our culture, to know who they are and to love themselves and to have that spirit of wellness. That's what it's all about is, taking that young child and bringing it to adulthood and elderhood, knowing that they deserve justice and that they deserve the opportunity to heal from those impacts. Because day scholars didn't sleep there, did not mean that we were free or from all those horrendous activities that we're, so we were subjected to. And needless to say, you know, not only are our survivors passing away at alarming rates, our descendants are too. In our community alone, in the last week, we've, we've lost two, just this week. So the band class, the priorities there are for the protection of our language and culture. That is extremely important to us. If you know your language, you know your culture, you know who you are. We also want to look at community wellness and what does that mean? It means that in every aspect, whether it's emotionally, physically, mentally, or physically, we want to be well. Whatever it takes to help our people rise forward and, and to live a good, healthy life, we deserve that. We want to create a trust and use interest to address issues that are defined by those 105 bands that opted in. Projects will be determined by the community to address their specific needs. And this is really important, you know, like some of the background that Kamloops and Seashelt were the ones who launched this day scholar class action. And in 2005 the, or 2010, James Bay came on board with us. So those are the three executive members. They have three from each nation and we have um, Selena August here from Seashalt and we have uh, Kukpi Roseanne and uh, Councillor Jeanette Jules and um, Dr. Matthew Kuhncom sends his regrets. And we also have a, a powerhouse legal team. And I just want to mention that it's those three bands that mothered all the costs for this litigation, and we're moving it forward. So what can you do as a nation to assist us? We encourage you, each nation, to send letters in support to the Mr. Minister of Justice and Indigenous Affairs that will promote a fair and just settlement for the day scholars, their descendants, and 105 bands adopted in. 
We encourage each nation to keep your memberships informed and make, make sure that they know the difference. Every day, I kid you not, I have 100 phone calls. When am I gonna get my check? It's not there, and they're getting it both confused about the day school and day scholars. Encourage your community to, we do send press releases to all the bands across Canada. We, we thank AFN for, we send that to them and they send it all to each and every one of you. And um, so we just want you to share that and make your community aware. Talk to your local MPs and people in your community that can help us advance this. Um, so we also, um, and we kindly request your nation to lobby for the advan advancement of our sacred language and culture. Um, you, there, my contact information, I am the, actually the chair and the coordinator of the Day Scholar Class Action, um, and we prepared motions that uh, for the national chief and regional chief, uh, Norman came to uh, listen to what we wanted to, to share and ask them to advance our positions. And we also want to say that the day scholar executive want to be very active in any discussions or decisions that affect the day scholar class action. On behalf of, of our executive and our, our three nations, Seashell, Kamloops, Dishwapmek, and the Grand Council of the Crees, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you very much uh, for that, Joanne, uh, both for the inf information and for your work and for being precisely 10 minutes. Uh, we will now turn, as you see, we're joined by Margaret Swan, who's with the Southern Chiefs Organization in Manitoba and is a proxy in our meeting this week. And she'll be speaking to the day schools issue and to the McLean uh, class action, which of course is named for our, our dear friend. Here, please help me welcome Margaret. Thank you very much. Miigwech. When in my PowerPoint, this is my PowerPoint. <laughs> my name is, well, Kichi. Shpigishi Gubineshi Indish Nikas. Kichi Miigwech Ndana Manitouk Shkituan Yaini Namanu Ngom Jibayayan. Miigwech Manitou. Tago Miigwech Kinagitin Nenem Amanu Ngom Gaayayik. Nimene Nda Manish Nabek Shkituat. Chigigitu Tamaz Wat Tago Eni Chinaga Chituat Ani Nege Jiji Chigiot. My English name is Margaret Swan. I am a member of this, the McLean Federal Indian Day School class action lawsuit that began in Manitoba in 2009 with Gary McLean taking the lead. He was from Lake Manitoba Treaty 2 First Nation. Gary is no longer with us. Um, it's emotional talking about Gary because Gary was like my brother. We grew up in the same home, same community, and he fought hard to get this process moving forward. And it took us 10 years, 10 years of lobbying and doing all kinds of things behind the scenes. I don't know if you've seen me today running around lobbying chiefs getting a resolution to this forum that will be looked at afterwards to help us with this process. So in 2016, this lawsuit became a federal class action lawsuit. Gary McLean found lawyers who were willing to step up to the plate and help us move forward. We had a really hard time finding lawyers. So in 2019, the federal court approved a settlement. There was announce, an announcement made here in Ottawa. I was part of that. Gary McLean, unfortunately, went on to greener pastures and could not be here. And Gary, I know you're with us tonight, today. Um, and as we moved forward, there was hearings in Winnipeg, Manitoba in May. I was really disappointed in those hearings because of the fact that there were lawyers 
that came out of the woodwork deciding that they were going to be part of this lawsuit because there was now an announcement that big bucks were involved. And I also just want to point out, there is no amount of money that will pay for the damage that was done to our people. And I say that very loudly. So for those of us that are involved in this lawsuit, it's more about what the chief from Saskatchewan, Chief Ted, just said. It's about the healing, the healing we need for our children, our families. The addictions crisis is so terrible right now. And one of the things we keep telling our law firm that helped us move this forward is you need to make sure that when our people are filling out these application forms, these claim forms, our people need grassroots support right at the ground level to help us because we need healing. This could be a start to helping us our children, our families, so we don't have to continue to fight the horrors from the damage of these damn schools. So we are asking for your support with this resolution. What's blocking us right now is there is a chief, and respectfully, Chief Ottawa, I wish you were here today so I could meet you. This has been a long, outstanding battle. Chief Ottawa, you have a lawyer, Mr. Schultz, who's working with you. You are blocking this from moving forward. Please, I ask you to stop your process and allow us to move forward. There are about 140,000 class members across this country that are waiting for their settlement. Some are dying and they're struggling. They're asking for our support to move this forward. So let's just get it done and continue to work to heal our children and families so we could raise better leaders in the future. And I'm not saying this isn't good, it's great. I've been out of the loop for 10 years almost. And I'm happy when I see the progress that's been made, but we, I know we can do so much better. We can have one of our own become prime minister of this country. I want to see that before my lifetime. Chimiwetch. Yeah. Thank you very much, Margaret. I'll make a motion to nominate Margaret Swan for Prime Minister. <laughs> Declared unanimous. Thank you very much for that. So to wrap up this panel, we will turn to Regional Chief Yakalaila uh, to uh, continue the conversation on day schools. Masi uh, Harold, Masi Dr. Wilson, Chief Willie Littlechild, Joanne, and Margaret. As you have heard, the impacts of the residential schools and the policies, and as regional port for holder holder for the residential schools. We are just touching the tip of the iceberg. And so we turn to our elders again to for guidance and prayers and to heal our spirit and our families. And because it's very emotional, it's very powerful for us who are you experience the residential schools, day schools, and all that has gone on with the policy the federal government has forcefully put
to the Aboriginal people. However, we are going to rewrite our future in the help of you, the young people, and the elders, not to help us deal with our painful issues in life and see the good that God has given us and as Indigenous people. And so I want to thank these speakers up here, and we look forward to your support in your communities and that we move beyond the impacts of the residential schools and that there will be one day that we can stand still together as a people. And so, thank you, National Chief, for your support in this file on the residential schools. And thank you, leaders, elders, and healers. We know where you've been. We know where we can go. Masi cho. Masi. Thank you very much, Chiefs, and thank you very much, uh, Regional Chief, and to the panel. Um, I will call the Resolutions Committee uh, representatives forward and ask my co-chairs to get ready for that process. As we're doing that, I'm pleased to let you know that, uh, and to let Chief uh, Jason Henry of Kettle and Stony Point First Nations know that in support of the family of Isaac Henry, you have raised $3,516. Thank you very much for that panel and Harold. I'd like to turn the delegation's attention, draft resolution number six. Draft resolution number six. Call for emergency operations management planning in First Nations. Moved by Chief Cornell McLean. Chief McLean, are you in the room? Chief McLean, Chief Cornell McLean, Lake Manitoba First Nation. Is there somebody prepared to move? Chief Shining Turtle. All right, Chief Shining Turtle is the mover. Seconded by Chief David Travers, Kananji Ashtagon. Chief Travers, are you in the room? Chief Travers, is there a seconder on this? Chief Christensen. Thank you. Chief Christen. Sorry. We have a mover, we have a seconder. Draft resolution number six. Therefore, be it resolved that the Chiefs in Assembly 1 call upon the Assembly of First Nations to engage with. Canadian Safety and Security Program and Indigenous Services Canada to support the development of partnerships with First Nations to provide permanent, reliable, appropriate funding and resources to ensure coordinated response to natural disaster emergency management issues affecting First Nations. Two, direct the AFN to advocate for ongoing permanent training programs in emergency operations management, which will focus on awareness, preparedness, response, and recovery with the full intent to be community-based, community designed, community developed, community driven, and community managed that will be nationally and regionally coordinated across Canada. Three, call upon federal, provincial, and municipal emergency management agencies to A, adequately and effi efficiently respond to opportunities to provide mutual aid for First Nations in a manner that will resolve issues pertaining to emergencies and B, ensure that an emergency management training program is culturally and geographically appropriate for First Nations. Is there any need for discussion on this resolution? 
Seeing none, I will ask if there is any opposition to this resolution, draft number six. Seeing no opposition, is there any abstentions to this resolution? Seeing none, resolution is adopted by unanimous consent. Thank you very much. Bonjour. Alors, on continue en français. Continue Donc, euh, chef so, et mandataire, j'aimerais maintenant attirer votre attention so sur le projet de résolution numéro 7. Draft resolution seven. number 7. Draft resolution number 7. Numéro 7. Le titre est Soutien au projet d'institut de formation en gestion des urgences des Premières Nations. Donc, c'est un projet de résolution management. qui concerne la gestion This des urgences. Il a été emergency. proposé par It chef McLean, Carnell McLean, et coproposé par chef Stanley Greer. Désolé si je n'ai pas la bonne prononciation. Sorry if I don't pronounce Donc, est-ce que right. le proposeur et le coproposeur is sont dans the, la salle? Mover and seconder, are you there? Are you present in the, in the room? No. Is there? Okay, we have a mover here. Chief Turtle. Shiny Turtle. Shiny Turtle. Shiny. I'm sorry. It's not disres disrespectful. <laughs> sorry. No, so, um, someone want to uh, second? Yes. Your name, please. Chief McNaught. <laughs> Thank you. So, we're, uh, nous allons aller directement à la section. Il est résolu Go. que main sec, the main decision of the Therefore draft resolution, resolved. and I'm going to read it in French. Je vais lire en français. Alors, c'est à l'écran. So Pour ces motifs, les chefs en Therefore, assemblée appuient la création d'un institut de formation en gestion des urgences des Premières Nations, qui sera axé sur la préparation des Premières Nations pour les catastrophes d'origine naturelle et humaine. Et humaine, 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 humaine. Two, direct the Assembly of First Nations to seek funding support from the Government of Canada to realize the creation of a First Nations Training Institute on Emergency Management that will benefit First Nations citizens and their communities. So the project was proposed and seconded and was read before the Assembly. Are there any comments? on this specific draft resolution number seven. No. Donc, is there a need for discussion on this specific uh, mi microphone uh, number one, please? Yeah, uh, the way this uh, resolution is drafted, I don't think I can support it. Uh, it says here that uh, direct the Assembly of First Nations to seek funding uh, support from the Government of Canada to realize the creation of a First Nations Training Institute on Emergency Management that will benefit First Nations citizens and their communities. I, I think that this, if there's this resolution uh, seeking my support, it's, uh, it should say it should be a <coughs> First Nations driven, uh, First Nations based, uh, nation based and community driven. That's, uh, that's how, because we as a Sweep Nation could utilize such a training institute amongst within our nation, driven by our communities. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm now going to ask mover and seconder if, if they are okay with the, this uh, proposed amendment. Mover and seconder, are you okay with the, so the change is uh, related to number two. And uh, so direct the, the Assembly of First Nations to seek funding support from, the ca from Canada to, re to realize the creation of a First Nations Training Institute on Emergency Management that will benefit First Nations based and communities driven. Nations based, nation based and communities driven. driven. Nation based and community driven. Nation based and community driven. Mover, are you okay? You're okay? And seconder also? He's good. You're good. Okay, thank you. So the proposed amendment is uh, accepted.
Is there a need for any further discussion? Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres commentaires, réactions, questions avant que l'on passe au vote? Je ne vois personne. Donc, le, nous allons donc so passer au vote. Est-ce que quelqu'un s'oppose au projet de résolution numéro 7? Against... Any opposition? Seeing none. Yeah. Est-ce qu'il y a des abstentions? Are there any, any abstentions? abstentions? Seeing none. No. Donc, avec votre permission, chef et mandataire, With, je annonce donc uh, que la résolution, le projet de résolution numéro 7 est adopté par consensus. Merci. Is adopted unanimously. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Wina. Thank you very yes. much, Chiefs and Proxies. Uh, let us turn our attention to Draft Resolution 12, the federal legislation to create a framework for the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The mover, Chief Ronald Ignace, Cook B. Ignace from Skeetchison, is present in the Assembly. The original seconder, Chief Matthew Todd Pigan from Pasqua, uh, First Nation, Saskatchewan, not available. And so Cook B. Christian, uh, Wayne Christian from Splatson uh, will second that uh, for us. Uh, I'll read it into the record. Therefore, be it resolved that the Chiefs in Assembly seek a collaborative process with the federal government consistent with the Liberal Party of Canada's commitment during the 43rd federal election, whereby they promise that they will, quote, will move forward with introducing co-developed legislation to implement the declaration as government legislation by the end of 2020. In this work, we being the Liberal Party, will ensure that this uh, legislation fully respects the intent of the declaration and establishes Bill C-262 as the floor rather than the ceiling when it comes to drafting this new legislation. As a point of clarification, that is further rewording and giving further detail to the original uh, therefore be it resolved one that you had in your package, and then to call upon the Government of Canada to develop with First Nations a national action plan uh, to implement the UN Declaration, which is consistent, which was already there. I understand that uh, we are expecting some friendly amendments uh, from the floor. They have been turned into the Resolutions Committee, but to ensure that the Chiefs and Proxies are aware of those, um, what they are voting on and those proposed amendments, we look to the mover uh, to speak to the resolution. Microphone one, please. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Gukbi Ronigny Skichisten. This is a great honor for me to move such a resolution as this, as our Nsikapmach and Nsikilch and Sewapm chiefs sat before, invited, and had Sir Wilfer Laurier, the Prime Minister of Canada, come to Kamloops and sit before him. And they speak, spoke to him that it is time that we come to a resolution so that we can have a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Canada. And that they said that we want to be, if you want to be friends with us, we're prepared to be brothers with you. And that uh, we will work together to build a country that is great and good. It is a profound uh, document, the Sir Wilfrid Laurier Memorial of 1910. If anyone wants to Google it, they'll know what I'm talking about here. And it is with great pleasure. Maybe they said that we have, uh, we want these people, we want these people, we're waiting for them to reciprocate the, the help and the goodness that we gave them when they first came here and offered them life and sustenance. And it's been 109 years that we've been waiting for that reciprocal relationship to come back to us. And now ho hopefully we're moving in that direction. And yes, I do have a couple of friendly uh, amendments that I would like to uh, propose uh, on the resolution. It's, uh, <coughs> I guess it would be uh, the E, the, the, it would be an F after the E so on, the, on the whereas is. Uh, a, B, C, D, E, F. And I would read, I think that would be good to acknowledge what the province of British Columbia has done. That we put in here, uh, whereas on November 28, 2019, the province of British Columbia has passed Bill 41, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, to enshrine the UN Declaration into provincial law. So we wanted, that's one friendly amendment that we'd like to add in there to honor and recognize BC for what they've done. The other one is that uh, in the therefore be resolved, number two, call upon the Government of Canada to develop with First Nations a national action plan to implement UN declaration carrying on mindful of the other 
UN instruments upholding indigenous rights, such as the Declaration of Human Rights and International Human Rights Law, as well as we've got to be remember that the OAS Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, so that action plan has to be mindful of those other international instruments that would be, that recognize us who we are. This I think would strengthen this document. Other than that, I so gladly and proudly move okay. this resolution. Uh, great, Chief. Could I grab your paper just so we have the language there? <laughs> All right, so uh, amended, of course, by the mover and seconder to add a new, therefore be it resolved, just to acknowledge the BC process, and then adding at number two, uh, just extending that to be mindful of the other UN instruments upholding Indigenous rights, such as the Declaration of Human Rights and the International Human Rights, as well as the OAS, the Organization of American States Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and you'll recall Chief Simon had urged us to take that approach earlier. International Human Rights Law. It's International Human Rights Law, thank you. All right, so as amended, is there a need for further discussion of draft resolution 12 on the UN Declaration legislation, federal legislation? Seeing none, may I call a question? Are there, is there any opposition to draft resolution 12 as amended uh, in the assembly? Seeing none, are there any abstentions? Seeing none, then movers and seconder. Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to turn your attention to draft resolution number 13. New process for negotiation and implementation of international treaties. Draft resolution number 13. Mover, Chief Dean Sayers. Chief Sayers, thank you. Seconded by Henry Lewis. Henry Lewis, are you in the room? Yes, thank you. We have a mover, we have a seconder. Draft resolution 13, new process for negotiation and implementation of international treaties. Therefore, be it resolved that the Chiefs and Assembly 1 call on the Assembly of First Nations to support First Nations in developing their own nation building processes as well as new First Nations led models for negotiation with the Crown in right of Canada that do not necessitate the loss of Indigenous rights or the domestication of international treaties. Two, call on the AFN to inform the Government of Canada of the need for a system of negotiation other than the modern treaty process as outlined by federal policy and legislation. Three, Call on the AFN to advocate for a meeting with representatives of the Government of Canada and First Nations seeking to implement their international treaties and find an alternative to the modern treaty process. Four, call on the AFN to advocate for First Nations international treaty representative appointed by a chiefs in assembly to sit on the Privy Council to ensure cabinet meetings meets the obligations of the treaty relationship this representative will be accountable and report to the Chiefs and Assembly of the AFN. Five, call on the AFN and the Government of Canada to ensure the Governor General upholds their original role to guarantee that no legislation is passed unless it supports Canada's international treaty obligations with First Nations. I'm sorry to interrupt you. So I have just been informed that there was a, a complete revision of draft <laughs> resolution number 13. I will now read the brand new draft resolution 13 moved and seconded um, 
into the record. So please forget what I just said on the, <laughs> the first one. Strike the record. Strike the record. Therefore, be it resolved that the Chiefs and Assembly, one, direct the Government of Canada to meet it, to meet in a coalition, coalition of nations as identified by, his, by historic and numbered Treaty First Nations to establish principles for negotiation and implement their international treaties. Two, direct the Government of Canada to engage with models of negotiation that do not necessitate the loss of indigenous rights or the domestication of international treaties. Three, direct the Government of Canada to take whatever steps necessary to meet their treaty obligations. Four, direct the Government of Canada to establish a mechanism for the Governor General to uphold their original role to guarantee that there is no legislation, that no legislation is passed unless to support Canada's international treaty obligation with First Nations. Five, direct the Government of Canada to support First Nations in developing their own nation building processing processes. Six, a letter will be sent by the mover and seconder of this resolution to the Government of Canada to secure a meeting to discuss the Crown's treaty obligations and implementation of international treaties. Seven, a letter will be sent to each of the treaty areas by the mover and seconder to establish a coalition of nations to identify representatives to prepare for future meetings with the Government of Canada. Any comments from the mover? Comments from the seconder? Microphone number one, please. Miigwech, thank you. Uh, Chief Dean Sayers, Batchelana First Nation here in Ontario. Um, thank you for uh, reading into the record uh, those therefore be it resolved. And I, and I believe it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, with our relationship basically uh, going unresolved as far as implementation of the original expectations are concerned, we see value in putting forward an opportunity to collectively address the outstanding as it pertains to the, re the relationship from a treaty perspective. And um, we, we do find some value in the actual rights holders taking a larger role. And I think it's, it's fairly self-explanatory. I'm understanding that there might be a couple of amendments that may be up for consideration. And, and uh, on the most part, um, I'm, I'm open to that, and I believe the seconder is as well. I just wanted to just relay somewhat of an intention. Like, uh, we, we, are, we have a treaty with Canada. We aren't Canadian. We cannot allow our relationship to fall under the guise of Canada as a domesticated treaty. We need to be strong and call the task in the international eyes Canada's inherent obligation to fulfill those obligations that were set out when they became a country and even their subsequent relationships that they have uh, entered into as far as the honor of the crown is concerned. So we are, we are very serious about how we move forward and Canada needs to uh, rise to the bar that we set as the original governments on these lands. Miigwech. Thank you, Chief Sayers. Okay, Lewis, microphone number two, please. Yeah, for, <coughs> first of all, I address the assembly with gratitude, my gratitude. You know, I was happy to second the motion because we need to create awareness from my po point of view that we are still sovereign nations. And our treaties are international and that's got to be brought to the forefront. That's why I was happy to second the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone number one, please. Appreciate it. Um, I'm glad to hear a little bit more talk about international uh, commitments from the governments. Uh, uh, and uh, I was looking at, at the resolution and I thought maybe to strengthen it, make reference to the Vienna Convention. I believe it was 1967 that recognizes uh, uh, types of treaties, even uh, the exchange of certain items which have the intent to bind both parties are, con are constituted as a valid treaty. It doesn't necessarily have to be written. So we look back at the, uh, what my nation, the Mohawk Nation, exchanging wampum belts. It may not have been a written contract, but the exchange of that, uh, of that item had the intent to bind both 
uh, sovereign uh, sovereign states. So Vienna Convention, 1967, uh, I think would be a good idea to put in there. Now we'll go. So do you have a specific place to uh, insert the words uh, respecting or, or looking at uh, the Vienna Convention? Uh, no, I really didn't get a chance to see the entire uh, uh, the entire resolution, <coughs> but uh, I'm sure the technicians could find the right place. I think uh, maybe at the beginning of the resolution, making reference to the to the Vienna Convention on uh, on treaties. Yeah. Mover and, and seconder, are are you okay with uh, with that? Okay, we the technicians will find um, the appropriate language. Um, to insert into the therefore be it resolved. Um, microphone number one, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Gordon Peters, uh, proxy for uh, El Napawi La Kiwi. Uh, I just wanted to uh, come and support this resolution, but uh, talk about it in the context of uh, where we're at and what, what's happening with us right now. Uh, because uh, when we see where we're at right now, we're, we, we've been uh, We've been arguing and we've been putting up presentations uh, in this assembly for a while talking about our political relations with this government. We are not in a political relationship with this government right now. We are in a legal, uh, legal relationship and it's legal reconciliation process that's going on. And as long as we continue the legal reconciliation, uh, we're in a really tough process to be able to deal with because uh, Canada, Canada Section 35. If you want to deal with that process in the context of uh, common, uh, of common uh, 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 law, then what you're what you're faced with all the time is, is is Canada's full sovereignty. Canada claims sovereignty over everything, and so we we have to be able to move beyond that, and we have to start talking about our treaties in the context of being international. So. We got to get out of the legal straitjacket that we're in, and we got to get back onto the trail of uh, of talking about uh, who we are before uh, any of these other people start to occupy our lands and put their legal systems in place. And it's pretty ironic that we have a conflict of uh, uh, I shouldn't say a conflict. Uh, we have disparaging uh, words this morning uh, from uh, two crowned ministers. Uh, Minister Bennett uh, should be that representative from the Crown to deal with international treaties. But, uh, but when you hear her talking about self-determination, you hear her talking about jurisdiction and everything, she, she quotes in there at the end, she says right in there, all oh, that's in the context of, of Section 35. Then you have Minister of Justice Lametti come here and what does he talk about? He starts talking about the need to have uh, a recognition of our legal orders that are able to, to sit beside Canada's legal orders. So the two of them are in conflict. We have, a, if the justice minister wants to begin to talk about that dialogue, then that's where our treaties fit in that same context because that's the same relationship it creates so that we can have our own legal uh, orders and our own processes because uh, we, go through the, we go through the Canadian courts, Canadian courts don't look at ours. They don't look at ours and say, uh, what, is our, what, are, what are the uh, legal systems of the Anishinaabek or the Anishinaabe or, the, or anybody? They take that from a Canadian context only and they apply it to us. And so getting back into these discussions is a big, huge area for us and I think it's worthy of support. Thank you. Microphone number two, please. Good afternoon, uh, Chief Greg Desjardins, Frog Lake First Nation, Alberta. I just wanted to make uh, an amendment in the whereas, see? Um, I wanted to strike out the, uh, the Canadian government has at uh, no point been able to provide proof that up to there and then uh, so it would start at First Nations have never because just because we don't want to give them the ability to, to intervene so sorry which uh, section whereas C we didn't get a chance to see it up there but where you want to amend the whereas portion of this resolution well, we wanted to uh, strike out uh, that part and then put uh, First Nations have never expressively. Mover and seconder, are you okay with that uh, striking? Can you read it uh, again, whereas C? Um, the, the, the Canadian government 
has at no point been able to provide proof that strike out that up up to up to that and then then we'd add the first nations have never expressively microphone one thank you for the um, opportunity to give consideration my understanding is that actual clause that language came from a UN special study on treaties and we're just cutting and pasting that and and, and I'm not, I'd, I'd prefer that we maintain that okay Chief Lewis. is that um, so there was a an amendment requested on the whereas portion which uh, is not typically read into the record because it's not necessarily an action item on the therefore be it resolved section of resolutions um, that uh, friendly amendment was uh, subsequently denied by the mover uh, because it was uh, a portion from an international document uh, from from what I understand um, so seeing no other uh, um, comments on this resolution that was read into the record um, I, I hear a question being called uh, uh, microphone number two please thank you mr. chair Cheryl Kazmir uh, proxy for Takla First Nation British Columbia um, just a couple of things uh, I'm not familiar with uh, resolutions coming forward that the mover and seconder took on the responsibility of crafting or drafting letters that would be coming out under the umbrella of the assembly. And so I'm just a bit concerned that um, if they're going to be responsible for sending letters out to treaty areas, um, what resourcing is available to ensure that all treaty areas are, are captured. Um, I'm raising this because in terms of historic treaties in British Columbia, the Douglas treaties exist. And we don't have representation here at this meeting, I don't believe. We were just checking to see if there was anybody from um, the South Island being represented. And um, in that instance, we would want to make sure that, you know, that they were contacted to be a part of this, um, if this is to move forward. So a little bit of concern about six and seven. I think that um, I'd feel a bit more confident if uh, letters that were to be drafted out to the government as well as to inv inviting treaty groups that it would be come come from the um, AFN office. Okay. Um, microphone number one for the mover. And I, thank you. And I'm not sure I'm hearing any, I guess, change in language within the actual proposed resolution. I'm hearing there maybe is some gaps, but I'm not sure how we would reference that in here uh, unless there's something specific that maybe would be given consideration but from when we talked about this from the design of the resolution we were looking at the role of the AFN and in this particular instance the role of the rights holders from a treaty perspective and of course we would love to see some support uh, some facilitation, maybe sharing some uh, contacts, but I'm seeing a parallel process that would have the blessing of the Assembly of First Nations as far as how we evolve with how we perceive as the rights holders are concerned and the evolution of, of this type of fulfillment of obligations types of process. So that's how this was envisioned. So it's, it's intentionally being drafted by the treaty rights holders, the treaties, and we are, this is the introductory type of a resolution. We are creating a framework and we will fill in all of the subsequent areas that need to have some attention so that we can make um, movement and have uh, markers and milestones as far as how we get to where we need to be because we recognize that there isn't the pace that we would like to see as far as the the relationship is concerned with the uh, inherent right uh, that Canada has inherited as far as the fulfillment of treaties are concerned. Thank you. The, the way I understand um, the, the comments from uh, Kazmir is, is 
they want, um, it's maybe unconventional that the uh, assembly passes a resolution um, basically directing uh, the mover and seconder to do uh, X, Y, or Z. Uh, it, it's unconventional. I think that's what uh, Kazmir was raising and um, looking for, I think, language maybe to have some sort of support role from the AFN. Um, I think that's what uh, she was saying and she's agreeing with what I'm reiterating. So um, I, I don't know where that fits in the in the motion. Um, in, um, but I mean, if there isn't uh, agreement from the mover uh, or seconder to, to change uh, or amend the the resolution, then we will we will move on from that. Um, but but the um, I guess the concern is, is noted. Um, microphone one, please. Yeah. Um, thank you. We we have taken on those obligations of uh, drafting these correspondence. Uh, uh, we do can see a role. We could maybe. Uh, incorporate a clause that um, recognizes that there would be a cooperative role that would be extended on the part of the Assembly of First Nations, um, uh, but um, a supportive role that, that would suffice, I think, uh, if that would help. Uh, we, I think we do need to come up with outside of the box kinds of concepts, outside of the box kinds of thinking uh, to move the yardstick. I think this is something that Maybe as we evolve, as we step out of the Indian, as we look at uh, restructuring of some of our uh, organizations, as we look at our, our, uh, our future with uh, our rights and our relationship with uh, the, the governments on these lands, the new governments, um, we have to come up with new approaches. And I think this is one of those instances. And I think, I think the assembly would support this type of an approach. And, uh, and, and so we could incorporate that particular, I believe, uh, Clause that would recognize some support be extended by uh, the AFN. So, um, if, if, I, if I may, uh, on, on number six, uh, after seconder, there would be a comma. Um, a letter will be sent by the mover and seconder, comma, assisted by um, the assembly or the AFN, um, and then continue on. Um, and, and the same. So. Casimir, on uh, microphone number two, is that, uh, am, I, am I out of order? Uh, yeah, microphone number two, please. Uh, thank you. I just, um, if I could propose um, friendly amendments to six and seven, um, it could say to direct the AFN to work with the mover and the seconder of this resolution to prepare, um, or sorry, Mover and seconder of this resolution to the to prepare a letter to the government of Canada to secure a meeting, and carry on with the rest of it. And then number seven would be direct the AFN to send a letter um, to treaty areas um, to establish a coalition. It could also read direct AFN to work with the mover and the seconder again in number seven if if that works out better. If that works better. So there was okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I looked to the. The mover, um, there was a couple of friendly amendments suggested. Um, on microphone one. Thank you. Close, but we, we want to maintain the control, so maybe we could reference that the control will be maintained by the mover and the seconder with the assistance as per your proposed language. Microphone two. Well, my concern is um, it's not so much about um, control issue. It's more about making sure that all nations, treaty nations, whether they're number treaties, historic treaties, or whatever the case may be, that could be eligible or to be a part of this coalition and a part of this process be captured. And our, our concern is that if it's left um, outside the hands of the organization that has um, those resources readily available to themselves, um, then we may be missing out some groups. 
And so that's why we're proposing that we add language to direct the AFN to work with the mover and the seconder in crafting the letter to the government in number six, and the same as in number seven, direct the AFN to work with the mover and the seconder to reach out to treaty areas. Microphone one. Thank you. Uh, yeah, very close to what, uh, and I've got some <laughs> of the, the historical minds that are sharing with me some insight as far as how we can maybe language or provide some uh, uh, terminology here, but maybe similar, the AFN, as a number eight possibly, the AFN will lobby and coordinate it and coordinate as requested. That way we won't miss anybody. Everybody will still be and we'll use the assistance of the AFN to make sure that we don't miss any treaty groups. So number, there, a new number eight or a number eight will yeah. read? Um, that the AFN will lobby and coordinate as requested. Direct that the AFN will lobby and coordinate as requested. Direct that the AFN will lobby and coordinate as requested yes. to ensure that um, no treaty group is left out. Sure. That is that okay? Uh, move. Okay. Move them on. You're okay. Microphone number two. It's okay with me, but uh, I have a maybe it's appropriate time to address this. Chief Deputy from Frog Lake had stated that there is no room here for treaties at all, and I tend to agree with him. So I turned to AFN to provide a table to, to the number of treaties so that we can be heard. Yeah. You know, a lot of these things can be addressed through, through that process. These are my comments. Thank you for that, um, Chief. Um, the question has been called. Um, the Vienna Convention, we're going to place it in the way. So the the resolution was was stick stick handled and and there was a accommodation made by the mover and seconder. Uh, I, I think uh, Proxy Casimir is is okay with was, um, with with the uh, amendments that were made. It was read in. We we had a thorough discussion on it. Um, so I will now go to a vote um, and. and I will ask if there are any opposed to this resolution. Are there any abstentions from this resolution? Chief Miracle, Staines, no more abstentions. Thank you very much. Resolution is carried. Thank you very much, uh, Chiefs and Proxies. I'll ask you to turn your attention to draft resolution nine, as, and that has been uh, changed and just circulated on the floor. I do want to remind the speakers when they come to the mic, just for the record and for the resolutions committee, to again, always introduce and name your community, just as a matter of practice. And just before we do that. This is the wording for number 12. Thank you. Let me get back to my number nine here. So, uh, reaffirming uh, draft resolution nine, reaffirming First Nations regional implementation priorities for an act respecting First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children, youth, and families, moved by Chief Reginald Belrose. Chief Belrose, are you still in the assembly? Thank you very much. And we have a new seconder. I think, believe we are being seconded by Alvin Francis from Nikoni uh, First Nation. Uh, Chief Francis, thank you very much. So the mover and seconder being present. You will note uh, on this that there are some uh, amendments. They will be in red, and those are the ones that were circulated for you. Um, just by way of introduction to it before I read it, and it's a bit long. 
is that number one is uh, as you have it. Number t number two is modified to give a specific example uh, to the uh, Saskatchewan process. Uh, number three is modified to give a little bit more detailed uh, to that, and it's kind of reframed and edited. And then number four is uh, stays as is, as you will see. So let us then turn to the resolution. Therefore, be it resolved that the Chiefs and Assembly call on Canada to immediate, immediately collaborate and fund discussions and negotiations directly to First Nations and regional bodies as determined by rights holders, such as regional organizations, tribal councils, treaty organizations, and independent First Nations, and without the interference of provinces and territories, to establish a political pathway to implement an act respecting First Nations, Inuit and Métis children, youth and families, the act. Consistent with the principles set out in the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal 2016 orders of substantive quality, best interest of the child, needs-based funding, respect for culture and language, and consideration of the distinct circumstances of First Nations children and services. Two, call on Canada to immediately support and fund a First Nations-led distinctions-based transition and implementation planning process, including the following regional process for Saskatchewan. A. Under the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, FSIN, a Transition and Implementation Committee for Self-Determination in Children and Families, TIC, comprised of representatives of tribal councils, Indian Child and Family Services Agencies, the FSIN Technical Advisor Group, and independent First Nations children, families, and First Nations. The TIC would provide direction on an effective and comprehensive Saskatchewan political pathway for implementation of the Act, based on acknowledgement and respecting the proper rights holders and the task of rebuilding First Nations. The work of the TIC, the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, the Technical Advisor Group and the Chiefs Political Task Force on Child Welfare must include a strategic advocacy effort for all Saskatchewan First Nations to identify and develop options in relation to the following critical items. A or I. <laughs> A foundational document setting out the distinct legal and political roles of, First Na of the First Nations as rights holders, tribal councils, Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, and Indian Child and Family Services Agencies in relation to the exercise of inherent jurisdiction, administration, and dispute resolution on the subject of First Nations children, youth, and families, focusing on them as rights holders. Two, clear authority to ground the work at the provincial and regional levels that support Saskatchewan Treaty and First Nations in the assertion of sovereignty, self-determination, and respect for the decisions of First Nations and tribal councils as governing bodies for their people. Three, an approach that clearly identifies where or how regional bodies may be helpful for advocacy or technical support at the regional and provincial levels and how those mandates should be created by and accountable to chiefs of Saskatchewan without entrenching the approaches that involve delegated provincial authority and the status quo. Four, ensure the human rights and treaty rights of Saskatchewan First Nations children and families are at the forefront of decision making. There is no distinction between on and off reserve systems and when necessary, and that the Saskatchewan First Nations can do family unifications work anywhere in Canada where their children reside, dealing with clear mandates for interprovincial agreements. And five, ensure that the federal and provincial response implementing the act is developed based on the priorities and authority resting with the chiefs and tribal councils in Saskatchewan recognized and affirmed by the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Three, call on Canada to immediately support and provide long-term sustainable statutory funding and resources to First Nations rights holders, including capital and infrastructure, to those First Nations who are ready to move forward on planning and or implementation of the Act without delay or interference from regional or national processes or tables, and four, call on Canada to commit to providing funding for implementing the Act in Federal Budget 2020. Is there a need for discussion of the resolution as amended or as presented with the amendments? Seeing none, let us move to the question. Is there any objection to re draft resolution nine as presented with the changes? Seeing none, are there any abstentions? 
Gord Peters, Proxy Gord Peters, Grand Chief, thank you very much. Therefore, draft resolution nine is adopted by consensus of the remainder. Thank you very much. Bonjour. Alors maintenant, chef et mandataire, j'aimerais attirer votre attention so sur le projet de résolution like numéro 9. Draw your attention to resolution number nine. Uh, pardon. I'm sorry. Je voulais voir si tout le monde suivait. I <laughs> wanted to see whether everyone was still awake. Dix. It's number 10, actually, that we're Donc, going to look at now. Donc, le numéro 10, draft, draft number resolution ten. number 10. Draft resolution le titre number poursuite ten. de la réforme du programme d'aide aux revenus the des Premières Nations. C'est un projet de résolution qui a pour objet développement social. Alors, le projet de résolution a été proposé It par was proposed Chef Monias. Chief Monias. Are you present? Yep. Chief Monias is in the in the room. Chief Et Monias is here. And Chef seconded Richer. by Chief Valérie, Valérie Richer. Richer. Seconder, are you in the room? Are you here, Valérie Richer? Chief Richer. Chief Richer doesn't seem to be in the room. Is there a chief willing to second this uh, draft resolution number 10? By show of hand. If there is a chief, I don't know. Chief Shani Turtle second. Thank you. Donc, on va poursuivre maintenant avec la lecture de la portion de la du projet de résolution Let's continue qui, with the reading of draft en allant directement à la décision. Donc, the, therefore, pour ces motifs, les chefs en assemblée assembly enjoignent à l'Assemblée des Premières One, Nations d'obtenir des fonds pour entreprendre une étude destinée à cerner les lacunes en matière de données et de services du programme d'aide aux revenus, enjoignent à la PM de presser le gouvernement fédéral d'investir financièrement dans la réforme du programme d'aide aux revenus, ainsi que dans l'établissement des services de gestion de cas et du soutien préalable à l'emploi à toutes les Premières Nations. Donc, le projet de résolution a été proposé, so, appuyé et a été inscrit proposed, au registre, uh, a été lu, évidemment. Alors, est-ce que le proposeur et le coproposeur souhaitent apporter des commentaires et réactions uh, sur le projet de résolution numéro 10? Mover and seconder, would you like to make any comments on this uh, draft resolution number 10? Non. Is there a need for discussion on this draft resolution number 10? No. Donc, je vais, je déduis que vous êtes donc prêt à passer Or au I vote. I assume that you're ready to move on to the vote. Il n'y a personne au micro. Alors, no est-ce que, est que, concernant le projet numéro 10, est-ce qu'il y a des oppositions, any opposition? Any against? Seeing none. Any abstentions? Seeing none, le, je déclare que le projet de résolution est donc adopté uh, par consensus. Merci beaucoup. Consensus, thank you. Maintenant. Now. Oh, you want to do? Okay. I was, I was waiting to do. Thank you very much. Resolution number 19. For those of you following along. Resolution number 19, support for the claims of the survivors, survivor class in day scholars. Moved by Cook Cookpick, Cook Cook P, Cook P, Roseanne Casimir. Seconded by Cook P. Wayne Christian. Thank you. We have a mover, we have a seconder on draft resolution number 19. Therefore, be it resolved that the Chiefs and Assembly 1 call upon the federal government to settle the claims of the survivor class of day scholars quickly so that former day scholars may be compensated for the harms they suffered at Indian residential schools while they are still alive. Two, call upon the federal government to provide former day scholars 
with a common experience payment equal to that given to former residents of the schools under the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, the 10 plus 3 formula. Three, direct the Assembly of First Nations to engage with the Day Scholar Executive Council and the federal government and all appropriate bodies to advocate for the resolution of the Day Scholars case. Mover. Microphone number one, please. Cook's Jam. Cook B. Rizan Kazmir runs class at the Shvatmik, and I'm the mover for this motion, and I'm very honored to be up here. So I also want to acknowledge the traditional unceded traditional lands of the Algonquin. So just a couple of things I wanted to add. Um, first of all, uh, quick friendly amendment to D. If you could just change the date from 2011 to 2010. So then it would read, they were subjected to the same abuse and racism of students who were residents. They started the Day Scholar case in 2010 because they had been left out of the um, KISSA, IRSSA. And I just wanted to duly note that we want advocation for this um, resolution and that we are you know, just reiterating that we are meant losing so many of our um, day scholars. And we've heard that throughout all the discussions today and with the various ministers as well. So I just wanted to reiterate that as well. Mm -hmm. And that we have also been self-funding this um, court case right from its inception in 2010. And that um, we're doing this because we believe in our people. And we want to see true, meaningful um, reconciliation and so that's why we're up here and you know what we're asking is for the AFN to support this moving forward thank and you so, cooks jam thank you very much seconder any comments you're, you're good thank you any need for further discussion on this resolution number 19 seeing none question has been called <laughs> thank you is there any opposition to resolution number 19. Any opposition? Seeing none. Any abstentions? Seeing none. Carried by consensus. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Let us uh, move our attention to draft resolution 20, support for claims of descendant class and band class in days scholars. Moved by Cookby Casimir and seconded by Cookby Christian, both present here in the assembly. This resolution has not changed unless the movers and seconders want to change it. <laughs> I'll read it into the record as is. Therefore, be it resolved that the chiefs in assembly call upon the federal government to settle the claims of the descendant class in day scholars to compensate families for the cultural and linguistic losses they have suffered as a result of the Indian residence school policy to call upon the federal government to settle the claims of the band class in day scholars to allow bands to revitalize, protect, and maintain their cultures and languages that have been result, eroded as a result of the Indian residential school policy. Three, direct the Assembly of First Nations to engage with the day scholar executive council, federal government, and all appropriate bodies to advocate for the resolution of the day scholars case. Microphone one. Cook's Cham again, uh, Cook be Rizan Kazmar Wen's quest to come up to Shwatmik. And again, honor the unceded traditional lands of the Algonquin. And um, friendly amendment to C under the um, area of the whereas is. And in C, if we could change from 2011 to 2010. And so it'll, they started the Day Scholars case in 2010 because they had been left out of the Indian Residential Schools Settlement Agreement. Great. Perfect. Cook's Cham. Matter of protocol, agreeable to the secondary. Thank you very much. Is there a need for discussion of this resolution? Noting the one date change. Seeing no hands, are there any objections to this resolution 20? Seeing none, any abstentions to resolution 20? Seeing none, then with your permission, resolution 20 adopted by unanimous consensus. Thank you very much.
Donc, nous allons poursuivre en français. Please uh, wear your earphones if you need, need it, because translation has difficulty to follow when I switch language. So I'm going to continue in French for the French chiefs in the room. Donc, euh, chef et mandataire, j'aimerais maintenant right, attirer Chiefs votre attention sur le projet de résolution like numéro 21. Il est intitulé comme suit, confirmation de l'appui en faveur d'un jour férié national le 30 septembre et de l'appui à la cérémonie d'hommage et de reconnaissance des plaignants de Blackwater et Hall. Donc, ce projet de résolution This numéro 21 a été proposé par chef Blackwater Black et coproposé par chef Peter Ball. Est-ce que le proposeur Is et le coproposeur uh, se trouvent dans the, la salle? Uh, mover and chef here Blackwater, Blackwater. êtes-vous dans la salle? Are you in the room? Donc, je ne vois pas le proposeur. Non, je ne vois pas le mover. OK. Donc, oui, oui, bonjour, merci. Yes, Donc, euh, le coproposeur, Peter Paul. And the seconder, Peter Paul. To the right. Oui, bonjour, merci. Yes, thank you. Donc, euh, je vais maintenant lire la, so I will read the la portion et les résolutions du projet now. de résolution. Starting Pour ces motifs, les chefs en assemblée, un, réitèrent leur appui à la résolution 72-2018 de l'Assemblée des Premières Nations, appui à l'organisation d'un jour férié national le 30 septembre et appui à la cérémonie d'hommage et de reconnaissance pour les plaignants de Blackwater. Deux, Appuie le soutien et l'hommage aux plaignants de Blackwater pour leur bravoure, leur courage et leur sacrifice dans leur combat historique pour les survivants des pensionnats indiens, les survivants intergénérationnels et leurs familles. Trois, enjoignent aux chefs nationaux et aux chefs régionaux de l'APN d'appeler le gouvernement fédéral à veiller à ce que la commémoration publique de l'histoire et de l'héritage des pensionnats indiens demeure un élément essentiel du processus de réconciliation. Quatre, Enjoigne au chef national de l'APN d'appeler le gouvernement fédéral à présenter un projet de loi déclarant le 30 septembre comme jour férié national afin de rendre hommage aux survivants des pensionnats indiens, aux survivants intergénérationnels et à leurs familles et à leur, com et à leur communauté. 5. Enjoigne aux chefs nationaux et aux chefs régionaux de l'APN d'appeler le gouvernement fédéral à travailler en collaboration et collectivement avec l'APN et l'Assemblée des Premières Nations de la Colombie-Britannique afin d'organiser une cérémonie nationale de reconnaissance des combats des plaignants de Blackwater à l'occasion de la journée de chemise orange le 30 septembre 2020 à Vancouver, Colombie-Britannique. 6. Enjoignent aux chefs nationaux et aux chefs régionaux de l'APN d'appeler le Premier ministre Justin Trudeau et les chefs de l'opposition à réaffirmer les excuses nationales présentées le 11 juin 2008 lors de la cérémonie de reconnaissance du combat des plaignants de Blackwater le 30 septembre 2020. Donc, euh, le projet de résolution so, numéro 21 a été proposé, appuyé, a été lu et inscrit au registre. Est-ce que le proposeur et le coproposeur ont des commentaires ou des, euh, ont une intervention à faire sur ce projet de résolution numéro 21? Non. Est-ce qu'il y a des, est-ce qu'il y a des commentaires, réactions, comments, questions sur le projet de résolution numéro 21? Je ne vois personne au micro. Donc, je déduis que vous êtes prêts à passer au vote. Alors, est-ce qu'il y a des any, oppositions dans la salle? Is anyone against Opposition this dans la salle? Je ne vois aucune no main levée. Est-ce qu'il y a des abstentions dans la salle? In the room? Aucune abstention. No Donc, avec votre permission, so chef et mandataire, je déclare le projet de résolution numéro I 21 adopté par consensus. Merci. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to ask the delegation to turn to resolution number 29. Resolution number 29. Title, National Gathering on Substance Use with Emphasis on Opioids and Crystal Methamphetamine. Uh, there is a new mover and seconder um, moved by Margaret Swan, proxy for Panimutang. Margaret Swan, in the room. 
Yes. Uh, seconded by uh, Kyra Wilson. Um, proxy for Long Plains is Kyra in the room. Proxy Wilson. Looking for another shining turtle. Thank you. New seconder is Chief Shining Turtle. Um, I will read it into the record. Draft Resolution 29, moved by Proxy Margaret Swan, seconded by Chief Shining Turtle. Therefore, be it resolved that the Chiefs and Assembly 1 direct the Assembly of First Nations to call upon Indigenous Services Canada, including the First Nations Inuit Health Branch, to support a national gathering on opioid, crystal methamphetamine, and other substance use hosted and administered by the centrally located First Nations Health and Social Secretariat of Manitoba. The national gathering will evaluate existing culturally responsive land-based treatment services that have been developed by First Nations and others will have the opportunity to replicate this work in their respective nations to direct the AFN to advocate and learn how to secure resources for all First Nations, including Manitoba First Nations, to develop their own respective opioid and crystal methamphetamine strategy, implementing recommendations brought forward from the national gathering. Three, direct the AFN to advocate and secure community-based human and financial resources for the implementation of each nation's strategy. Go to the mover, num microphone one, please. Anin. Chiefs, respectfully, I am asking for once again support because our history speaks for itself as I spoke earlier with regards to day schools, the damage it's done. We're still feeling the effects and we need to find creative ways to help prevent our young people from continuing to be addicted and suicides. So Chiefs, I ask for your support in helping make this possible. Miigwech. Thank you. Is a seconder feel the need? Thank you. Is there any need for discussion on resolution number 29? Question has been called. Is there any opposition to resolution number 29? Any opposed? Any abstentions to resolution number 29? Seeing none, resolution is carried by consensus. Thank you. Let us turn our attention to resolution 24. We did say we would work a little extra. We've got about 15 minutes left, not 24, excuse me, 22, but we will get to 24, <laughs> Chief Sayers. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, we have 15 minutes to, uh, uh, and then we will adjourn at uh, 5.30. Resolution 22, International Union for Conservation of Nature, Chief Calvin Sanderson and Chief Lance Heyman. Chief Sanderson and Heyman, are you available in the assembly? I don't see them. Yes. Seeing none, may I have a mover and seconder for this? I see Chief Abram Benedict from Mohawks Council of Akwesasne. Seconder, please. Chief Tom, Tom Marico, Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte. Uh, essentially, the resolution is as presented. There is an additional two, uh, therefore be resolved two. Therefore be it resolved that the Chiefs and Assembly direct the Assembly of First Nations to explore formal membership opportunities with the International Union for Conservation of Nature and the Canadian Committee for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature in support of ongoing advocacy efforts to prioritize the recognition and protection of First Nations inherent treaty and constitutionally protected rights in all conservation related activities and to direct the AFN environment sector to report back to Chiefs and Assembly or the AFN Executive Committee as appropriate via the Advisory Committee on Climate Action and the Environment, the ACE Committee, on proposed options for formal membership with the IUCN and the CCIUCN respectively. Is there a need for discussion of this resolution? 
Seeing none, let us move to the question. Is there any opposition to this motion? Are there any abstentions to this motion? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Let us move to Resolution 23. Donc, maintenant, on passe à la résolution, au projet de résolution numéro 23. Alors, il s'agit du projet de résolution intitulé « Partenariat complet avec les Premières Nations dans la mise en œuvre de l'approche canadienne pour la transformation de la conservation des espèces en péril au Canada ». In Canada, Ce projet de résolution qui concerne l'environnement a été proposé par Chef Lewis. Lewis. Est-ce que Chef Lewis Is est Chief dans Lewis la salle? Donc, uh, mover Chief Lewis. Chief Lewis, are you here? Non. Est-ce que et, et je vais vérifier si le coproposeur est maintenant dans la salle. Donc, ce projet de résolution a été coproposé par Chief Plains. Chief Plains. Chief Plains. Planes. Plans. Not. Donc, le, le proposeur et le coproposeur ne sont right, pas dans la salle. Est-ce que, est que deux chefs souhaitent prendre cette proposition à leur like compte? C'est-à-dire, on cherche un proposeur et up. un coproposeur. Proposeur. I need a mover and a seconder. Please, yeah, thank you. Uh, microphone number two, please. Good afternoon. Keith Matthew, uh, proxy for Cayuse Creek First Nation. Thank you. Mover. So moved. Thank you. Microphone one. C for uh, Chief Clarence Louis. John Phillips. John Phillips. Thank you. Donc, euh, nous allons maintenant continuer. Merci. Nous allons maintenant continuer et allons à la lecture de la section pour ces motifs. Numéro un. Therefore, be it resolved, section one. À l'APN, avec l'appui du comité consultatif sur l'action climatique et l'environnement et du comité consultatif des Premières Nations sur les espèces en péril, de militer en faveur d'un partenariat complet et d'une inclusion significative des Premières Nations dans la mise en œuvre de l'approchement canadien pour la transformation de la conservation des espèces en péril au Canada. Deux. En joignant à l'APN de veiller à ce que l'approche canadienne reflète et prenne en compte de façon appropriée les différences et les préoccupations régionales des Premières Nations en organisant des activités coordonnées de participation régionale pour les Premières Nations. Trois, en juin, à l'APN d'appeler le ministre de l'Environnement et des Changements climatiques du Canada de fournir une capacité financière suffisante pour soutenir les Premières Nations, les régions, les organisations provinciales et territoriales, les femmes, les aînés et les jeunes à participer à ces activités et à maintenir leur rôle important de gardien de l'environnement et de leader en matière de conservation. Donc, euh, le projet so, de résolution numéro 23 a été proposé, appuyé, lu, inscrit au registre. Est-ce que le proposeur et le coproposeur ont des commentaires à ajouter au projet de résolution? Vous pouvez le faire en venant au micro. Donc, est-ce qu'il est qu y a des commentaires de la salle, euh, chef et mandataire, hall, si vous avez des commentaires, proxies, réactions, questions à apporter questions, au projet de résolution numéro 23, c'est le temps de le faire maintenant au micro. Donc, il n'y a personne au micro, no, alors je déduis que no vous one, êtes prêt à passer au vote. So Donc, est-ce qu'il y a des oppositions dans la salle? Any, Any opposition? Je ne vois aucune opposition. No one. Est-ce qu'il y a des abstentions? Any abstentions? Abstentions. Donc, okay, we're, we're, we are calling the question. Uh, that's what I'm doing now. Donc, uh, aucune abstention. Alors, no je déclare, uh, avec votre permission, chef et mandataire, que le projet de résolution so numéro 23 est adopté par consensus. Merci. By consensus. Thank you. <laughs> Merci. Thank you. Turn your attention to draft resolution number 24. Draft resolution number 24. Support for the implementation of a Housett court decision. Moved by Guy Louis, proxy, a Housett First Nation. Is proxy Louis in the room? Yes. yes, thank you. Seconded, Chief Darcy Gray, List de Gouche, First Nation. Not in the room. Can I have a seconder? Chief 
McLeod. Thank you. Chief McLeod. Thank you. Mover and seconder. Draft resolution number 24. Support for the implementation of a Housed Court decision. Therefore, be it resolved that the Chiefs in Assembly 1 call upon the Assembly of First Nations to urge the federal government to immediately implement Aboriginal fishing rights, including the five First Nations of a Housed. Help me. He had a sat. Hesquet. To look quiet. Mal. Mochat. Machalat. Mochat. Machalat. As directed by the courts through the following actions. A. Direct the AFN to advocate to the Minister of Fisheries, Oceans, and the Canadian Coast Guard and the Minister of Crown and Indigenous Relations for the implementation of existing court decisions relating to First Nations fisheries, including a house it. B, call upon the AFN to send a letter to the Prime Minister echoing the requests of the five nations in a November 4, 2019 letter that included the following. The Prime Minister directs his ministers and their staff, Crown, Indigenous Relations, and Northern Affairs, and Fisheries and Oceans to conclude a reconciliation agreement with the Five Nations by March of 2020 so that the Five Nations can begin to implement their expanded community fisheries in the 2020 fishing season. The Prime Minister directs the ministers of Crown, Indigenous Relations, and Northern Affairs and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to meet with representatives from the Five Nations as soon as possible so they can brief the ministers directly and from their perspectives on the steps remaining to conclude an agreement with Canada. The Prime Minister recognized that regardless of whether an agreement is reached, the Five Nations require and are entitled to meaningful, economically viable fishing opportunities the Prime Minister directs the Minister of Fisheries Oceans to revise specific policies and regulations to foster rather than impede the community-based fisheries of the Five Nations. Does the proxy feel the need to address the resolution? Does the seconder feel the need to address the resolution? So we'll go to microphone number two, please. Uh, thank you, um, Guy Louis, a how's it proxy? Uh, I'm just gonna uh, turn it over to our lead negotiator for a how's it on talk I can let him explain a little further. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. We can initial classes to shit our house it. Uts and hot we out and so chuckles new channel set. Yeah, 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 so that's when hot we out so when they go not now. Oh, pretty ass who agree not in a seven. Oh, a sucky axemis. And hardly he asked them in cage such a cage it. It touching my muscle, you can't touch it. No, stop it, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We can initiate is my name from my house at Cliff Atlio. I'm the lead negotiator for our nation on this issue, and and uh, I speak in our language to respect those that I represent, and that's our hereditary chiefs. And right now I speak on behalf of all five hereditary chiefs. And it was with their support and their history and their story that we went to court to reestablish a way of life. And so it's very important to actually pursue those things that are directed in the resolution because um, reestablishing a way of life that had been uh, over the last four or five decades been slowly eroded, it's really 
quite a struggle actually to actually get things back up and running the way I remember growing up. I remember no housing programs, no government interference with our way of life, where we could build our own homes because we could. And so that's what we're after, is to reestablish a way of life. And the last thing I want to remind people is, and the government of Canada is, is that on the coast of British Columbia, we're very small reservations. They're little dots on the map. And there are dots on a map because the government of the day when they established and recognized reservations, they said, you depend on the sea. And we are reminding them that, yes, we still can depend on the sea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Just, I uh, just want to add, you know, uh, it was stated earlier by our, our uh, Neutrona Tribal Council president about this being 10 years now and the judge gave two years to negotiate agreement and uh, f in five days it'll be 10 years wow. and, and and it's our people that are suffering at home and they're waiting for for this to move ahead and that's who we speak on behalf of is our people at back home they want to get out there on the waters and get fishing and making a, a decent living for their families thank you thank you very much for that Question has been called for draft resolution number 24. Is there any opposed to this resolution? Seeing none, any abstentions to this resolution? Seeing none, this resolution is carried by consensus. Miigwech. Donc, merci beaucoup. Cela Thank met fin à la période de projet de résolution pour aujourd'hui. Donc, on va terminer la journée. Simplement pour... Donc, on, 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 va, on va terminer les discussions, les travaux pour aujourd'hui et reprendre demain à 9h. Mais pour vous donner une idée de notre horaire demain, nous commençons donc à 9h et toute l'avant-midi est réservée pour les projets de résolution. Par contre, nous avons, nous avons environ 15 projets de résolution, incluant les projets de résolution qui sont en retard dans le processus de projet de résolution en retard. Donc, je viens de recevoir une dépêche, alors on va traiter le projet de résolution 25 et nous conclurons. Je, vous, je reviendrai vous donner un aperçu de la journée de demain. Donc, vous pouvez rester ici. So, now we'll do draft resolution number 27. Thank you. Uh, 20, 25. Um, just to explain that, we were we had arrived at about 5, 527, so we were looking to close, but we realized the mover, the, the folks involved with Resolution 25 were present, so we wanted to do that, um, and then we will uh, close the day. So draft resolution 25, protection of the inherent right of First Nations to use and possess eagle feathers as parts of social, cultural, and ceremonial purposes, moved by Chief Ralph Leon, Stalis First Nation, seconded by Chief Dalton Silver, Silver Sumas First Nation, is the mover and seconder present. Yes, I see Chief uh, Leon. I don't see Chief uh, Silver. May I, I, I see uh, Cookby Wayne Christian from Splatsine to serve as the uh, seconder uh, of that. Therefore, be it resolves, uh, this, and this is as, I believe, as presented in your package, call on the Assembly of First Nations to urge federal, provincial, and territorial governments to establish a process to address issues related to the discriminatory practices involving charging First Nations of their rightful use, possession, and transport of eagle feathers and parts. Call on the AFN to immediately call on federal, provincial, and territorial governments to work with the appropriate Indigenous restorative justice process for First Nations wrongly convicted and are charged for their rightful use, possession, and transport of eagle feathers and parts. And three, call on the AFN to urge federal, provincial, and territorial agents to provide redress, including restitution, repatriation, and reversal for convictions for violations to First Nations' rights to use, possess, and transport eagle feathers and parts. Is there a need for discussion of this resolution as presented? Ready for the question, are there any objections to this resolution? Seeing none, are there any abstentions to this resolution? Therefore, 
Draft Resolution 25 is adopted as presented. Congratulations, gentlemen. And we will now turn back to um, Weena to do the English translation of her earlier announcement. <laughs> Before doing the English translation of what I was uh, saying, I will finish what I was saying in French. One, 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 <laughs> so, one donc, just a second. Yeah, yeah, one. What? We, we, were, we were asked to uh, just ask for the uh, prayers and support of the delegation for Chief Mark Point from Skalkel First Nation over near uh, Chilliwack, uh, BC. He um, went through heart surgery today, and so we uh, wanted to send our support to him and to his family, and he is doing well. Because, you know, in this day and age, heart surgery is pretty routine, it turns out. It seems terrifying to me, but yes. <laughs> uh, so anyway, just to keep him, in your, him and his family um, in your prayers as you uh, go about your day. Thank you. And now, officially, to help close our day, <laughs> please help me back, welcome back the chair. <laughs> Point of order. <laughs> Just kidding. Merci, désolé. Donc, euh, merci you. pour votre patience. Thank you for your patience. Alors, euh, simplement pour vous dire ju justement just, ce qui va se passer ce soir, uh, il y a un film, donc Audrey's film, Story, Audrey's qui va Story, être présenté à la salle Confédération à 7 à 19h, donc 7 p.m., Audrey's Story. Audrey's Alors, Story. demain. Comme je disais plus tôt, on va reprendre earlier, nos, euh, nos travaux. Demain matin à 9h, il y a un midi réservé pour les projets de résolution, mais on en a fait beaucoup, We're alors vous avez travaillé très fort aujourd'hui. Donc, on aura une, so une reste environ 15 projets de résolution, ce qui inclut les résolutions qui, sont, euh, qui ont été présentées de façon tardive. Alors, environ 15 résolutions, ce qui va nous amener à peut-être bien avant midi, donc dépendamment, mais le prochain sujet à l'heure du jour, pour, euh, qui suit les résolutions, c'est le, donc cela va nous amener, on va passer par Cuba demain, <rire> très rapidement, on va aller à Cuba, on va avoir une présentation par le Q Cuban Health Authority, <rire> j'entends les gens rire après que j'ai parlé, j'ai fait rire, <rire> donc, euh, le, 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 le Nash, donc le Cuban Health Authority, et après ça va nous amener à la cérémonie de clôture demain, donc dépendamment à quelle heure on aura terminé, il se peut que ça nous... Euh, les, 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 la cérémonie de clôture ait lieu à the midi, mais dans l'éventualité où ce serait plus long, But on terminerait au plus happen, tard. On doit quitter la, la salle ici à 2h20 au plus tard demain. Donc, latest. is there a need for translation or you all wear, wear, wear your earphones? You're good? English? Okay, close the mic and the camera and I'm going to do it in English. <laughs> Um, okay, so tomorrow, tonight, you all, uh, I think I, I just said, there is a movie, Audrey's Story, at 7 at the Confederation Ballroom. Tomorrow morning, we begin at 9, and uh, the, 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 the morning is reserved for draft resolutions. We, uh, we have about 15 more to go, so we're going to deal with it, and depending on what time we finish tomorrow, we're going to go to Cuba tomorrow. <laughs> so there's going <laughs> to, yes, there's going to be a presentation by the Cuban Health Authority. And then we're going to have our closing ceremony. So depending on what time we we finish, we might finish at noon or maybe, but at the latest at 2.20 tomorrow afternoon, we're going to be, uh, we're going to finish the, 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 the discussions and uh, work we do, we're doing. So we're going to close. Uh, we don't know, but tomorrow, 2.20 at the latest. So, and tomorrow evening, there we, uh, we have our gala, so we'll keep you informed tomorrow as well. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Turn it off. Turn it off. <laughs>